evening, I'm Carolyn Rice, school board chair of the city of Virginia Beach, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6 o'clock p.m. on this 24th day of August 21. Pursuant to the Virginia Health Commissioner's order of public emergency statewide requirement to wear masks in K-12 schools, issued August 12, 2021, and Virginia Acts of Assembly number 1303, Chapter 456 and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Guidance of K-12 Schools and the School Board's 2021-22 Reopening Plan adopted August 10th of this year. It's determined physical distancing will be used in school board chambers as a health mitigation strategy. Therefore, there will be limited public seating available on a first-come, first-served basis beginning shortly before the workshop session. Members of the public, as always, will be able to observe the school board meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV channel 47, and on Zoom. And um, on behalf of all my colleagues, I welcome the public, both those in person and viewing and listening from home this evening. With that, Madam Clerk, please take the verbal roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in school board chambers is Chairwoman Rye, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Manning, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Felton, and Ms. Riggs. Attending via Zoom is Ms. Weems and Ms. Owens. Thank you. And for the record, Ms. Owens is uh, remote due to health reasons and Mrs. Weems for family health reasons. So I now ask all present to join me in a moment of silence, and Mrs. Franklin has some remarks to add first. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to actually dedicate this moment of silence to recognize the difficult situation facing our U.S. military, their families, U.S. citizens, and our Afghan allies. So if we could please just take a moment of silence to recognize that. And please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There are no uh, employee or public awards or recognitions this evening. So that leads us to adoption of the agenda. Uh, and before I ask for any other modifications at, at each of your uh, seats is uh, are the drafts of, of two motions that we asked our Mrs. Linetti to, to, uh, to prepare for us. So I'm uh, making a so noting these two modifications, uh, are there any other additions or modifications? Where would they be added under action? Is that correct? Yes. Thank you for that so question. So action D, where we'll would it be? We'll clarify that in a moment. D and E. Are there any other modifications, Mrs. Hughes? Yes, I would ask that policy 5.7 be moved to information due to um, our bylaw 1-32C. It says that whenever we are going to, uh, all policy proposals, once they come out of the policy review committee, they're supposed to go to information and then they're voted on at the next regular meeting. Do we so I believe. Do I, I we need a second for amendments? Or? Well, a second to discuss. Mm -hmm. I move. I second that. Yeah, I don't believe that, uh, Mrs. Riggs. Okay, are, we up, are we up for discussion? Here? Yes. Okay. Um, well, the reason why we decided to move it on for action is because we need to start our school year, our 21-22 school year. We have. Um, this is our last meeting before school starts. And it is required or requested by the legislature to start it. That is why we decided to go ahead and put it up for action. So I just wanted to explain why it is in for action. No, I, I do understand the reason that we did it. And we discussed it at policy review that that was the reason. 
but that is a direct violation of our policy. Our procedure is that it's supposed all of the proposed policies and amendments are to go to information and then be voted on at the next meeting. And I think we should stay consistent with all of our policies. And uh, Mrs. Letty, could you clarify for us uh, uh, whether that is, I know that that's what, what is the typical. Uh, I don't see that. What Mrs. Hughes is pointing out is bylaw 132 has approval of content sufficiency form, presentation of policy, adoption, amendment, and suspension. Under subsection C is adoption and amendment. She's talking about policy and proposal suggested amendments for existing policy shall be submitted to members of the school board. And the superintendent talks about prior to regular school board meeting, a vote for adoption shall take place at the next succeeding meeting, I'm sorry, after it's proposed, at the next sitting regular meeting, a majority vote of the membership of the school board shall be needed for adoption of amendment. I would note that you have subsection D, suspension. Policy of the school board shall be subject to suspension only on a majority vote um, going on to the meeting. Procedures on there. I do think you have the ability, as this is a bylaw, you can override your bylaw or suspend your bylaw if you want to. You can do that through amendment on it. And to do that, you have to have notice and a majority vote of the but, board. If you have not provided notice that you're going to ask for a suspension, you no, actually you have actually to have a have, unanimous note of the board. Actually, the you don't have anything that deals with suspension of bylaws. You do an amendment of a bylaw. You don't have anything that specifically says what you do with a suspension of a bylaw. May, then may apparently I read? we're not supposed to do it. Can I just ask this? If, I, I since want, we were, want, excuse me, out of order. I'm sorry. Can we? There is precedent for policies going directly to action, so that's why I'm confused. Um, Correct, and you often take things from information to, um, uh, typically it comes information to action, but sometimes you go directly to consent. So you can put that on there and make a decision as to how you, you don't actually have a bylaw that deals with suspension of bylaws on there, so you could certainly make a motion to suspend the bylaw for the purposes of allowing this on uh, this particular policy to bypass the information. Mrs. Anderson. So it was brought up earlier that we thought we might sorry. we might want to ask um, for a special meeting to consider this. So I'm not sure, but if if this does not pass, no, the special meeting is not for this. Okay, all right. So, but we could have a special meeting just to vote on this if that's what we so choose. Can, can we read again what bylaw this is and what, what it says? Um, yeah, go ahead. It's 1-32C. Um, it says policy proposals and suggested amendments to existing policies shall be submitted to members of the school board and to the superintendent in writing prior to a regularly scheduled school board meeting at which such pro proposed policies or amendments shall be read or discussed. A vote for adoption shall take place at the next succeeding regular meeting of the school board. A majority vote of the membership of the school board shall be needed for the adoption or amendment revision of a policy. So apparently we wouldn't be able to do it at a special meeting anyway. It would be the next regular scheduled meeting. I mean, I'll admit I was the policy committee chair for three years, and I know we've been operating with on because certain times because of time limits that we did present certain policies not often but occasionally directly to action again you do not have a bylaw that deals with suspension of bylaws so I think you could make a motion to suspend that bylaw for the purposes of no, adding this to the no, agenda no, you can't. I've got it here We, we, we all we have to do to suspend, to suspend our bylaws is to have two thirds, um, nope. two thirds majority. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I? It's part of our, it's part of our no, it's not. guidelines. No, it's not. Show me where. Can, can I? Please. Can you can. Okay, so Ms. Linetti just said that there's nothing in our bylaws that address suspension of bylaws. And I have Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised edition, most recent. I've printed them out and it talks about um, it talks about um, bylaws, um, 
Constitution bylaws 2-8, um, page 11 of Robert's Rules of Order says bylaws cannot be suspended with the exception of clauses that provide for their own suspension under specified conditions or clauses in the nature of the rules of order described. Um, it, it says that rules of order can t that deal with parliamentary procedure during the meeting um, can be suspended. But it said, says, except for such rules and for clauses that provide for their own suspension, as stated above, rules in the bylaws cannot be suspended. So Robert's Rules of Order, I've got the book here and the documents if anyone wants to read them. Does the wording allow for it to start as information and then add it as a, we have the agenda yes. Well, vote on remaining vote action on items. The next regular scheduled mm -hmm. meeting. I mean, that's what the verbiage is. Looking to you, Madam. Again, Attorney. that would be a suspension of the bylaw procedure in there. So you could move this to information and put it on information, and then you would just need to have the next regularly scheduled school board meeting and deal with this. What's required to, to do otherwise in terms of number of votes needed? You can't. There's nothing. Again, I think we'd have to look more closely at Robert's Rules versus the suspension of the procedures here and also look at standing rules on there. I think at this time, it may be best just to put it on information and we can take a look at it after information decide um, if we need to make a motion to amend it and amend the agenda. And get back to possibly the special meeting we can't it has to be the regular it would have to be the regular meeting what are the implications um, for starting school without this in place again as I was presenting during the workshop most of the things you are already required to do by federal law or state law so most protections are in place. You would have to deal with the fact whether the Virginia Department of Education or another agency, a state agency, was going to in some way punish you for not implementing the, the model guidelines before school started. As I said, most of the things you've already, most of you have already put in place. Mrs. Franklin. Mrs. Franklin. Well, I, I mean, you're telling us really there's no other alternative to get this to, to vote on this tonight. I just need to know that as the chair. And then it seems like I think there's at no this further point, discussion. I would need to go back and look at it a little more carefully. If you put it on information, we would be able to take it up on information. Then I would have some time to look at whether it's a procedural. Layer. If you put it on information, you can deal with it on information and we can decide. I would have some time to look at the rules to see if there's another way to handle this. You mean to decide at that point whether it could be voted on later tonight? Yeah. What I would suggest at this point in your this. adoption of the agenda is to move this to information mm -hmm. so that we can do the presentation on it. It would give me some time to go back and look at it and there and I can bring some information back to you, but I don't want to hold up the whole meeting now when you have other things you have a lot on your agenda that needs to be taken mm -hmm. care of. All right, so back to agenda adoption. The modifications are one more time. <laughs> so the present, so moving action item C to information item C, following the policy review recommendations. That's what we generally do, right? Put it at the, so that leaves open C, and so we have C and D for the other two motions that, um, that are here to discuss at the proper time. So is everybody clear on the modified agenda that we're voting on? One more time. Action is A is remains personnel report, B unsolicited PPEA, C is the motion regarding health protocols for school board meetings, D is the motion on school board mask accommodations, and then moving down to information, we're adding item C, the policy 5-7.
So with those modifications, motion to approve. Mrs. Anderson, second. Uh, Mrs. Hughes, okay, all in favor, uh, please show a raised hand. Please raise your hands one more time. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote to uh, for the motion for the adoption of the agenda as amended. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to superintendent's report. Dr. <coughs> Spence, we look forward to your report. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. Here are a few items of interest for you and our families to know this evening. First, we are, as you all know, only a couple of weeks away from welcoming back our students to in-person instruction five days a week for our new school year. With that in mind, please don't forget our families and community can find current information, available resources, and the school division calendar on bbschools.com. And parents and guardians, please don't forget to familiarize yourself with Parent View, which houses important school and educational information for your child. Of course, we understand that you and your family likely have questions about how we'll maintain a safe learning environment for your children and our staff. So please join us for one of our VB Safe Together webinars taking place on August 26th and September 2nd, both at 5.30 p.m. In these sessions, we will be covering everything from classroom cleaning protocols to how athletic competitions will look to contact tracing and notifications. Visit bbschools.com to register. And after registering, you will receive a confirmation email with the details about joining the webinars via Zoom. And I do hope you all will be able to join us this Thursday for our first session. Now is also a good time to make sure your contact information is up to date with your child's school. This means email addresses, phone numbers, and other information. The school division's rapid notification system alert now allows parents and legal guardians to receive timely communication about things like inclement weather, need to know events, available resources, COVID notifications, and more. Staff, it's also important that your information is up to date and this can be done on the intranet within the employee self-service tab. There are downloadable instructions available on the right side of the page. If you are having issues and not receiving any of the voice, email, or text messages that the division is sending out through AlertNow, please email alertnowinfo at vbschools.com. Well, the last portion of my report this evening is a little bittersweet. A very dear colleague and someone I am lucky enough to call a friend and whom I respect greatly, Mrs. Sharan Lewis, is retiring in August from the school division after 44 years of service. She has made a huge impact on several generations of students and staff within our school division, but don't just take my word for it. Check out this video celebrating the fabulous Mrs. Lewis. She had absolutely no idea. And let me tell you, uh, that was a feat in itself because Miss Lewis always knows what's going on. The whole thing is just really a big surprise for her, and I'm glad we were able to do it and pull it off. I know I speak for the Tidewater Alumni Chapter and the entire Virginia State University family. We congratulate her on her retirement and wish her well. She's one of a kind, and um, she's, as you know, beloved here in Virginia Beach, and rightfully so. I mean, she's touched every aspect of the organization, and she's just a consummate professional and a wonderful human being. I was overwhelmed, and uh, that song, Simply the Best, is not about me. It's about the people that you saw in the stands. They are simply the best, and they made my work in Virginia Beach so rewarding, so enjoyable, and I just feel so blessed to have worked with so many wonderful people. Miss Lewis has done so much for Virginia Beach Schools over more than four decades. When you do the math, how many people she impacted, children, teachers, parents, the whole community. That kind of dedication, we need to celebrate and recognize. I'd like to tell Miss Lewis that thanks for taking a chance on me. I could have been teaching PE at Creed's for the rest of my career, but she stuck with me and um, she was the launching pad. She's the straw that stirs the drink, bro. Come on. I 
can't think of an aspect of my life that Mrs. Lewis hasn't been an influence on or encouraged me to pursue. Um, so she's been a, a huge part of my life uh, and my growth as a, as a human and a, and a profession. We often tell her um, what a mentor and a friend that she has been to so many in this division over her 44 year career. Um, but being as modest as she is, um, I think she just takes it in stride and doesn't make a big deal of it. I think it's an opportunity for her to really look back over the years that she's given to the school system and obviously to see truly how much of an impact that she's made and then an the opportunity to pass the torch to the next person. It's been 44 wonderful years and I don't regret a day that I spent in Virginia Beach working with some of the best people, the greatest leaders that you have ever come across and the most awesome students that we will ever, ever see. So I, I am just so grateful and thankful, that's all I can say. I've been truly blessed, just truly blessed. So she can't be with us here this evening, but we do want to congratulate her on her upcoming retirement. All of us know she will be greatly missed. And Madam Chairman, thank you. That concludes my report. And we appreciate everyone who had a role in, in that video. All right. Approval of the meeting minutes from August 10th, 2021. Uh, any modifications to the minutes? All right. Hearing none, motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Manning, uh, please show your approval with a raised hand. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Owens, how do you vote? Alpha vote, yes. Thank you. Ma Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, that brings us to hearing of citizens and delegations on formal agenda items. Uh, and we will now hear from those citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to this meeting. Persons signed up to speak on formal agenda items will be called up three at a time. The speaker should proceed to line up when the speaker's name is called. For speakers who are outside of school board chambers, school division staff will bring those speakers into the hallway to line up. In-person speakers will be called first, but followed by those participating through Zoom or telephone. We ask that speakers begin speaking once their name is called. As a reminder, each has four minutes to present and may be given a 30 second and will be given a 30 second warning before time expires. Once the speaker's time has expired, we ask that the speakers stop making remarks to allow the next speaker to be queued to speak. If a speaker is not present when called to speak or not online when called to speak, the school board at its discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the public comment session. The purpose of hearing public comments at this point in the agenda is for members of the public to address the school board regarding matters on tonight's formal meeting agenda. If a speaker begins speaking on matters not on the formal meeting agenda, the in-person speaker will be ruled out of order and requested to discontinue remarks and the online speaker will be asked as well to discontinue. If the speaker continues to address the board regarding matters not on tonight's agenda, the chair will rule the speaker out of order and request that the in-person speaker leave the podium or that the online speaker be cut off so we, might meet, we may proceed to the next speaker. Any discussions regarding whether the speaker is addressing a formal agenda item or following decor decorum and order rules will not extend the speaker's four-minute time period. The school board reserves the right to maintain appropriate decorum and order in the school board chambers so that the board and viewing public are able to observe and hear the school board meeting. Public comment is only allowed when a member of the public has been called up to speak to the school board during a public comment section. Speaking out of turn, excessive cheering or clapping, heckling of speakers will be considered violations of decorum and order. 
Should members of the public interfere with this orderly conduct of the meeting, the board reserves the right to take appropriate actions to restore order and allow the business of the board to continue without disruption. Should it be necessary, the chair will pause the school board meeting until order can be restored and the board reserves the right to discontinue public comments in order to continue with the agenda. Finally, please keep in mind the school board invites the public to also submit comments through our group email account, which, which is listed on our noted on our website. If any speaker signed up for the formal agenda comment section would like to speak on informal and non-agenda matters, then we ask you speak with division staff in the hall and to um, to move you to the appropriate section of the agenda. If, if a speaker is ruled out of order, once the speaker has begun addressing the board, the speaker will not have the opportunity to continue remarks later in the informal public comment section of the agenda. We do thank the speakers tonight who've taken the time to prepare their remarks. And so with that, Madam Clerk, please introduce our first speaker of the evening. Our first speaker this evening will start with Tanya Rivers, since our first speaker is not here. It's going to be Tanya Rivers, Vincent Smith, and then Amy Morris. So Tanya Rivers. Welcome. Thank you. I'm a parent of two VDCPS students. I'm here tonight to speak in support of adopting the VD VDOE model policy for the treatment of transgender and non-binary students. The policy states the key guiding principle is that all children have the right to learn free from discrimination and harassment. It has been demonstrated that students cannot learn in an environment in which they do not feel safe. This includes using correct pronouns and names. When gender and gender expansive students feel safe, they are more likely to thrive in an academic setting. Mental health has been an important topic that has been brought up at these meetings and a mental health task force was even formed. What about the mental health of these students? As stated in the policy, 84% of transgender youth feel unsafe at schools, and 73% of LGBT, LGBTQ plus youth have experienced verbal threats because of their identity. 54% of trans student, transgender students have contemplated suicide, according to the 2019 Trevor Project survey. Many LGBTQ students experience bullying and harassment in their own homes and aren't accepted for who they are. Many experience homelessness because their families turn their backs on them. These students need a place that they can feel safe and protected. Transgender students should be able to use the facilities that correspond to their gender identity, period. This includes restrooms and locker rooms. The harmful trauma-inducing rhetoric surrounding transgender individuals and restrooms needs to stop. The facts are that over 93% of sexual assaults are committed by cis men. As a sexual assault survivor myself, I can tell you that a predator is a predator. They are not going to look at a bathroom sign and say, hey, I can't go in there, it says women. They take advantage of any opportunity to prey on their victims. The reality is that transgender and non-binary individuals are harassed and attacked disproportionately for simply entering spaces that correspond with their gender identity. Approximately 70% of transgender students avoid using school bathrooms in fear of being harassed. This leads to health conditions like kidney infections and UTIs. Gender facilities like bathrooms and locker rooms are intimidating and cause anxiety due to concern as to how they are treated. By forcing students to use a dedicated separate bathroom, you are isolating them and making them feel segregated from their peers. Access to bathrooms and safety in them is not a privilege and a right. It is a right for everyone, not just for those who fit nicely in the boy or girl boxes. Involvement in extracurricular activities is important to the school experience. This fosters relationships and investment in the students by supporting the school. By restricting access to these activities from transgender students, you, can, you are telling them that their involvement does not matter, that they can't contribute to the school community. Transgender students participate in extracurricular activities for the same reasons that all students do. To have fun, challenge themselves, and be part of a team where they feel included and accepted. Students who are transgender deserve the chance to succeed and thrive like any other student. All students deserve the right to be respected, respected and learn in an environment that is free from harassment. By allowing students to use their chosen pronouns and names, you are telling the student that you matter and that you are valid. The misgendering, using incorrect pronouns, or using dead names are all humiliating and derogatory to students' mental health. Building a culture of learning that celebrates gender diversity and 
providing accessible resources, we not only improve the lives of transgender and non-binary students, but we also build awareness and empathy in all students. What if it was your child? 30 seconds. What if it was your child? Would you, let the, would you tell them they cannot be who they are and turn your back on them? Or would you do everything in your power to make sure they are safe, respected, and given the same rights as everyone else? Transgender and non-binary students deserve the dignity and respect that most people take for granted. I fully support the VDOA model policy and urge the board to do the right thing for our students and implement it. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Vincent Smith, then Amy Morris, and then Kathleen Slindy. Welcome. Good evening. I come to you with a little bit of a different angle tonight than you're going to hear from all these people out here lined up to yell at you. I'm going to tell you that most of these folks out here have valid concerns. I'm not going to get involved in the issue of who should and should not share a bathroom. That's y'all's problem to fix. What I'm going to tell you is their concerns are valid and they should be treated as such. No matter how they present them, I apologize for what's coming. So I understood that I understand. Yeah, you know, I've read this stuff. I understand a lot of this stuff is mandated by the General Assembly. You're being told to do a lot of these things. I understand that. But what you've been left with by the General Assembly is an architectural shortcoming and a budget shortcoming that, you, as far as I know, nobody's addressed yet. Nobody in here, nobody out there has addressed the fact that you are working with structures that were designed in 1950s standards and you're trying to implement 2021 societal, woke, whatever you want to call it, problems into. You need to figure out how you're going to find the money to redesign all of your locker rooms and your bathrooms to meet these new requirements. That's the, that's the problem that everybody here has missed. And I see you all shaking your heads and looking down, and I think you might agree with me a little bit. I've been to other countries where they addressed this issue before they even knew it was a problem because of how they designed their bathrooms. Their bathrooms are individual stalls that open into the hallway, not into a common bathroom. And then the hand washing stations are sinks on the wall in the hallway. Also makes it pretty easy to figure out who washed their hands, by the way. <laughs> So I'm going to leave you with that, that you need to figure out how you're going to create a budget program. You're going to need to get your lobbyists to go back to Richmond and say, hey, you passed these laws, but you didn't give us the funds and the tools that we need to fix the issue. And you're going to have to figure out where you're going to, where you're going to find that money. Dr. Spence, what are you going to cut out of your budget to find the money to redesign your buildings to meet these new needs? You're going to cut sports? You're going to cut arts? What are we going to do? Maybe you've got to go to 12-month school on a rotating basis where each semester of students has a different semester off every year to where you don't need new schools for a while. If you keep the schools occupied 12 months a year, the kids don't need to be home in the summer to bring in the crops anymore. I get it. Everybody wants their summer off. My wife loves having her summer off. But this system was created so the children were home to help with the farm. I don't think there's that many farmers in this area right now that don't have a $2 million combine picking their corn. So I'm not telling you that's a solution. I'm telling you, you're going to have to start thinking outside the box to figure out how you're going to solve a problem that I get it. You were handed by Richmond because I deal with a lot of problems that are handed to us by Richmond, like the other one you're getting ready to talk about when you try to create a gun-free zone here. I'm going to be back. So that's all I got for you, and I do wish you luck with the rest of the folks out here, because I'm going to get in my truck and leave. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Amy Morris, then Kathleen Slindy, then Nicole Pixler. Welcome. Blessed day. Policies should be grounded in data, not opinion. Recognizing male and female separated spaces in sports is purposeful. There is no such thing as a trans child. It doesn't exist in reality. None die or suffer from using accurate pronouns and facilities. There is no person born with the wrong body by accident. And kids don't su suddenly come up with this idea on their own. They're taught to hate themselves by gross opportunists that should have never had access. Stop telling children falsely that sex is different than gender. There are two. It is uh, two. Personality and outfit choice don't determine who qualifies to keep their birth name and sex organs. Why was there no discussion or public notice copy of suggested policy, yet there is a vote today? Virgin Dems funded this in September 2020, so he got the money already. 
What you are about to vote on is a policy that only Democrats refer to as anti-bullying and or trans rights. The policy is fraudulent. It intends harm to all involved, and it's knowingly written for that reason. The policy intends to punish most people who are simply honest and use correct terminology. The policy forces participation in the socially constructed perverted cult that is classified as LGBT rights. Talk to the gay people, they're mad too. Equity Equality Virginia, the new pop-up rich nonprofits, are Northam's clan. He put them scapegoats on his boards to do their dirty deeds. Cases on the books across the map pointing out things like loss of custody to the state, teachers fired for not using made up language, children mutilated after being labeled drugged and told that they're in the wrong body by accident by liars based on nothing but lies, girls being shamed, raped, forced, ignored, in grade schools. It's now evident why an abortion clinic and a sex habit and fetish advocacy has control of the atmosphere in K through 12. My hand experience, my first hand experience, being told that a five-year-old boy in my family had a penis by accident was 2016. Strangers, employees of the state, claimed they knew day one he was trans, also known as a girl. And uh, that's a boy in a body that's wrong, according to liars. None making the claim had any experience with what they were calling trans child. It, they can't even define it right now. I recorded it all. Everybody's going to love what I have to share with this state. I was told I couldn't use his birth name or I'd lose rights to see him. Some involved were just found guilty this year after 2016 of child abuse and mental cruelty. I don't know why the Virginia Dems changed FGM to a misdemeanor. It's a felony in this country. I don't know why Ms. Owens may or may not have a report regarding guidance for seven-year-olds in 2018, not allowed to speak the words, you are a boy, or how did they uh, tell girls that a boy was in their bathroom? What parents and teachers were told then, according to the vote today, there is no such policy in Virginia seconds. Beach is intending to punish most who are simply being honest equal to bullying. They have a law for it now. They're saying that they're going to uh, request schools report parents to CPS and social services if they don't comply with these made up rules that had no real guidance. They did. And they also changed the policy to have schools report incidents to the police. If I had six more minutes in a mainstream. And that is time. I'd end this all real quick. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathleen Slindy, then Nicole Pixler, and then Mark Stevens. Welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Milnick, board members, and Dr. Spence. My name is Kathleen Slindy, and I serve as the president of the VDA. I'm here to speak on Agenda 13C, Policy 5-9, Non-Discrimination, Non-Harassment of Students and the mandate that all school divisions adopt policy to support transgender and non-binary students. The mission, of the, the mission statement of the VBEA says to advocate for educational, education professionals and to unite our members to fulfill the promise of public education and to prepare every student to succeed in a diverse and independent world. With that mission guiding us, we support any and all policies that support our students' learning environments and our students. We support regulations that ensure student, educator, and family voices are centered to create welcoming and affirming schools for all, regardless of race, gender, gender identity, background, culture, nationality, or zip code. Safe and affirming schools are a core element of student success. We want all of our students to thrive, and can, that can only happen when our schools are places where all students are protected and empowered. Policies and regulations that include specific to ensure that are necessary, and oversight to ensure that they are followed will help us reach and teach every student. This policy aligns with many parts of VBCPS's strategic action agenda for 2021-22, particularly with the Compass to 2025 Student Centered for Student Success Goal Number Two, Students' Well-Being. It says. 
create an inclusive and learning environment that supports the physical and mental health of all students and strengthens the social and emotional skills they need to become balanced, resilient learners who are personally and socially responsible. The greatest superpower of all public educators truly, that all public educators truly have is their ability to do this, to meet every child where they are, to embrace who they are without judgment, and to teach them so they can reach their full potential. We ask you to ensure that the policy and regulations put forth reflect the spirit of our work and create the safe and affirming environment all students and educators need. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole Pixler, then Mark Stevens, then Darren Scott Carlton. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Good evening. My name is Nicole Pixler. I'm the co-executive director of Stand Up For Kids in Hampton Roads. We help homeless and disconnected youth ages 12 to 24. I'm also the co-founder and facilitator of You. These are monthly meetings, soon to be twice a month, for youth ages 12 to 18 who identify as part of the LGBTQ community in Virginia Beach. Sorry, it's hard to talk through this. <laughs> the national statistic is that 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ+. This percentage is even higher in Virginia Beach. Stand Up For Kids started you as a safe place for identifying youth every, excuse me, for identifying youth. Every youth and adult that matters should feel safe, included, and have a sense of belonging. This past Wednesday at our monthly meeting, I brought up this policy to our youth that identify and left it open to discussion. The most popular comment that was made was that there should be an all genders bathroom, not just male and female. Youth should not have to pick a gender when they're still trying to find themselves and can barely already and be confused by what they identify as. The following is from the 2021 Trevor Project National Survey on LGBTQ plus youth from the mental health standpoint. It is the most comprehensive of its kind and surveys over 40,000 LGBTQ plus youth in the US. 72% of LGBTQ plus youth reported symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder. Excuse me. 62% of LGBTQ plus youth reported symptoms of major depressive disorder. 42% of LGBTQ plus youth seriously considered attempting suicide in the past 12 months. Within the past year, nearly half of all LGBTQ plus wanted counseling but didn't receive it for one reason or another. 75% of LGBTQ plus youth reported discrimination due to either their sexual orientation or gender identity. Only one in three youth found their home to be LGBTQ affirming. 30% of LGBTQ youth experienced food insecurity in the past month. Let me reiterate, 75% of youth reported discrimination due to their sexual orientation or gender identity. I stand before you this evening mind blown that we even have to vote on the treatment of non-binary and transgendered students. They are people just like you and I. They should be no question. They should be treated with love and respect just like everybody else. You have the ability to make sure these students don't feel left behind. They can not only survive high school being different by society's standards, but they can thrive. I am in complete support of passing this, and I hope that you will take these sometimes very vulnerable lives into consideration when voting. They need to be provided safety and dignity just like anyone else. Their success and their future is in your hands. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mark Stevens, then Darren Scott Carlton, then Thomas Cannant. Well, welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much. I'm Mark Stevens. I'm the executive, <laughs> executive director of Stand Up for Kids, and I'm also a Virginia Beach Human Rights Commissioner. I'm here tonight to say that we need to do the right things by our youth. Our youth are dying on their streets. Our youth are hurting themselves because we're not protecting them. And everybody in this room has a responsibility to protect these youth. Nicole just went over all the statistics that we see and what we hear in our group. I started this program a year ago, you, because nobody in Virginia Beach had a program for our youth. There was no place for them to go. There was not a safe place for them to go. And I couldn't believe this. So I started this program because I knew we had to do something. Just like tonight, you have to do something to protect these kids. Keep them safe, keep them feeling good, 
I've had people come to our meetings. They run our cities. They're on our police force. They've all succeeded, but the pain they've had through school is unbelievable. And we shouldn't continue to let this happen to our kids. All our kids need to be safe and have a safe place. Every kid in our city, and we're the largest city in Virginia, and we need to do the right thing by our youth. Protect them, keep them safe, and that's our responsibility. So all I can say tonight is we need to do the right thing and protect all our youth, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much, and good luck, because I, if this is what our kids go through that I saw in this parking lot, we need to change. And I feel bad for you all to have to listen to this hate, and to see the hate in this parking lot upset me highly, and I don't understand it in our city. Again, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Darren Scott Carlton, then Thomas Conant, then Kendra Fraser. Wait, that was okay. Uh, is Thomas Conant? Welcome. Thank you. That's Conant for the record. Good evening. I want to express my disgust at the cowardly efforts of this board to avoid public scrutiny. Forced masking at the point of a gun, limiting attendance tonight to keep the public outside is a pathetic attempt to eliminate opposition to whatever you do. In addition, presenting policy 5-7 with only a few days for public review is unacceptable. Adopting policy 5-7 is effectively ceding school board responsibility and oversight directly to Dr. Spence, who is not elected, nor accountable to voters. Another example of the spineless methods of those who want to impose their will on thousands of students and parents in the city without being accountable for their outcomes. I noted that policy 5-7 does not specify policies required in the DOE model, which state code requires you to, to use. It does not say that the school can hide a student's gender request when communicating with parents, which undermines parents' rights in Virginia Law 1-240.1, which states a parent has a fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing, education, and care of the parent's child, which is echoed by U.S. Supreme Court decisions. Neither does it specify that students should be allowed to use restrooms, locker rooms, and other facilities that correspond to their gender identity, and school staff should not confront them about their gender identity upon entry into the restroom, nor, as the model implies, that accommodations on overnight trips may include students of either sex. I'm glad these are not in policy 5-7. My problem is the policy gives the superintendent authority to change it without the approval of the board. So you could adopt this tonight, and tomorrow it could be changed to codify everything in the DOE model. Who will then be accountable if a girl declares herself trans and is sexually assaulted in a boy's restroom or locker room? Who will answer if the wishes of an elementary age child are hidden from his parents while the school affirms he is a girl when this violates the parents' deeply held belief that God created male and female and sex based on empirically validated chromosomes is fixed from the moment of conception and cannot be changed? Who will ensure the safety and well-being of all the students who are forced to undress in a locker room with someone who is biologically of the other sex? What will you say to a parent whose child gets a kidney infection or worse by refusing to use the restroom at school out of fear for someone of the opposite sex may be there? Will it be the teacher, the administrator, Dr. Spence, if you put this in, this in his hands, you can simply wash your hands and blow off accountability. Lastly, by CDC estimates, CDC estimates that are typically very loose, three-tenths of one percent of people struggle with transgender issues. And the DOA model says recognizing a child as transgender does not necessarily require any substantiating evidence nor any required minimum duration of expressed gender identity. So this policy subjects over 65,000 students and their parents to the expressed feelings of 195 students in Virginia Beach. We can all agree that no child should be bullied for any reason, and none would object to a policy of non-discrimination and support for all students. This doesn't mean that kids claiming to be or being told by adults that they are transgender should be allowed to force other children into environments where they feel uncomfortable, conflicted, or violated. If policy 5-7 is meant to truly promote equality, then every student deserves the same right to feel safe and secure in school and receive fair and equal treatment, especially given the fact that the number of students seconds. who accept their biological sex far exceeds those who do not. Please reject this policy and the DODE model from which it came. We can absolutely insist that all children treat each other kindly, 
without indoctrinating an entire generation in gender confusion. And I want to congratulate the ladies who are here without masks tonight. Apparently, the gun's not pointed at them. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kendra Fraser, then Amy Solaris, then Lauren Burroughs. Welcome. Hello. Um, I've never done this before, so I'm not part of any organization. I'm not part of uh, any of that. I'm just a parent. Um, my daughter is 11, rising sixth grader. Um, and I really don't have an opinion either way on people's choices on what they want to do with their life. Who you want to be with, who you want to be as a person is none of my concern. My only concern is for a smaller child to have to be in a new environment. She's never done anything, like middle school is a big difference than elementary school. She's having to switch classes. She's having to change out for gym. These are all things that she's never had to experience before. There's still things about life she's still trying to understand in general. The idea of having to be in a locker room and maybe see something that she probably shouldn't see is doesn't quite sit right with me. Um, I don't have a problem with them using bathrooms if there's a way to shield those who are younger from being able to see things they don't understand. Um, I understand that they are, from what I've heard uh, about things over the last couple of years since this has kind of taken full force that it couldn't be something that's understood as a small child. Um, I get it, but then I don't because they still ask where babies are coming from. How do you understand that? Um, I just feel like uh, when it comes down to it, if y'all make the decision to integrate or I don't even know the correct verbiage, I'm sorry, but if you make that decision, um, I ask that y'all find a way to do it to be able to make sure everybody is still safe in that situation and still able to acknowledge um, that they're not all high schoolers that y'all are talking about. Some of these are still babies. Um, that that's the part that I'm not okay with. You know, I don't want to have a I'm not. I don't want to be forced to have a conversation with my child that I don't feel like she's ready for. Um, that's something that I'm asking uh, you all to consider um, when y'all make that choice. Because if you do it in a way where we have to, I think that can cause a bigger problem. And I just want y'all to, to keep that in mind. All right? Thank you. I don't need the whole for me. Our next speaker is Amy Solaris, then Lauren Burroughs, then Jordan Hydermans. Welcome. Hi. For my speech, I'm six feet away. I'm going to pull my mask down because I'd like to be heard. Ma'am, I'm going to respectfully remind you of, of the expectation that was clearly indicated on the posted okay. agenda. Okay, I just wanted to see how much respect you would give to people taking time off of our schedule to come in and talk to you. I'll be discussing agenda items of policy 57 and 529. The transgender policy 57 merely reaffirms the anti-bullying policies we already have in effect. These issues... Oh, excuse me, it only goes further to limit parental rights. These children should not be dealt, should be dealt with on a personal and private level with their parents, not with the schools nor school staff. And one of the items in this policy says, for accommodations for overnight trips, adults who are not students should not share rooming, changing, or bathing facilities with students. The word should not leave the doors open for this to happen. This is one example of where our children could be in harm's way, where people are not questioned when walking into opposite sex changing or bathing areas. There is the chance for possible sexual assaults. My 14-year-old daughter should not be forced to share a locker room with a biological boy nor any biological male who identifies as a girl. Where is my daughter's privacy rights? When, when did, why does she lose her rights? Who will be responsible for these sexual assaults when they occur? I'm going to switch gears and talk about policy 529, the awards for achievement. I noticed, I've noticed this a little bit. Item, items D, valedictorian, salutatorian, and item E, class rank, are completely crossed off. Advanced class is going to be stopped. What is the school board doing? 
And why? Why are students not challenged to do their best anymore to become top of their class? Where is merit in the classroom? I believe this is, excuse me, I believe this is the, another decision by the school board bringing critical race theory into our schools by making things equitable. I'm talking about the cancellation of the valedictorian and salutatorian and canceling class ranks. A school board, school board should support students, motivate students, and challenge students to do their best. There are life lessons. New generations are no longer learning. To fail is good. You learn from failing. I have a background in law. I remember taking education classes, children in the law classes, family law classes. The common denominator of all these is based on the best interest of the children. Everything you do as a city public school board should be in the best interest of the children. What we are seeing is the complete opposite. Your non-transparency, transparency, dropping courses for certain students, sneaking lesson plans in, which involve critical race theory, taking away parental rights with possible vaccine mandates, mass mandates, and this new transgender policy is all too clear. You are only interested in furthering your political beliefs. Virginia State Code states parental responsibility includes public school education atmosphere supportive of individual rights. And B, a school board shall provide opportunities for parental and community involvement in every school in the division. The Virginia Beach City Public School Board is restricting our parental rights with each new policy and even access now to our schools and when our children are in school. Stop taking away parental rights. It takes a community to raise our 30 children. 30 seconds. Supreme Court of the United States, Troxel v. Granville, noted liberty interest of parents in the care, custody, and control of their children is perhaps the oldest of the fundamental liberty interests recognized by the court. Virginia Public Schools' state-mandated educational mission is to teach children reading, writing, science, history, and arithmetic, not beliefs. The case also stated schools operate loco parentis authority, meaning the absence of parental control, which reasonably enables schools to ensure and maintain a modicum of discipline. And that is discipline. time. This does not exceed parental authority. Our next Thank speaker you. is Lauren Burroughs, then Jordan Heidermans, and then Kathleen Brown. Okay. Uh, Jordan Heidermans. Welcome. Good evening. Thanks uh, for the opportunity to speak in regards to policy 5-7. This evening, um, as I do so, I have two requests for you to consider um, as you uh, consider the proposed amendments and these regulations. First, I would ask that you not approve any policy that allows for regulations or amendments to regulations on sensitive or controversial matters to be adopted without school board approval or without input from the community. While I understand the need for the superintendent to be responsible to draft and implement regulations on policy in many areas, matters that directly or could directly impact a parent's God-given stewardship of their children should not be placed in the hands of any one individual. I ask this on behalf of both proponents and opponents of some of the proposed regulation in this evening's board packet. We parents and guardians want the opportunity to give input on these things and you honestly all need to avail yourself to the opportunity to hear from us. The students in your classrooms for whom these policies are being drafted are our kids. A few years ago, I attended an informational meeting on proposed changes to Virginia Beach's sex education curriculum. The event was announced in multiple ways. The material was thoroughly communicated at the event and parental input was encouraged all along the way. As a dad, I was impressed and I was grateful. And in that case, the adjustments to the curriculum were relatively benign and uncontroversial. I'm saddened that within a short period of time, we're at the place where a much more impactful policy is being decided upon with little notice, little review, and little opportunity to receive input from the parents and guardians that have entrusted you with some of the education of their children. Additionally, as you review these proposed regulations, I ask that you consider that these do not solve the problems of discrimination, but merely adjust who the subjects of discrimination might be. Is it not at least slightly prejudicial that those who embrace their biological gender may now have to find alternatives 
to using their locker room in order to seek privacy? Will removing themselves from their classmates' settings to avoid embarrassment or potentially declothed exposure to peers of the opposite sex not be a bit stigmatizing? I know that in many ways the ship has sailed on the bigger matters related to how we engage this transgender phenomenon, and it is indeed a phenomenon with younger school-age kids. When the state deftly drafts policy that calls for tampons in boys' restrooms, it's relatively easy to see how we've decided to define the love and care for those experiencing gender dysphoria. I am concerned that such decisions and the trajectory that we are on will not help, but will ultimately do further harm and hinder all students from a quality public education. Compassion for those identifying as transgender is not reached only through unquestioned affirmation. My wife and I, and many others that I interact with on a regular basis, are sincerely bothered by the ability you might give a child to alter gender identity without a parent's knowledge and approval. A child could handwrite a letter, add their youthful signature, and completely alter his or her present and future circumstances. No minor should have the ability to make socially altering decisions without a parent's knowledge and consent. If you set this precedent, do you plan to then provide for these children, pay their bills, plan their futures, walk with them, as they likely, according to statistics, detransition years down the road? No, you don't. My 12-year-old can't walk into a pediatrician's office unaccompanied for her And that is time? We need to stop playing games with the lives of the children in our city. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathleen Brown, then Tim Kessner, and then Christopher Hollinger. Welcome. Hello. Um, I just want to start by saying I am extremely angry at the board right now, and I'm going to keep my calm, but this around here right now, this is not okay. Um, my name is Kathleen Brown. I ask that you do not pass policy 5-7 on the agenda. And a lot of people may not realize um, what 5-7 means. This doesn't mean that we're being homophobic here. Um, you guys are taking parents out of the decision making for their own kids and teaching them to lie. That's just not cool. Um, I want to remind the board that just because the Virginia Department of Education passed model policies does not mean that you need to pass them. The language for the policy written by the school board attorney indicates that the board is required to adopt it. Um, this is incredibly misleading. Um, I double checked the Virginia code and it utilizes the word shall and not must. Therefore, it is not required. And the United States Supreme Court ruled in 1995 in Gutierrez de Martinez versus Lamagno that shall means may or optional. Um, by the way, Cammy, the code is wrong on your policy, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that with you. I printed it, so I have a copy. Today, um, we're not devoting, uh, voting on anti-discrimination policies. You're voting on anti-parent policies by allowing children to make these decisions that are not consistent with the wishes of the parents. Without discussion or public input, parents are also not permitted access to their kids during the school day. It appears the board is attempting to divide parents from their kids. This is not a very good legacy for you, Ms. Rye. At the Policy Review Committee, Cami Linetti stated the board votes on policies and Superintendent Spence makes the regulations. I would suggest that you guys have given Aaron Spence too much power if you don't know what you're voting on because you're only voting on the policy and he's writing the regulation. You should not be teaching our kids to lie behind their parents' backs. I've been an athlete for 25 years, 11 years of which I was competitive, and I have coached for a living for eight. I would consider myself an expert in athletics in the field. I recognize that the policy in front of us does not give details for competitive sports at this time, but it is important to remember that athletes will seek to improve over time. That means they will always become competitive if they continue. There are significant physiological differences between biological males and females that gives males an inherent natural advantage in most, if not all, sports. Male athletes have much greater muscle mass and will easily surpass girls in strength. Males during post and post-puberty accelerate and become more powerful, whereas females' body shape will change, making it difficult to adapt. There are, however, some differences between the body and how it changes in certain females of different ethnic backgrounds. As such, eating disorders is a very, very prevalent disorder amongst athletes so they can remain competitive. 
Allowing individuals to join the team with which they identify only stands to exacerbate an already difficult and dangerous challenge facing athletes. If girls and boys were the same, they would already be competing against each other 100% of the time. The board majority seems to have a history of not allowing parents the right to make decisions for their own kids. We've seen that recently with masking and now we're seeing it with this policy. Not only has the board put themselves in a position where parental choice is being stripped, seconds. but they're also playing doctor and therapist with zero credentials to do so. First amendments are certainly under attack by the board majority. You are intentionally attempting to lessen the ability for those that disagree with you to come publicly address you. Using COVID as a free speech shield, the board has become more, the board has to be more concerned about a FOIA request than you do from COVID. So stop using COVID to attempt to muffle free speech and parental choice. Again, I'm going to encourage you time. to discontinue parenting our kids. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tim Kessner. Um, where do I leave this? And then Christopher Hollinger and then Andy Bann. Welcome. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Tim Keister. I've been a resident in Virginia Beach since 2015 and work here as a software and hardware engineer. Though I have no children of my own, many teachers took personal interest in my life and greatly helped me in my career, and I want to pay it forward to the next generation. Through my student ministry at church, I've had the opportunity and privilege to mentor seniors in my career field for their capstone project at Ocean Lakes Math Science Academy and was honored to be invited to attend their graduation ceremonies last year. This evening, I've come to speak in opposition to the changes on policy 5-7. While I prefer to work with the students directly, this policy negatively affects every student in Virginia Beach, and I'm compelled to speak against it. One of my first interactions with a student was attending their chorus concert at Corporate Landing. Towards the end, a group of boys sang a moving rendition of In Flanders Fields. I spoke with the teacher afterwards, and she stressed how difficult it was for gathering boys at that age to sing in front of an audience and how proud she was of them. But reading through this policy, I found the boys' chorus, something that's particularly fragile, was specifically targeted. The foundation of this policy is the idea that the best way to help a student wrestling with gender identity is to affirm their chosen identity. The policy asserts, if you declare yourself to be a girl, then you're a girl. Your teachers, fellow students, and transcripts will call you a girl. You can use the girls' bathrooms, you can stay in the girls' room overnight, you can even sing in the girls' choir, but you can't compete with the girls' athletics. Here lies my opposition to this policy. To a student struggling with gender dysphoria, this policy is a slap in the face. You're equal in every way but one. If you're willing to destroy delicate things like the boys' choir for the sake of transgender students, then why are sports exempted? If affirmation is so desperately needed, this policy is a half measure. Don't give me an excuse that or other organizations have jurisdiction over sports. God has jurisdiction over gender, male and female. He created them. You'll oppose God to his face, but tremble in fear before the almighty Virginia Scholastic Rowing Association? It's cowardice. Look, you have easy leverage right here. If an organization the school associates with violates the policy on discrimination and harassment, then we'll terminate our relationship and revoke access to facilities. Now your policy has teeth. But here's the ultimate slap in the face to the transgender student. We see someone who's suffering from an existential crisis. We promise to help them create an identity and we leave them empty handed. We promise not to erase their identity as we actively tear down everything that allows boys and girls to find identity in their gender, sports, chorus, the locker room, and even the words male and female. At one time, the lobotomy was considered a cutting edge treatment for schizophrenia and the doctor who invented it was awarded the Nobel Prize but it was an abusive, barbaric treatment. It took a person who was battling with their mind and solves the problem by destroying them and their mind, <laughs> leaving them with nothing. This treatment was not to ease the suffering of the patient. It was to ease the suffering of society. Like schizophrenia, gender dysphoria is an extremely difficult men mental illness to deal with. I believe that in the next day, decade, many of the policies, treatments, and surgical procedures for gender dysphoria will be viewed like lobotomies, a form of mental and physical abuse that robs people of their humanity. A treatment we selfishly just, seconds. justify as compassionate because it's easier to play along than confront the source of the dysphoria 
and lead them to find an identity in something more substantial than a pronoun. If affirmation is the cure, then this policy is a half measure. It promises equality and fails to deliver. Either commit to this abusive idea fully or abandon it. There's no middle ground. But know this, history does not look well on people who try to play God. Attempt this at your own peril. Our next speaker is Christopher Hollinger, then Andy Bann, then Sandra Frazier. Welcome. Good evening, Madam Chairman. As a professional appellate attorney, I would like to say thank you for bringing the timer, and you can dispense with the 30-second note. I get paid to watch timers and talk at the same time. So thanks. You made my life easier. Um, hey, welcome to the hard, messy work of making policy on sensitive issues. Whew, and trying to breathe through a mask. Sorry. Um, we are at the crossroads, the rubber meeting the road of noble ideas like anti-discrimination, tolerance, and inclusion running headlong into parental rights, religious liberty, freedom of expression, freedom of association. This is not an easy thing to deal with. I would submit to you that if any of you sitting at the dais and around the room here think it is easy just because equality and equity is so important, you are abandoning your responsibilities to our children and to us as citizens. You're setting policy in some of the most intimate and sensitive areas of human development, areas that have been widely recognized in society as the sole province of parents. And you are interposing yourselves between parents and children on those issues. I would submit to you that that is unacceptable. <clears throat> you have an anti-bullying policy in place that prevents anyone from being treated badly. It is a noble shield which should remain to prevent any student from t treating any other student in an unacceptable way, in a mean way. But it should not be converted into a sword to be used to impose values and ideas about human sexuality on people who have been raised to think about those things differently than you do. I'd like to ask if you are open to change enough, as you say in your core values, to acknowledge that you might be wrong to brush aside the concerns, fears, and values of a 12-year-old girl whose parents have taught her that it's inappropriate for her to change her clothes in the same room as a boy. I'd like to ask you if you value differences enough to recognize that perhaps it's wrong to inject yourselves and your ideas about human sexuality into your entire curriculum in the way that you're doing it. Because this is not just treat everybody nicely. This is not just preventing bad behavior. This policy will force people to act, to speak, to take action in ways that are contrary to their conscience. That is something that this country has never done on a wholesale basis. This country has taken pride throughout its history of honoring rights of conscience and conscientious objection of not compelling people to act in ways that violate their conscience. And whether you are forcing a child to change their clothes or live in a hotel room in a, with a member of the opposite biological sex in a way that their parents have taught them is inappropriate, or you're forcing a teacher or other student to simply affirm something that they believe to be biologically incorrect in the name of inclusion, you're still compelling action that is contrary to their conscience. Again, I would submit to you that that is unacceptable. I'm going to close with just one quick reminder. Um, again, as an attorney, I reviewed the code sections that were, uh, in, you know, that, were, that are the subject of this situation, the 22.1 that the, that the state put in place. I want to remind you all that just because something is legal, just because something is prescribed by the law, just because the people up in Richmond passed 30 it seconds. and said that it's required, that doesn't make it morally or ethically correct. And frankly, policymakers and residents of this commonwealth ought to be more aware of that than a lot of other people in this country. Please be mindful of that as you consider this. Consider having the courage to push back to Richmond and say, no, your law is incorrect. It is immoral, and we will not follow it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Bann, then Sandra Frazier, then Robin Blanchard. Welcome. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, great to see you all again. So can I be a girl for a day? I'm just go to the women's locker room and be there for a day and as a kid experiment. 
No. I think there's a period of time that I have to consistently express that identity. So you will and I agree that what the process should be during that period of time, and why don't we just extend that to, to the rest of the time. You are already agreeing that it's okay for a kid who has this idea of gender identity to be in a position that is unchanged from what it was yesterday or now. Why don't we just continue that process? There's a lot of heat. I don't, I'm sure you can feel it. And I think that's as a result of a, a trust issue. So you write that if the parent and the student disagree, the student and the parent legal guardian will work with the school administrators to determine how to address the student's needs. Who are you? Who? My child is required to attend school. Who are you to say, I'm going to eject myself into that relationship? What gave you that role? Please talk about that in the discussion, because we'd like to know. And you continue with the safety and welfare, as well as the student's access to education, ser educational services and opportunities should serve as the primary focus. So I assume we're not talking about child abuse here, because that would be a reportable crime, and I don't think anyone would disagree that if a parent is harming a child to the definition of child abuse, that they should be charged with child abuse. So apart from child abuse, how does a parent jeopardize the safety and welfare of their children or child <laughs> by disagreeing with the child's view of his own identity or her own identity. How does that jeopardize safety and welfare? If that's the focus, it must. Or if it doesn't, then you're out. Leave the relationship alone. But you continue. So I ask, how does a parent who disagrees with his child's view of identity jeopardize a student's access to educational services and opportunities? With no child abuse here, we're agreed. How does that happen then? Define that. Tell us. Because I don't see it. We're not co-parents. 30 seconds. Thank you. We're, uh, I have a responsibility to my children. And thank you very much. I'll live up to that. Or I'll get arrested. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandra Ann Frazier, then Robin Blanchard, then John Blanchard. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, Superintendent Spence and school board members, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this issue of transgender policy allowing biological boys, we all know what that is, and biological girls, we also know what that is, to go into their locker rooms and to, to their bathrooms and vice versa. And girls excuse can go me, ma'am, is it possible to raise your mask to cover your nose as well? Sure. Thank you. You know, you want me to cover my eyes too? Like, come on, you're, there's nobody around me, but <coughs> whatever. Okay. I can't even believe we're having, actually, the mask does not stay up very well. So, I can't even believe we have to have this discussion. This is America, and we take care of each other and our children. But this is an abomination. Your policy states, put students first. Okay, which students, at a time when young men and women are at a point in their impressionable lives, at a time when their emotions and physical bodies are in transition, you want to strip away their privacy and their trust by the people who are supposed to be looking out for them. Their parents, yes, their parents are mad. 
but they look to their teachers and then they look to you. I don't know how you people sleep at night. Seek growth. What kind of growth are you talking about? Our young people are not here as part of some social experiment. We are falling behind in academics. We should be focusing strictly on math, sciences, real science, not some made up social experiment, American history, the good and the bad, not critical race theory, that is not it, as well as world history and the world around us and English literature, not this experimental garbage. It's, that's not even education. Be open to change. Sounds good, doesn't it? Let's be open to change. Okay. In some instances, change is good, but not the total destruction of young people's minds to mold into what you think is change. Take notice, you vote this in, and there will be a change of the school board and the superintendent. Do great work together. Lots of great works to be done. But messing with our young people and teaching them they can change their sexual identity depending on how they feel when they wake up in the morning, <coughs> that is not a good work. It is a perversion. Value differences. If those differences mean devaluing who young men and women are, that is hypocrisy, not value. Transgender is a farce perpetuated by many different avenues. Lastly, I want to know who bought you off to suggest that this is acceptable and a good thing for our kids. You are willing to sell out our young people at what price? If you follow through and approve this, expect to reap the consequences. Every student, male or female, who is accosted, shamed, has their picture taken and posted on social media, falls on each one of you that votes for this. Expect the consequences of your vote as more parents opt to homeschool and you lose funding. 30 seconds. Expect a recall and a replacement of all who vote to allow this. Our next speaker is Robin Blanchard, then John Blanchard. Speaker 21 has not checked in, and then it will be Paula Chang. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Robin Blanchard. I am a resident of Virginia Beach. I'm also a mother, a business owner, and I'm also a survivor of sexual assault when I was 15 years old because of a policy very much like this one, where I got trapped in a room with somebody for a sports event, couldn't get out of the room and ended up being assaulted. As I read through this policy, I was horrified that we were setting up other girls to be assaulted like I was. When you see in here that there are no protections, you're not giving any protections to girls, you're taking away their protections. I looked at it and I thought, we're trying to protect transgenders, but yet we are eroding the protections of our females, our athletes, our students. I have two daughters. I have spent my entire parenthood trying to protect them from what I went through. This is no protection for the girls in our schools, none. I looked in here, I tried to see where you, you put transgenders can use whatever bathrooms. What about transgender teachers? Do they get to go in the bathrooms too? What if on a school trip, Johnny, who now feels that he's Mary, decides in the middle of the night when he's spending the night in the girl's room that he is now Johnny again? What happens then? How are we are protecting our females? So I've heard what everybody said. I want to offer you a solution. Everybody else comes with opinions, but I want to give you a solution. So what if at the beginning of the school year, when kids go and they get their physicals, they also get a blood test? And we find out, are they XX? Are they XY? Let's take boys off the bathroom doors and the locker room doors, girls off the locker room doors and off the bathroom doors, put up XX. Put up XY. Whatever chromosome you fit into, that's the sport you play. That's the bathroom that you go in. That's the locker room you go in. That way we're not putting any sort of pronoun on anybody. We don't have to call them this, that, or the other. They can do what they want to do and dress how they want to do and be who they want to be. But it doesn't infringe on the rights of others who are there. I just want to say, as a mother, this makes me terrified for my daughters. Terrified that they will experience what I experienced. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Blanchard, then Paula Chang, then Sonia Smith. 
Welcome. Thank you. If you're wondering if Robin Blanchard and John Blanchard are related, uh, that was my wife. <laughs> so yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, <clears throat> greetings to all of the members of the school board. And uh, your jobs are so important and significant in uh, shaping uh, the contours of culture and the ultimate trajectory of value systems uh, in future generations for our great city. Uh, my name again is John Blanchard. I'm a product of Green Run High School, and I'm currently a resident in the city of Virginia Beach, a business owner and a pastor of a non-denominational church. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And most importantly, I'm a father to my precious gifts from God, my two daughters. I'm here this evening to oppose the adapt adaptation of certain policies related to the treatment of transgender students. I am not transphobic or homophobic, but I live with the conviction and belief in Imago Dei, which is Latin, that means every human bears the image of God and therefore deserves mutual respect and honor. Firstly, let me state that uh, if any policy of this school board, Commonwealth, or even of the nation puts into jeopardy the safety, both physical and emotional, of our children and their development, then it must be utterly rejected and removed from every agenda of education everywhere. It doesn't matter uh, what has already been decided uh, in a room somewhere else. Uh, the path of least political resistance will not yield the outcome of impunity, especially when the stakes are so high and the consequences are so imminent, the call of our times and the weight of this decision demands that a true leader or true leaders will stand up for the truth, for the common good. And yes, for <laughs> some old fashioned morality in education. Uh, secondly, to be both plain and specific, uh, if my precious little girl comes home with the experience of being exposed in a bathroom or locker room, to a male child, which is an X and a Y chromosome, as we heard a moment ago, uh, and sees his private parts or is taken on a field trip in which a boy climbs into bed with her, or if she is touched inappropriately or harmed in any way as a result of this irresponsible, illogical, and really, I believe, ludicrous policy proposal, then it won't matter if the boy claims to be fluid or claims to be the opposite gender or claims to be bisexual. Um, there's going to be a serious problem. and you will be hearing from many dads and moms who will demand justice and take seriously the God-ordained mandate to defend our kids. This is not just my problem, but uh, it will become everyone's problem. It will become your problem, especially those of you who are now entrusted with the sacred trust and responsibility to protect, not just educate, but to protect all of our children from harm. We're counting on you and depending on you to do the right thing for our kids and our community. Third and finally, as I prepare to close, uh, there should be a concern also for those all too commonly overlooked areas and issues of liability and the rights of the rest of the kids. What undue burdens will this policy place on them and, and their freedoms? We can look at this philosophically, politically, scientifically, religiously, or logically in any way you want to cut it. 30 this seconds. policy proposal, thank you. This policy proposal may be the most irresponsible foolish nonsense we have ever considered in the postmodern era, especially when there's no true risk assessment that can confidently assure the safety of our kids and the protection of our schools. And you may be willing, for whatever reason, to take that risk with our children's safety, but I'm not, and most moms and dads are not either. So as a pastor, I'm praying for you to make the right decision that will uphold morality and righteousness and in that our is school time. system uh, for our great city in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, Our next speaker is Paula Chang, then Sonia Smith, then Teresa Stanley. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and consideration. Welcome. Thank you. I say my daughter sends her regards. So, um, I am here to speak, and I'm just going to comment as I'm here, that there are many people sweltering outside in the heat while, um, we are, while you are having many, many seats and rows empty here, and that's something that should be noted. Policy 5-7 is objectionable for multiple reasons, and the school board and Dr. Spence are trying to hide it from you, and oh, nice to see him again as well. The doc Dr. Spence designed and the school board approved a recipe for chaos. 
One, multiple sexes in bathrooms, locker rooms, and contact sports at a time in developments when hormones are raging. Two, no parents or volunteers allowed in a school as a check to you all at any time. Office only by appointment. As a parent, or actually now a grandparent, I say parents demand your rights. And thirdly, and very seriously, the school board administ the school administrators police complaints of sexual assaults. They decide what is turned over to the authorities. If they want to hide the chaos and danger of the policies, it is a process that is in place. Now, I'm going to say this. I am very, very close to someone who's a, a parent of a transgender teenager, a wonderful, gentle young person. And I know the loving acceptance and the emotions that these families take on as they take the journey with their children. And I know how much they, pro they value their privacy and they want to nav as they navigate there where they're going. So what I say now is not to people who support transgender rights, not for any of those people, because I actually really think we have bully policies in effect that are just fine. I'm saying this to the leadership, to the people who design these policies. I find the disingenuous use of transgender and LBGTQ students and their families as cannon fodder in a political war aimed at parental and religious rights, including the rights of LGBTQ parents and I find it unconscionable. For the school board and Spence to deceptively create policy, they say is designed to support people while writing poorly thought out regulations which help nobody and endanger many, it will obviously lead to turmoil, thrusting these gentle children already in turmoil themselves and trying to transition into the limelight in a painful way while at the same time you all will claim those of us who have legitimate concerns are just homophobic. That attitude is dangerous and it's wrong. We are all being set up. Transgender parents, I ask you, do you think this leadership really cares about your child? Let's see, who is the final arbiter of a child's use of a gender name in schools under this policy? The school administration. Now I'll move on. The school board is allowing Dr. Spence control of a policy that they themselves have the responsibility to set in a manner that they're doing it in the same method that they replicated the equity policy behind closed doors. With policy 5-7, the school board turns over all authority regarding this policy to Dr. Spence, who unchecked can check create regulations. These regulations never need approval again. This is devious. My other point is that 5-7 is being handled improperly, but I understand you already know that in regards to the fact that I was at the bylaw, I was at the policy review committee. You brought it out and out of a committee without all the regulations present, but you also seconds. had the gun. You also had the gun um, policy in there. And I noticed that after it leaves policy review committee has changed. The regulations are there, the gun policy is not there. So I just basically have to say that, for example, the policy review committee voted to send this out and then they changed it. So why was that political heat? And that's pretty much it. The remainder of my time, I'll say that I think it's appalling the way you treated the mask um, rules this time to keep people out here, which might explain. And that explain. is time. That's it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sonia Smith, then Teresa Stanley, then Daphne Stagg. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, members of this. Good evening, members of the school board, teachers, and parents. Tonight, I'll be speaking on policies 5-7 and 5-44. I'd like to open by saying that my stance has nothing to do with the people who are transgender, and everything to do with the conduct of the school board and the continued effort to violate our rights as citizens and parents. To the members of our Virginia Beach community, we've been at the mercy of the school board for far too long, whether it's extracurricular activities in-person classes, masks, or vaccines, their objective is clear, to challenge our parental rights, the ultimate form of power and control. It's time for parents to stand. We must come together and say no more. No more do we willingly consent to the exposure and potential harm that may result from impl implementing policies like this. For example, Regulation 5-44.2, on, Regulation under use of facilities states access to facilities such as restrooms and locker rooms that correspond to a student's gender identity shall be available to all students. The same is stated later in the proposal for overnight field trips. 
Wow. Parents, this is over when we stand and say, you no longer have the right to influence my child. I'm not here to change the minds of most of our school board because it's clear they stopped listening to us parents long ago. Instead, I'm here today to caution parents, this school board will stop at nothing to get their way and make no mistake, they're coming for your children. Moral high ground was abandoned long ago. Case in point, these agenda items. I find it odd that, the vital that these vital components of their beloved social emotional learning were quietly being pushed while parent keeping parents in the dark just prior to the start of the school year. This is a huge red flag. It's our job as parents, not your school board, to guide and protect our children. Are we as parents just supposed to allow strangers to educate and guide our children about gender and sexual feelings? When I was growing up, we called someone who wanted to do that a child molester. Now all of a sudden we're just supposed to accept it because it's a social norm. Absolutely not. Now, what consenting adults choose to do in their personal life is none of my business. But we aren't talking about adults here. We're talking about children. And this school board should be ashamed of themselves. Their goal is to mold and shape the minds of our children when it comes to sexuality. Now that we know of this transgender agenda, I also find it alarming parents are simultaneously being notified of the restrictions they will have throughout the majority of each day to their own child due to COVID restrictions. If there's nothing to hide, in the spirit of transparency, I propose a live stream to every classroom where parents can pop in randomly, you know, similar to the virtual learning environment you willingly provided last year for students. Parents, this comes down to a choice you must make. Do you willingly and openly consent to the potential grooming of your child? I care about this community and can't bear to see adult discussions and adult topics forced upon children. Our children are being weaponized for political gain. I encourage everyone to think logically for a moment. If you teach a child to identify their sexual organs and then support exploration of gender concepts, what's the next logical step? I'm just posing a question here and encourage all parents to reflect deeply on this. But equipped with what is learned through family life and now potential implementation of these policies, one naturally begins to wonder, are children being groomed to give sexual consent sooner? Think about it for a moment. 30 seconds. Not only is the school system providing the resources and knowledge, but through these policies, they are encouraging exploration of sexual concepts, which parents are given little to no say. Let me be clear. Once you expose someone to that, to this, what, what you're proposing, there is no turning it off. These children will be influenced and changed for the rest of their life. But I'm sure you guys already knew this, right? As the people listening may believe this is extreme, I assure you after witnessing first And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Stanley, then Daphne Stagg, then Francis Rogers. Welcome. Good evening. I really appreciate the school board. My name is Teresa Stanley. I'm a proud Bayside High School graduate, a longtime resident of Virginia Beach, a mother and a grandmother of children attending the Virginia Beach public school system. And I'm a member of the Human Rights Commission, though I'm speaking to you as an individual citizen tonight. I support the Virginia Beach School Board in its effort to protect human rights for all students in Virginia Beach schools through adoption of the Virginia Department of Education model policies. I'm grateful that we have a Virginia Department of Education in providing the expertise, the best practices to ensure that all students are provided with a respectful, accommodating, and safe learning environment in schools in Virginia. I also want to tell you this evening that I'm very, very appreciative of this school board's leadership in regard to respecting, for as long as history, uh, the history I know, which is more than 60 years, the human rights of more than 60,000 students in Virginia Beach public schools with a myriad of issues that have been coming before you during these challenging times. Again, I am asking that you vote expediently to support the passage of policy 5-7 as amended so that the division is in compliance with the Code of Virginia 2-2-23-2. This policy gives consistent and wise guidance to support staff, parents, and students in our city in providing an optimal, optimal 
learning environment for all. Thank you for your service and for the opportunity to address you this evening. I'm very appreciative. Thanks. Our next speaker is Daphne Stagg, then Frances Rogers, then Virginia Wasserberger. Welcome. Good evening. I'm speaking on agenda item uh, 5-7. Um, I'm here to voice my concern about allowing the Superintendent Spence and his designees to have authority over the regulations on transgender policy in violation of your own bylaws. I am concerned that you don't know what the state regulations are. 22.1-23-3 states the BOE is responsible to create regulations available for school districts to adopt, not that they must be, not that you must adopt these policies. There are eight regulations. They're mostly in place right now. Um, they are all based on non-discrimination laws for all students. You just need to decide if boys can wear dresses to school and if boys can use the girls' bathrooms and girls the boys' bathroom. There's no reason to adopt the suggested state regulations. I am making references that are relative to this agenda item. My concern is that Spence lied when he told you that equity is not based on CRT. It is. The, v, the uh, VA equity ed videos literally said equity is based on critical race theory. The theory that all white people are white supremacists. Okay, okay ma'am, excuse me, but can we get back on, to, you're off topic right now. I am making references that are relative to this agenda item. Well, I've been hearing about equity and CRT, which are not on the agenda, so please. <laughs> Um, you voted for that, and now the taxpayers are responsible for funding an equity department, an entire racist department based on the color of our skin. Ma'am, I'm going to have to call you out of order if you don't get back on topic. You're out of I order am right now. This is relative to this subject. You are placing Spence in a position where you placed him before, and I am concerned. You were all convinced that SEL is not based on CRT okay, and social justice. I'm going to have to ask for you to be um, to leave the podium. I've asked respectfully three times for you to get on topic. You've been out of order <laughs> this twice This is on now. topic. You blindly accepted the SEL grant, and now you're going to yeah. blindly yeah. accept yeah. this yeah. policy because... Our next speaker is Francis Rogers, then Virginia Wassenberg, then Jessica Miley. Welcome. My name is Francis Rogers. I'm a retired Navy Master Chief. I'm here to talk about 5-7, but uh, like everybody else. But I want to add uh, some context about character because it's, I think it's vital to uh, later on in the, uh, my, my pitch. 2020 was a tech, uh, test of our national character. When the epidemic hit, people were in shock, slowed down the country, economic downturn. And uh, we were isolated from one another. Uh, most places were self-quarantined in regions. And uh, yet, at the same time, many people had to step up and take risk in order to keep communities running. My son worked at Food Line. He was a grocery store worker along with the other guys. They worked all the way through the pandemic. They never took a break. They sucked it up every day. Went to work, stocked shelves, and fed hundreds of families. At the same time, so they showed character. Uh, EMTs, firefighters, police, working up close and personal with the community, they showed character. And that's what real character is all about, setting aside your concerns for others' needs. So where were the teachers in all this? Where were they? They were missing an action for 18 months, refusing, refusing risk while drawing full pay. Did they do Zoom classes? Yeah. Could they have done better? Yes. 
And now, though, now those were coming into the new school year, yet those same teachers and you, the school board, are clamoring to do what? Clamoring to teach or instruct our kids how to better teach, respect each other's opinions and treat each other with dignity. Set aside your own opinions for others' opinions. In other words, show character. So through cultural awareness training seminars and new rules like the non-discrimination policy, which is to fence off bad behavior. But you, the school board, you want to empower the superintendent to write non-harassment policy as well as enforce breaches of policy. So he's being invested with authorities which actually exceed social services. Moreover, the superintendent is crafting what can be considered new civil rights laws, making trans transgender students a protected class with equality perks, equity perks. As well, policy breaches will carry force of law with threat of arrest and fine, which is occurring in a few school districts around the country already. As well, there's the mantle, which the news would, the media would throw on any transgression, it would be a hate crime. Meaning, what's been handled in the past for decades by adults in classrooms as social discourse is now being elevated to the superintendent as potential civil rights violations, all to make a social justice statement, not educate. And again, all this caring brought about by those with the least regard for our children for the last 18 months or the parents. And by reference, you just passed a policy denying parents access to school property except by appointment and only to the principal's office. Flags going up. Therefore, for all these reasons, I ask you to reject policy 5-7, return to teachers taking charge of classrooms to enforce civility and good manners at their level, like they've been doing for years. But as well, I urge you to regain the trust of parents. Right now, there's a wide gulf. And you need to make a compact. That compact's been sought by America for 30 forever, seconds. Uh, between parents and schools to, more, to ensure more effective education. But I want to add one thing. I was listening to two, uh, talks about the differences in weight classes and transgenders involved in sports. I talked with a coach of the women's Olympic wrestling team. Good guy. It was great how well the girls are doing. They're, they're crushing it. But when I asked him, I said, how would they do against men? He goes... Uh, not so good. He says they might be able to be, might be able to be a division three wrestler. And that is time. Only in the lightweight classes. So that's how big. And that is time. And that is Our good. next speaker right. is Virginia Wassenberg, then Jessica Miley, then Matthias Paul Telkamp. Welcome. Good evening. Um, so the policy that I'm going to speak on tonight is policy 5-7, non-discrimination and non-harassment of students. It's a policy that I consider important. The recommendation and the agenda is to amend the language of policy 5-7. The recommended amendment lacks structural content for the non-discrimination and non-harassment of transgender students in VBCPS because it states the superintendent or designee is directed to develop regulations, practices, and trainings. And I learned here this afternoon that the designee that has presented this to you is Ms. Lanetti. The amendment relinquishes the duly elected duty of the board to create rights and responsibilities for the conduct of this school division's business. It gives duty to an unelected, quote, superintendent or designee. It encourages this board to willfully refuse to perform the duties it has been elected to fulfill for our students and schools. Our students deserve to have their elected board represent their voice in creating policies that protect them. The board does not get to vote on regulations, practices, and trainings that the superintendent or designee develops, or that that person decides to amend in a future date. And therefore, this amendment of the policy cancels the voice of students. 
You see, the buck stops with you. It stops with you, the board. And public service, sometimes it can be difficult. And sometimes it can seem void of a measurable investment. But the legacy that is imprinted from the creation of policy is invaluable to the great experiment of this United Republic. And we need you, the board, to roll up your sleeves, to dig in as a collective and effective, capable body of incredibly strong women that God created and God ordained to be a body. Work in unity, please, and create structural policy for our students that protects them in every manner of their lives that is under your jurisdiction as the board, your jurisdiction. And while I'll acknowledge that there are political differences between some of you and myself, I want to make it very clear here tonight that I hold the utmost respect and humility for your service to our community. So I'm gonna close in reminding you in that respect and humility, that you were elected because you are seconds. capable. You're capable. You're capable. You're capable of doing this on your own. So please amend your approach to policy 5-7 and do it on your own. Thank you. Our next our next speaker is Jessica Miley, then Matthias Paul Telkamp, and speaker number 30 has not checked in. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you for allowing um, the parents to have a voice this evening. Uh, we really are very grateful and appreciative of the time. I'm a mom to two kids, both at Virginia Beach Public Schools. I've been a resident of Virginia Beach for 10 years now. I had the really unique opportunity of choosing anywhere in the country to move. I worked remotely before remote work was, was a common thing. And my husband and I chose to move to Virginia Beach because of this school district and because of your core values. And we want our children to have those same core values. Uh, we talk about putting students first growth and safety. The core value of Virginia Beach Public Schools talk about valuing differences. That's specifically stated inclusion, inclusive environment, and respect for all students. That includes transgender students and those of the LGBTQ community. In addition to being a mom of two really fun, cool, very busy kids, I am also work at a pediatric hospital. I'm seeing firsthand the impact, the wave of the mental health pandemic that is coming our way. I'm gonna share with you a few statistics that I'd like you to keep in mind when you vote this evening. 15% of students identify as gay. 40% of LGBTQ youth contemplate suicide. 40% contemplate suicide. 84% of our transgender youth feel unsafe. 84%. That is not okay as a mom. And I'm sure all of you as public servants are fearful of those numbers for our kids and our community. We all know that schools can be a hostile environment, unfortunately. And um, we know that kids won't report incidents if they're not being supported by you, the leaders, by the principals, by the teachers, by their peers. I couldn't help but notice when I walked in this evening the very large no bullying sign. But I must tell you, the atmosphere in the parking lot, if that is indicative of what my daughter will face, I am fearful for her. I was fearful for myself, and the very kind security guards have helped me this evening. I'm going to quote one of your core values I would like you to keep in mind when you make a vote this evening. 
we ask ourselves, quote, we ask ourselves, what am I going to do to invite, recognize, and esteem the perspectives of those around me? I beg you to support implementing the VDOE model policy. Please support your core values that you stand upon. This isn't about a bathroom. This isn't about a locker room. 30 seconds. Thank you. This is about supporting the most vulnerable kids, the 84% of them who already feel unsafe, the 40%, 40% who feel have already thought about committing suicide. So I'm gonna close with asking you all to remember the statistics this evening and not just people's opinion about transgender homophobia. I very much appreciate being here this evening. I wish you all the best of luck. You have a hard road ahead with all and of this. And that is time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Matthias Paul Telkamp. Speaker 30 and 31 have not checked in, and then it'll be William Duke. Welcome. Thank you, Chairwoman Wright, Dr. Spence, and board members. My name is Matthias Paul Telkamp. I want to thank you for finally bringing the policy 5-7 for non-discrimination and non-harassment of students up to date following the Virginia State Codes 2.2 through 3900 and 22.1 through 23.3. It is time that all students felt safe within the building of education. The policy as outlined by the VDOE offers needed dignity and respect to a vulnerable population of students. And after seeing what is happening at our school board meetings, as well as across the country, I worry about the LGBTQ youth within our schools. My three girls are friends with multiple kids that will be impacted by this policy. I have never had, I have had these kids over to my house and met with their parents. And I know those that this is important to. We should be ensuring a safe learning environment for all students in our schools. To me, those that are here challenging this are just bigots that wish to keep their heads in the ground and not see the truth all around them. Science is rejected, and they don't want to re acknowledge reality. They fail to acknowledge that the su super supreme, supreme Court, super conservative Supreme Court, sided with the LGBT com community on multiple occasions. Their actions of coming in and being obnoxious and disrupting meetings show that you that they are not here to have a dialogue. And I ask that you un vote unanimously in support of this policy. Although I'm sure there are a few of them that will receive, that will reveal themselves to be prejudiced against any equality and equity within the schools. Critics want to spin a narrative that this is putting our kids in harm's way. And they would have our kids sexually assaulted and humiliated to check someone's gender. They can't prove their case, but as with the civil rights movements of the past, we must do the right thing going forward. We know that statistics prove that the LGBT community is more prone to violence against them than from them. We must offer protections to these students. We must show those critics that no amount of whining, crying, and theatrics will stop you from doing what is right and just. The, the fact that we have a no bullying sign out on the front of this building and our schools, and then we allow for all that to come in here and people feel bullied sitting out waiting to speak, to come in here and support, is, is appalling. And it should not be happening. And the fact that our school board members um, are... Please get back on topic, sir. Okay. 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is William Duke. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Welcome. Thank you. Um, 
Some of you know me, uh, most of you don't. Uh, so by way of introduc introduction for myself, let me just tell you my name is Dr. William L. Duke, and I spent 20 years uh, in um, undergraduate and graduate student education. Uh, some of them uh, uh, also involving gifted high school students. And in all that time, there were a lot of difficulties that some students and faculty uh, uh, had. Many of them were sexual in nature. Uh, there was a 14-year-old girl who found herself pregnant and didn't know what to do about it. Uh, and she was talking to her teachers about it before she talked to her parents. Uh, many other uh, difficulties along the way. I don't need to tell you're a bunch of educators. I don't need to tell you that uh, it's, it's difficult being in education with young people you, who need guidance. Uh, I can't tell you uh, um, that uh, I've read through all of these uh, rules and regulations. I, I will tell you, I, I've skimmed them. Um, I will tell you, though, that it is uh, unfortunate that we have to have so many rules and regulations, and uh, they seem to replace a generosity of spirit and um, uh, civil discourse in, in many cases. Um, so I have only one recommendation to make, and uh, having not completely read, but have only skimmed through what is a lengthy bunch of uh, transgender policy regulations, I would like you to consider including a regulation for a sort of a good Samaritan, good faith effort by any employee, any employee from custodian to principal in a school who might intervene, who might run into a bathroom uh, it, because that person perceives an imminent threat to a student. It could be an LGBTQ or a transsexual or uh, a straight student, uh, anyone. Um, in the olden days, we used to intercede with children um, out of um, concern, and um, now we have a lot of regulations to follow, and I just don't think it would be wise to put regulations in the way of a uh, good faith effort, even if it's incorrect, proves to be incorrect, a good faith effort to save someone from harm. And I'm done. Thank you very much. I'll take questions. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. That was our last in-person per in speaker. We can move on to our online speakers. Yes, ma'am. Our first online speaker is Holly Edwards. Please unmute. Welcome. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, maybe just speak up a little bit more, Ms. Edwards. Is that better? Much better. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Rye, Vice Chair Malmick, Dr. Spence, and members of the school board. I have to say, it's clear listening to the speakers so far tonight that there are a whole lot of people who have never had a meaningful relationship with a trans or a non-binary person in their life. There's also a whole lot of folks that don't understand the, understand the separation of church and state. To any members of the LGBTQ community watching or listening this meeting, please know that you're loved and I see you. I'm addressing you this, e to you this evening as a parent of a rising third grader in Virginia Beach Schools and to let you know that I unequivocally support Virginia Beach Schools adopting the model policies to support non-binary and trans children in our schools. My grandmother was born in 1918. Her given name was Bertha Florence. Even in the 20s, my grandma thought that Bertha wasn't a cool name. My brother, he has gone by his middle name his entire life. My brother-in-law, I didn't even know his legal first name for the first few years that my husband and I dated. Every year on the first day of school or the first day on the job, my grandmother, my brother, and my brother-in-law were announced by their legal first name. They quickly asked their teachers and colleagues to call them by their preferred name. And every single time, no questions asked, their, re their request was respected. Using a child's preferred name and preferred pronouns has shown to increase confidence, decrease depression, 
and allow students to focus on their education rather than how they may be addressed in schools. This is a simple matter of respecting our students. As for bathrooms, this matter has already been settled by the Supreme Court when they allowed Gavin Grimm's victory in court to be upheld. This shouldn't even be up for debate. All of us have been in the bathroom with someone who identifies as non-binary or transgender and we had no idea because it's not our business. Labeling someone as a predator simply because of their gender identity is wrong. Many folks on this school board like to talk a lot about the mental health of students. Now is your opportunity to put those words into action. In a recent study published by the National Institute of Health, 58% of, of transgender non-binary youth reported being prevented or discouraged from using a bathroom that corresponds to their gender identity. Among those youth who have experienced bathroom discrimination, 85% reported depressive mood and 60% seriously considered suicide. Furthermore, other studies have shown that the majority of students are far less divided on this issue than the adults that are speaking tonight. The majority of students under the age of 18 are not opposed to transgender and non-binary students using the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity. I'm disappointed that once again, a minority members of this body went out of their way to keep the business of the school board moving forward by not allowing the board to vote on this important policy to protect students in Virginia Beach schools prior to the start of the school year. I look forward to the Virginia Beach schools adopting this model, these model policies from the Virginia Department of Education, which have already been adopted in Norfolk, Portsmouth, and many other localities across the Commonwealth. Thank you. Our next, Our next speaker, speaker is, is Dan, Dan Chang. Please unmute. Welcome. First, I would like to say that I do not oppose the LGBTQ students or their parents. I support that all citizens under the Constitution have equal rights. I do oppose the manner in which Ms. Rye, Ms. Melnick, and Superintendent Spence have used the LGBTQ students and their parents to destroy parental rights. I oppose the deceptive manner Ms. Rye and Ms. Melnick have used to implement transgender policies and regulations at the last minute without public and parental inputs. Ms. Rye and Ms. Melnick, your transgender policy and regulations require many people of faith to suspend their beliefs. Ms. Rye and Ms. Melnick, you do not respect our parental rights. Silence is a form of free speech so I will use the rest of my time in silence, exercising my First Amendment rights in the opposition to this school board's transgender policy and regulations.
30 seconds. And that is time. Speaker number three and number four are not online. We will go on to Jeannie Baker. Please unmute. Welcome. Hi, this is Jeannie Baker. First, I'd like to say as an online speaker, if you say anything to me and I'm speaking, I can't hear you. For instance, if you say 30 seconds or anything, I can't hear it on my end. Just sharing that. Thank you. I'm here to comment on the policy of non-discrimination of students specifically the transgender policies that are being added to our public school system. Our state passed a law that a transgender policy must be in effect before school starts. That's in two weeks. Our school board plans on discussing brand new extreme policies never before in history and also voting in one evening. I hope this is not rushed and pushed through just to put a check in the box. This is a very serious topic. By the way, Virginia Beach Schools has 14 protected groups. I bet there are more protected groups than not. Realize that every person is already protected against physical harm, name calling, et cetera. Our anti-bullying policy accomplishes a lot that is in these new rules. I ask that anything that is already in the anti-bullying rules or any other policies not be duplicated in another set of rules. I also request that the entire school board be part of the planning and implementing. Reading the agenda item, Superintendent Spence will be developing and implementing this. One person should not have this much power. We voted for school board members. We did not vote for Spence. I believe this should be the school board members responsibility. On the area of pronouns, the agenda says that you will be deciding who will be determining the child's pronoun. Regardless how you feel about this particular topic, any mature, reasonable person would not be giving other people the authority to make decisions for their family. Anyone who allows the government or anyone to make decisions for their children is being neglectful and downright abusive. If you do want the school to determine what your child is called, what happens when the school decides on a different issue of which you don't agree? This is also not fair to teachers. Teachers have a lot on their plate already for social engineering that they may or may not agree. Once again, social issues falls under parental rights. We should be supporting our teachers with tools for academic excellence. What countries do you think of when you think about a government body making your decisions, making decisions that should be parental decisions? Communist, this is not about transit transgender, this is about control. Control issues come up a lot lately with our school. I'm gonna go back to pronouns. My next comment is about who makes decisions on pronouns. Remember the racial healing handbook being taught to teachers by the vice principal at Lynn Haven Middle? It talks about adultism. It means kids don't have jurisdiction over their own bodies because of parental rules and other authority figures that not having that jurisdiction is a bad thing. This is just a word for grooming. I would be very careful with that. Having the child decide their pronoun is freeing them of adultism, right? Plus most kids aren't transgender. They've just been told over and over, confusing ideas well above their maturity levels. 30 seconds. Thank you. I did hear that, thanks. Also, please provide a larger meeting room so the public can participate in these meetings. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Our next speaker is Tova Gold. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, esteemed board members and community members of Virginia Beach. My name is Tova Gold, and my pronouns are they, them, and Caesar. I'm here to express why it's important to implement the VDOE model policy for the treatment of transgender and non-binary students per section 12C1 of today's agenda. I appreciate those before me saying I'm an abomination and invalid thing. 
about myself, I'm Muslim with a Jewish background, identify as non-binary and am part of the LGBTQ plus community. I just finished my master's degree in Washington, DC and volunteer with several LGBTQ plus organizations in the DMV area. I'm also a prod product of BBCPS, having gone to school from pre-K until graduating from the first class of the Global Studies and World Languages Academy in 2009. I knew I was queer when I was in elementary school, but I ignored it. I had a major crush in 10th grade to a similar gender expressed person. Again, I ignored it. Even with my LGBTQ plus friends around me, I wasn't yet ready to accept my own identity. I didn't fully come out until 2019. I had a fantastic education, but if I had support in school with advocacy pol policies and inclusive language, it would have made me feel much more comfortable in embracing my identities early on and would have saved me from a great deal of stress and depression. One ma major reason to implement this policy is the high rate of suicide among trans youth. According to the Trevor Project National Survey of the LGBTQ plus youth 2021, 52% of trans and non-binary youth considered suicide, with 20% having attempted suicide. As outlined in the bill on page 14, transgender youth with supportive families experience a 52% decrease in recent suicidal thoughts and 46% decrease in suicide attempts. These aren't numbers to ignore. The blueprint to make VBCPS a safer, inclusive, and more positive environment is right here in the model policy bill. Implementation of this policy will lead to an exp exponential decline in bullying, an increase in student happiness and success, and a positive, holistic educational environment where students can focus on their study and relationship building. They can have the skills they need as adults to navigate this world and spend less time trying to undo trauma and tra from trans and homophobia. I especially appreciate that the bill includes dialogue sessions and trainings that address the concerns of parents, students, teachers, and staff. This can break down misconceptions while helping individuals to understand and fully support trans youth. I am not here to debate religion, but would like to sh share two important verses from the Abrahamic teaching. From the Old Testament in Leviticus, it says, you shall not take vengeance or bear gr a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in the Quran, it says, we made you into tribes and families so that you may know one another and so build mutuality, not so that you may take pride in your differences of race or social rank and breed enmities. One more thing to remember is in Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And from the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights explains that no person, child or adult, should suffer abuse discrimination, exploitation, marginalization, or violence of any kind for any reason, including on the basis of the real or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. In conclusion, I support the VDOE model policy for the treatment of transgender and non-binary students. I'm proud of the Hampton Roads area for many reasons, and one of them is being a diverse area with lots of ingenuity and community. It will be even better when we protect our trans and non-binary youth from harm and support their success in school and in life. As a proud Virginia Beachian, I thank you for allowing me to have my input and bid you all a good night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roger Dadmoff. Please unmute. Welcome. Okay, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Welcome, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Roger Dadiamoff, and I've had children and now grandchildren in the Virginia Beach public school system for over 20 years. Two of my daughters have been teachers, one in elementary school and one was a special education teacher. And my wife, uh, a few years ago, retired as a school nurse. So, uh, you know, familiar with uh, the school system to some degree. I'm speaking tonight referencing school board policy section 5-7 and Regulation 5-7.1 and the detrimental effects I believe it will have on our children. And actually more importantly, the loss of parental control over their children's lives. Um, there were a couple of speakers that spoke about hate in the parking lot. I, I wasn't there the whole time, but I was there for the first 20 or 30 minutes when there was a prayer said, uh, asking everybody to behave kindly to all and a prayer for the members of the school board. Um, I think that having a different opinion is not hate speech. Um, Anyway, to move on, uh, I don't believe this is an anti-bullying document. I predict that virtually everybody uh, I've spoken to, the parents who are out there opposed, who oppose the transgender policy would steadfastly support the respect and dignity of every individual in and out of the school and want them to feel safe. 
people speaking against the policy are being accused of tolerating bullying, and that's patently false. Our position is to prevent a non-elected official from making moral decisions that fly in the face of parents' wishes. Uh, emotional testimonies that spoke of suicide rates and depression were one-sided, and they defy opposing statistics that say quite the other. Um, anecdotal stories are not what policy should be based on. Claims that the policy makes education more available, available for transgender students are baseless. The name calling, uh, we've been called bigots, science deniers, whining, crying, and theatrics are typical accusations by those who refuse to consider other opinions. And the labels have come because anybody that opposes this, this uh, agenda are, are not, because they don't agree. So the name calling is actually coming from the other side. Um, I believe there's been a disturbing trend of mainstreaming gender dysphoria in the country, and regardless of anyone's personal or moral view of that perspective, the Virginia Beach School's position to be the mediator or controlling party in a parent's decision whether or not their children can, quote, self-identify as a different gender against their parents' wishes is a very dangerous step in letting the state unduly control how our children are raised. I'm quoting paragraph five. It says, in the situation when parents or legal guardians of minor students under the age of 18 do not agree with the minor student's request to adopt a new name and or pronoun, the student and the parent or legal guardian will work with school administrators to determine how to address the student's needs. Under the guise of, guise of caring for the safety of our children in paragraph five, you're inserting a school administrator between a child and their parent. I never imagined the public school as a matter of public policy, would be making moral decisions for our children that are contrary to what parents want. If the school administration is concerned with our children's safety and learning environment, then why did you propose under use of facilities, access to female bathrooms and locker rooms for biological males? Additionally, your policy for accommodations for overnight trips states, students may choose the rooming, bathing, and changing facilities that align with the student's gender identity. I'm not accusing uh, transgendered students of being, you know, some kind of a, a attack monitors, but I don't want an 11 year old girl in a room with an 11 year old boy who identifies as a girl. You even say for overnight field trips, students um, should not be placed in single occupancy accommodations that are not required for other students. Those policies effectively force minor students to be exposed to sexual situations that are unacceptable. Regardless of your pers personal perspective on the morality of that opinion, parents should be the only ones and who decide what the ch children are or aren't exposed to. Um, and as elected time, officials, I recognize everyone sitting on the board has been picked Thank you. Our next speaker is Jing Zhu. Please unmute. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Welcome. Yes, we can. I'm speaking with great concern to the proposed policy 5-7, which is your vague response to the state's model policies for treatment of transgender students. As a parent of a middle school daughter, I hope you see as I do that this proposal lacks any reasonable foresight and ignores basic common sense. Everyone agrees with the basic intention to prevent discrimination, but despite what the Grimm case says, these proposed policies actually create an unsafe environment in our schools that carelessly endangers all students. The approach as proposed of giving students, whether transgender or otherwise, unfettered access to the restrooms, locker room, et cetera, of their choice at any time lacks any common sense and creates a recklessly unsafe environment for all students. The video is model policy state. School staff should not confront students about their gender identity upon entry into the restroom. While the Virginia Beach regulation echoes, all students are entitled to use restrooms and locker rooms without harassment, discrimination, intimidation, threat, or fear. These policies put my daughter in danger and create an environment of constant fear. The one, e one easily foreseeable result is that any male student could enter any female restroom or locker room at any time. The staff has no right to prohibit or even question any male entering female restroom, the staff has no ability to enforce a safe and private environment. Under these policies, neither my daughter nor I, as her parent, would have any assurance of her safety within a girl's restroom or locker room if any male student, possibly with ill intention, decide to enter that girl's restroom or locker room. This policy clearly 
put students in danger. Respectful co accommodation could be made for transgender students, but these policies overreach that goal, endanger all students and handicap schools in providing a safe environment. If this policy is passed as is, and you cannot provide my daughter with safety or privacy, I would be um, requesting my daughter's school to allow her to use a single user restroom, and then she not be required to dress up for PE. I encourage all other concerned parents to do the same. I recognize you have been giving your marching orders from the state to adopt their short-sighted model policy, but as New Cornell School Board Chair Douglas Brown has stated, when the law violates the Constitution, then it's a bad law. In addition, anyone that uses a little common sense to see the easily foreseeable consequences of this policy will see the danger to our students that it poses. It is possible to treat transgender students with safety and dignity without sacrificing safety and privacy for all. I implore you to drown out the noise, use common sense and decency, and reject this policy in order to fulfill your duty to keep our students safe. If you do go forward with this careless policy, I ask, what are you going to do to prevent these kind of scenarios from happening? How are you going to protect young girls and provide them with privacy when boys figure out that they have free reign in girls' bathrooms and locker rooms, even right in front of teachers and staff? Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Lynn Howard. Please unmute. Welcome. Diana Howard, please unmute. Unmute. I'm unmuted. Okay. Well, My name is Diana Howard, and I'm the chair of the Virginia Beach Tea Party, and we oppose this transgender policy. Children that display gender disparity are rare. It afflicts 0.1% of the population. Most of these children naturally grow out of it. The Virginia Department of Education models for transgender students policy would reverse that by encouraging a lie, allowing them to choose a gender identity, saying their sex was assigned at birth. Sorry, either you are either born a male or you are born a female. To be born both with the genitalia of both is extremely rare. How many of you when growing up did not like your body? Were you too skinny, fat, weak, small, short, flat chested, not masculine or feminine enough, a tomboy? Imagine him being told that you were born in the wrong body. There may be vulnerable children feeling isolated, socially awkward, having a difficult time fitting in and making friends. They are now being celebrated and getting attention to become a transgender. Mental issues such as depression and anxiety are going unnoticed. They are now encouraged to, to pursue a transition to the gender of their choice, a decision they are not mature enough to make. Are you telling the parents confidentiality of information does not specifically say that they are excluding a parent, but they are. By saying they are adhering to all legal standards of confidentiality about a student's gender identity, legal name, or sex assigned at birth, that students will be allowed to use a name and gender pronoun that reflects their gender identity without substantially evidence. Their request may be requested in writing and signed by the student or parent. What is the punishment for students, faculty, and students that fail to use the so-called gender profound requested? Students' records may be amended to reflect the student's choice of gender identity. How often is this allowed to occur? Participation in school activities and events. Whenever students provide gender-specific activities, such as physical education classes, students should be allowed to participate in a manner consistent with their gender identity. Page 16, use of facilities. 
access to facilities such as restrooms and locker rooms that correspond to a student's gender identity shall be available to all students. Page 19, accommodation for overnight trips. All students who participate in extracurricular activities that involve overnight trips should be made aware of the rooming, bathing, and changing facilities. Students may choose the rooming, bathing, and changing facilities that align with their student gender identity. Adults who are, are not students should not share rooming, changing, and bathing facilities with students. Maybe that should say shall not. Do we still require permission slips for field trips? Consent to take Tylenol at school. How is it that you allow students to change their names pronouns and bathroom choices at school without even telling parents. In a recent Supreme Court, ju the Supreme Court Justice Aaliyah argued, in our society, parents, not and the state, have the priority and that is time, Ms. Howard. And duty feel, to raise feel free to follow up via email on Ms. Howard. We thank you. Our next speaker is Suzanne Saltasek. Please unmute. Hello, good evening. My name is Suzanne Saltesiak and I'm a parent in Virginia Beach Schools and I am an ally. I want to share that with you because many of the dynamics that have been discussed in speaking at board meetings, many allies and families have shared with me their concerns about coming to speak. That's why I wanted to make sure to bring up that a group of allies hosted a virtual rally last night with speakers who shared their journeys and a video sharing platform for some who wanted to share their stories and thoughts about this protection policy with you. As you know, a link to that virtual rally in those videos was sent to you earlier today. I fully support protecting all of our transgender students as written in the VDOE model policy. I want to say that again, just to emphasize as written. I understand that this is typically done in Virginia Beach within regulations, but unfortunately that's the same thing I was told about recess previously and y'all know how that went. I am concerned that by doing this only in regulations, having the policy that you're implementing not even require that the regulations are to comply with the law and the model policy, we will have that same issue again. Additionally, the law charges that each school board shall adopt policies that are consistent with but may be more comprehensive than the model policies. In the policy put forth here today, you don't require the, the superintendent comply with that policy, merely that they develop regulations that are related to compliance. This leaves a lot up to individual decision and implementation. If the language were adjusted to require compliance with this law, in my humble opinion, that would honor the law and the students we want to protect. And I want to be clear, this is not to speak against Dr. Spence. Well, I've disagreed with some things with him, that's true of just about anybody, but I also believe that he's a good superintendent and support him. But what if heaven forbid, he's not the superintendent anymore? Do we have a guarantee that his successor will implement this as is needed? School board policies are such that they're intended to be on the purview of any individual for that reason. Please, please, please know that this is not something that can or should be site-based. You saw in Ms. Linetti's discussion earlier, all the biases that came forward at the school board meetings that Gavin Grimm had to listen to when he was 15 years old. Heck, you've seen them here tonight. This cannot be something that is implemented in a site-based manner. Additionally, the regulations I read have added some things that are more limits to the rights of our trans and non-binary students that were not in the model policy. It left off the mandatory training. It the model policy specifically includes discussing the pronouns of Z here and hers, and yet your regulations say that the pronouns accepted by the district are only she, he, and they. It allows princess on a site, principals on a site-based basis, the ability to require a student to sign a request to be called by their preferred name or pronoun. And it also adds more ways for schools administration to make their own determination about whether a situation was discriminatory rather than having it go to a higher place, minimizing the experience of that student asking for help. Finally, I wanted to say to all the members of our trans and non-binary community and their families that are hearing these comments, please know that this is not all of our community. You have many allies here with you tonight, even if they may not be able to speak. And Tova, please know you are not an abomination. We love you, we welcome you, and we stand with you. And if hearing these comments has caused you any hurt and you need to reach out 
please know the Trevor Project has texting, phone, and chat ways to reach out on the website. Um, and you just look at for the Trevor Lifeline. Thank you all very much for letting me speak tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Our next speaker is Ken Lubeck. Please unmute. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak. And um, thank you, school board, for listening to everyone. And I hope you have an open mind. And I just wanted to reiterate what I emailed you about the Newport News superintendent. I think he was completely reasonable. Obviously, he comes from um, more of a church background, a little more conservative, but he cares about people. Um, I, I don't think he's a bigot. Um, I think he has a lot of questions. I think this is there's a lot of open ended questions that I have. Um, I think, you know, Chesapeake School Board's a little more conservative. They're, uh, they decided it wasn't a good idea, um, uh, as well as a bunch of other school boards. And I don't think it's because they're full of hateful bigots. I, I don't think that demonizing the other side's a good idea. Um, I just, as a quick background, I uh, lived in the Bay Area for 14 years. I left here to go there for 14 years and went to church in San Francisco, uh, you know, right in the heart of the city. And um, we had a lot of people that uh, came to our church that struggled with a lot of things. And, you know, uh, we didn't dictate anything. We loved them and uh, different things happened. And um, people made different decisions even as adults than they made when they were in their teens and twenties. I worked, and then fast forward, I worked at uh, the Pines Residential Treatment Center for adolescents. And I was in the behavioral studies program when I worked there, when I was going to um, TCC, ODU, and, and Regent, and um, those kids had their sexuality shattered because they, all of them had been abused as children, and some of the therapists, I thought, were um, leading them towards uh, alternative lifestyles. Uh, that's what the lifestyle they were leading. They were giving them books. They were, and I felt like, wait a minute, they're shattered. How do you know? Like, let's, let's just take a step back here. What, directing them in a specific direction. I mean, that's what you criticize conservatives of doing, right? And I, I, I really think that there's, there's a lot of dangers in taking your worldview and justifying it by saying the other side is just hateful and terrible. That is, that is just, that's not a good idea. We're not trying to split the community into different things. I actually think if we focused on things like, why are kids feeling suicidal? Who's feeling suicidal? Let's look into that and dive into it and make sure we can prevent it in every way we can. That's a little different than approaching it this way or a lot different. We'll find out. Um, there might be a little more work involved, but I really think that that what's in the best interest of the kids um, and just coming out with a policy, I think it's a band-aid. Um, I think, yes, I think these kids are struggling. They're having uh, suicidal thoughts. Um, if they're being bullied, that's obviously not okay. Um, I also think there's a whole societal shift. I can see the difference between my 16 year old's grade. Actually, she told me today that they had the ninth grade orientation at Bayside and she noticed they seemed, they're different. They're, there's uh, race and gender is becoming an obsession and canceling people. And it, it, we really need to get back to appreciating each other, supporting each other, and we're, we're at school to learn things and to learn to read. You, you know, I think reading level that matters if you want to succeed in life. So um, that's that's all I have to say right now. I, I'm not here to uh, attack anybody and I'm not here to hurt anybody. And I want to support people that are having a hard time and protect people. Um, you know, but I have questions about this and you don't have to just pass it through. Thank you. Our next speaker is Connor Epley. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I wanted to take a moment tonight to speak, to express my support for the Virginia Department of Education's model policies for transgender students and the subsequent version that is being proposed tonight. It is vital that our schools have policies in place that let our students know, regardless of who they are, that they are valued, that they are protected, and that our schools and staff will treat them with the respect they deserve. Our transgender students should be able to participate in a learning environment where learning and achieving their full potential is their primary focus. 
worrying about if teachers and staff will refer to them by their preferred name and pronoun, whether or not they will be able to use the bathroom that aligns with their gender identity, and whether or not they will be treated with the most basic forms of respect should not have to be their focus. The conversation that the school board is having tonight is long overdue. And to be quite honest, I'm a little disappointed that it took the school board being required to pass a policy for this issue to be discussed. I will also say that I wish the VPCPS version of these policies went a little further and that the VDOE's model policies as written were the ones being considered tonight. However, the consequences of not putting these protections in place immediately are too great. Far too many LGBTQ plus students and youth struggle with mental health issues and having a space where they feel safe, valued and accepted is crucial. Again, I ask that the school board move ahead with approving these policies. It is a step in the right direction and will ensure that all students are welcome and feel safe in our schools. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Rains. Please unmute. Hello. Thank you. My name is Mary and I am a student at Princess Anne High School and the Governor's School for the Arts. I'll be speaking on agenda item 13C. I'll start by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. I would like to represent a unique perspective in this conversation, and that is the point of view as a young Christian. It has been my perception that one source of the opposition to this policy is founded on Christian beliefs, and that perception has been reinforced by some of the opinions previously stated today. I grew up in the church and the concepts of love, acceptance, and diversity were always viewed as Christ-like. As a member of the LGBT community myself, I've struggled to find my place in the eyes of God. In this journey, I've realized that the Gentiles, the ill, the poor, and all the outcasts of the Bible are so similar to the marginalized groups of the modern day. The most beautiful example of this unconditional love is the parable of the lost sheep. In chapter 18 of the book of Matthew, Jesus says, if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. It is clear that today, this one sheep currently represents our trans and non-binary siblings. According to the Washington DC National Center for Transgender Equality, 40% of American transgender adults reported having made a suicide attempt. 92% of these individuals reported that having reported having attempted suicide before the age of 25. The mission statement of our school district is that in partnership with the entire community, we will empower every student to become a lifelong learner who is a responsible, productive, and engaged citizen within the global community. I also invite you to consider that both scientifically and scripturally, God's creation is so much greater than a simple binary in human souls. In the very first chapter of Genesis, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is considered a merism, a figure of speech in which two contrasting parts of a whole are listed in representation of it. Just as God created day and night and the heavens and the earth, there is so much beauty and validation and in, in everything in between in all three respects. According to an article by Scientific American, ambiguity between sex, chromosomal orientation, and gender is more common than once believed. Some researchers say that nearly one in a hundred children are born and identified as, as intersex, with a multitude of genes discovered by the scientific community making this possible. Today, as a governing body, you as the school board have a unique opportunity to fulfill this mission statement and this parable for some of our most vulnerable students. With or without regard to your religious background, as elected representatives, it is your ethical responsibility to demonstrate a positive example, not only to our neighboring school districts, but to the very students you seek to nurture and protect. Thank you so much for your time. And we have an additional online speaker. It's Vic Nichols. Please unmute. Well, uh, thank you. <clears throat> the statement was is that it is the policy to prohibit any and all discrimination, harassment, and bullying based on an individual's, and I'll summarize these, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability. I do not see by good evidence that either the school board or Dr. Spence or anyone else 
would be able to actually do this in a fair manner. And let me give you some examples. I present as a taxpayer, a voter, college degrees, a white collar professional with a history of being proven trusted with sensitive information of others. And I am not trusted with multiple statements to fulfill criteria to get a mast exemption, yet a minor child by law who can do none of those things cannot enter into contracts, mortgages, credit cards, or anything else. They have done none of those things, but they're trusted to potentially invade the bodily privacy of another. Is that appropriate? We have an article that was written on 816 and what it indicated was that the AAP was silencing debate on gender dysphoria. And that comes from the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, where dozens of health professionals were objecting to things like what you're suggesting in terms of the bathrooms and the like, including a post-surgical trans woman who transitioned in the mid eighties and said she has been called transphobic for trying to promote a little sanity. When it comes to being called by what you want, well, I go by my first name. My family calls me by my middle name, or actually, since I'm the last of a number of kids, whatever profanity they get to because I'm the last in line. At being a swimmer, when it comes to locker rooms, the fact is there really should not be a mix because I have been in situations where it is so bad that housekeeping ordered the swim teams to clean them up before they would go in there. And it was one particular gender that that was true of. When it comes to bathroom discrimination, let me discuss that as when it refers to the handicap. I have been told by the state that although we have to build handicap bathrooms for you, you are not entitled to use them. Because if other people, for whatever reason, even if there are all the other stalls, there can be seven, eight, nine stalls open, and that person wants to use, an able-bodied person wants to use that handicap stall, they have that right to before a handicapped person. So while I'm very dismayed to find the discrimination that goes on constantly constantly against the handicap when the statements that are made is that it is the school board's policy to prohibit discrimination, harassment, and bullying. And it includes disability. So my question is, what are we basing this discrimination on? Why is one group favored over the list of people? And I'm using disability as an example. Multiple issues came up in regards to mask, uh, mask things and having to fill out forms and things like that. And that was very much discriminating. It's very much bullying. And it was very much harassment. But yet, we're going to... And that is time to please follow up via email if you choose, ma'am. And Chairwoman Ryan, that was our last agenda speaker for this evening. And I, um, I consulted with the vice chair, and we're going to call a 10-minute break and reconvene in 10 minutes at 9 o'clock. Okay. Carol and Rye, on behalf of the school board, uh, reconvening our formal meeting at 9.01 p.m. We are now at the uh, the consent portion of the agenda and we have religious exemptions listed. Motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Hughes. Please show raised hand for approval. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. 
Thank you. And Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. Thank you. Now the action portion of the agenda, and we get we begin with uh, tonight's pers the personnel report and administrative appointments. Uh, motion to approve. Mrs. Franklin, second. Mrs. Melnick, discussion. All right, hearing none, please show your approval with raised hand. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a unanimous vote. Thank you. Now we have unsolicited... Uh, Madam Chair, I do have a couple of administrators to announce. Oh, I'm sorry. That's yes. okay. <laughs> Please. I'd like to uh, start by recognizing Ashley Godfrey. Ashley has served with distinction here in Virginia Beach as a teacher assistant, a teacher, a coach. She's been at uh, Independence Middle School, Salem High School, Lansdowne Middle School. She served as an assistant principal at Point of View Elementary School and Bayside Elementary School. Most recently has been serving as assistant principal at Three Oaks Elementary School. And we're pleased this evening that you've accepted our recommendation from Ms. Godfrey to serve as the next principal of Lansdowne Elementary School. Congratulations to her. I'd also like to recognize Amanda Landtrip. Amanda has served with distinction as a distance learning assistant here in Virginia Beach as a teacher in Norfolk Public Schools, also at Kings Grant Elementary School, Kimsville, and Linkhorn Park Elementary School, currently serving as an administrative assistant at Lynn Haven and Rosemont Elementary Schools. This evening, we're pleased you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next assistant principal at Three Oaks Elementary School, so congratulations to her. And finally, I want to recognize Tasha Warren. Tasha has served with distinction as a teacher in North Carolina, in Virginia, in Colorado. She's served in the Department of Education in Hawaii. She's been a teacher at Fairfax County and has served with distinction here as a teacher at Princess Anne Middle School. Most recently has been serving as an administrative assistant at Bayside Middle School. And this evening we're pleased that you have accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next assistant principal at Brandon Middle School. So congratulations to her. And that is it, Madam Chair. Thank you, and as always, we wish these new administrators much success. All right, so now that brings us to the unsolicited PPEA, which uh, helped me, Mr. Arnold, with my brain at the moment. Public, private, finish the acronym for me. <laughs> Thank you. So to introduce any discussion, we'll first ask for a motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs. Second, Mrs. Franklin. Uh, we did have discussion last week, and the floor is open again for further discussion or questions tonight. Mrs. Franklin. I just wanted to clarify, because I thought that I heard a constituent um, make uh, what I think is an incorrect comment uh, last school board meeting and that was that if we take this unsolicited PPEA that we are we're, are, we are choosing to move forward with that it actually opens other offers up is that correct yes ma'am you're correct um, there's no risk associated with this PPEA proposal you're simply uh, allowing the superintendent to receive it uh, and then if you uh, refer to your school board policy, you'll see that it, it does that, that it'll open up to competition for the rest of the marketplace. So we're, we're not saying that we're going to take their proposal. We're just allowing it to open up the floor for that. Okay, Correct. thank you. No risk and no commitment, to be pretty, very clear. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, yes, Mrs. Manning. And maybe if I could suggest for the future, if we have one of these, that we reword how it's brought forward to us that we're approving it to be accepted for consideration or something like that, um, just to help the, the public understand. Because I mean, I didn't understand that at first when it was first presented to us. So if, if maybe in the future we could just present it in a different way. We'll, we'll uh, evaluate the, the language and the policy. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank Yeah, you. I think just one of the challenges to be aware of, and, but we will, we will definitely look at it, is that it's the way the law is written. It's, it, it was equally confusing to me the first time I tried to wrap my head around it, but it is the way the law is written. 
it uses that specific language. But if we can if we can make it a little clearer, we will. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? All right then. All in favor, show a raised hand. Ms. Uh, Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? Yes. Okay. All, Thank you. All opposed, please show a raised hand. All abstaining, please show a raised hand. Thank you. And reason for abstaining? Um, out of abundance of caution, even though this does not... Um, constitute any type of contract or anything. I occasionally do work with um, valid construction. Thank you, Madam Chair. The motion passed with 10 ayes, uh, no nays, and one abstention with Ms. Melnick. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings us to uh, action item C, one of two that were added this evening. Uh, the motion regarding health protocols for schools for school board meetings. And maybe for the benefit of our, uh, not just the public, but our two remote members, and, and I didn't, uh, I'll, I'll re read it here, uh, and then ask for motions, and then up for discussion. I move that the school board meetings and committee meetings follow the mask, physical distancing, and other reasonable health mitigation protocols that the school administration is using in the buildings where the meetings are taking place. So uh, that's the motion. Is there a second? Mrs. Riggs. Okay. And, and I'll just uh, offer a further explanation before it's open for discussion. Um, it, it is consistent with, with most of last year, frankly. Um, and again, now it, it's consistent with the CDC guidelines uh, for distancing and masking. And we are in a high transmission period. We continue to be. And, and the contact tracing is the additional reasoning. So with that, Mrs. Manning and then Mrs. Anderson. Um, you say physical distancing here, and I believe in the reopening plan, we talked about three feet of physical distancing, but here in the room, we have about 10 feet um, between seats. So can you clarify the physical distancing requirement that you're recommending? Uh, certainly, it, it's six feet, and if I could ask... It's actually three feet in our schools. We're, we have, Mr. Freeman, we have a unique situation here with contact tracing that maybe you could elaborate on and why that was used previously as well. Um, well, for so six feet for contact tracing is the standard, but in schools where both students are wearing masks, there's an, an exception that is applied to be able to get down to three feet. Background priority is to get kids back into face-to-face -face instruction. There's an acknowledgement that capacity in schools is an issue. So they looked at all of the balance of risk and put that exception in place. That exception does not exist for adults. Um, so six feet of distancing, less than six feet of distancing for greater than 15 minutes in a 24-hour period would require contact tracing. So can you elaborate more on what the unique challenge of that is? A classroom is children have assigned seating and the teacher knows who they are and what you've shared that we could all hear? Um, yes. So, I, And I well, think you just covered it. So in a classroom environment, um, we our goal is to, and as part of the plan that was presented, is to have uh, chairs separated by six feet. We know what chairs that our students sit in. Uh, that So number one, if they're wearing masks and they're outside of that three feet, it doesn't require, uh, it won't result in a close contact if they're both properly wearing their masks. If they're inside that, then it would apply. So for adults, that standard is six feet. Uh, but the teacher knows who's in the classroom. And you, if you could explain again when the public's here what the extra challenge is what if, when it comes to contact tracing. Yeah, and I think what you're suggesting is in classrooms we have assigned seats, teachers know where they sit. In an environment like this, you don't know who's going to sit. It becomes extremely problematic for our health services team to be able to conduct a contact tracing investigation when we know that our board members have assigned seats and some staff have assigned seats in here, but everybody else is kind of moving around the seat that's available. Uh, Mrs. Anderson? 
Um, I just wanted to know um, when will this expire? Is should we put a timeline on it, or should we put some type of stipulation that these mitigation strategies would be in effect until? You can certainly do that. I think, as written, you're going to follow the mitigation strategies that are in place at, that the administration's using at that time period. And that was the intent. So if you're holding the, the meeting here in this building, if they've loosened the restrictions in this building and they said we can be three feet away, or if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask, then that would be what you would be applying here. You could certainly put your own restriction okay. on it if you want to. I just thought leaving it this way allows you to, to do follow whatever the administration determines is appropriate at the time. And I said we were a couple weeks ago. We didn't have to have masks on if we were vaccinated. That was the rule in here. That's no longer the rule in here. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Frank, Mrs. Hughes, and then Mrs. Franklin. So two things. I don't think contract uh, contact tracing would be that difficult as far as board members and staff, you know who they are. And when other people from the public are in here, mostly they're speakers. Their names are on a list. Everything's on camera. You can see when they get up. So I think that we would be able to put that together pretty easily. Um, the other thing I would like addressed is where do mask exceptions fit in here? Because that is, you know, part of every mandate that has been issued. So that would probably be the mask exemption issue would be something that the board would want to take up and have a discussion about our, our perspective and what we had um, asked for is if somebody's requesting an exemption, they just simply submit that to the chair, uh, excuse me, to the clerk. Uh, that obviously would then remain confidential and then we would be able to uh, create an accommodation for that person. There are people who requested them days ago and nobody ever responded to them. We'd need to know who they were so we could address that. They copied most of the board on them, so okay. they're, they're I pretty haven't easy been copied, so I'll, if somebody could send me that, we can we can look at that. Um, Mrs. Linetti, the uh, so that was addressed in the posted agenda, but is there a way to address? Do you rep how would we address that? And as this is written now, are you talking we, about masks for the public? For the public, I believe that's what Mrs. Uh, Hughes is requesting. I mean, we well, what, what we put in place, what was put in place for this meeting, and it was posted on the agenda, is that her recommendation is to somehow reference that here. If I if I understand you correctly, well, I mean, it applies to board members, staff, and members of the public. We are saying following the mask protocols that the I'm school administration is using in the buildings. Um, so well, I would say there's a slight difference between those people that need to be in here. Uh, employees working here are subject to the rules that the, are being put in place for the employees that they want exemption, uh, it's not exemption, it's an accommodation. They need to go through the human resources department. If you come to this building and say, I need to get my fingerprinting done, I need to go to HR, you would have to talk with them about what accommodation you need and they would work with you as to whether you need an accommodation for that. Um, so I don't think there aren't too many situations where anyone's going to come into this building other than talking to the school administration about what they need for an accommodation. You all are school board members. This is where you primarily do your business, which is why we set the second motion out. For but I, I think we are talking still about the public who wants to request an accommodation. Does the wording here that says follow the mask protocols that the school administration is using, is that sufficient? In other words, do they need to, they, they're re, we, should if we? If you want to approve specific regulation, we have a procedure in place. We have a forms and a process in place. It was spelled out in the agenda. It was spelled out on the speaker's information. It was provided to everyone who called, and it was explained to them. Right. And the form was developed for them. So I think Mrs. Hughes is just asking, should that be referenced here, or is this sufficient? does this sufficiently, sufficiently address that, specifically about the masking with the public? I these believe meetings. that the procedure that they're using meets that requirement. If the school board wants to look at that to develop how people come into your meetings, you can certainly look at that. But I think the procedures developed are appropriate. It's been reviewed by legal counsel. It has been reviewed by the school administration. The forms are there. 
and the procedures are in place. I don't know how much more you want to reference so, that. It doesn't so have let's to assume is the form the somewhere that someone could just go ahead and download it, or do they have to wait for you to send it to them? Yeah, it's it, the link was on the agenda site. The agenda, the posted agenda, had the link to the form. Is that correct, or did they call? Was that correct, or did they call the clerk for the form? It, it, the link was in the agenda. See if you open the agenda, because um, I don't have it open right now. So um, if they take care of that and send it in, if you don't respond to them in the absence of a response, can they assume it's been accepted? No. Because nobody's to, responding to them. We're not, to my knowledge, no one has sent in that form for us to look at. Okay. And so we would have looked at that form. We encourage people to do that. But with any ADA accommodation or with a religious accommodation, it's not you don't write it and we have to do it. We have to look at it, discuss it, make sure the accommodation's appropriate and deal with that. So there's an interactive dialogue that has to happen. So you need to send us a form so we know what you need. I know some of the individuals have called us and asked us about accommodations. And I know I saw the paperwork. They were working back and forth with those individuals. The requirement for the mask accommodation, if you did not want to wear a mask, we needed evidence of what the medical condition was so that we could have that dialogue. I did not see any paperwork come in that certified that. So one more time, it's the present wording, I move that the school board and committee meetings and committee meetings follow, and I'm leaving out the other two right now, follow the mask protocols that the school administration is using in the buildings where the meetings are taking place. So right now the protocol is to submit the, to, to, to submit the authorization form for review. Is that correct? Yes. So is this wording, does this wording sufficiently acknowledge that? I think that's the bottom line question, right? Or I don't want to speak for you, Mrs. Hughes, but. Well, I mean, as long as we're going to be honoring them and actually mm -hmm. responding to people, mm -hmm. and they do not have to state what their condition is. If their doctor states that they have an underlying condition that prohibits it, that's enough for you. They don't have to state what it is. And that's fine. We would have taken that. We just needed you to, your doctor to sign the form. So that's, you know, we weren't, there was not a procedure in to question whether the doctor was accurate or what you were saying. We just needed that form from your doctor or health care provider. So, may I ask? Uh, is Mrs. Franklin. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I just have a couple questions about, and I apologize because at the last meeting it was a little bit hard to hear sometimes, <laughs> um, virtually. Um, and so when we were discussing um, putting the mask in place and the physical distancing and the other recommendations. Um, so what is what was the verbiage? Was it just K through 12 or is that why we're doing this motion now? Because we just said K through 12. Um, so that's my first question. Is that, so I'm just trying to understand that are we doing this motion because at the time we only said K through 12? K through 12 in school buildings. And school building. Okay. And then I guess my other question would be for administration here. Um, currently in this building with the employees that are here all the time, are they expected to mask and social distance and follow the mitigation uh, protocols? Yes. In yes. this building. And I can answer that as somebody who works in this building. As of August 16th, we were required to wear masks, maintain appropriate social distancing, Prior to August 15th, if we were vaccinated, we didn't necessarily have to do that, but we are now vaccinated or not, we are following that. I know we are being informed of contacts. I've been seeing the normal referrals and we're taking the appropriate precautions if, it, if you are sub subject to a possible exposure. Okay, so, so this building is currently being expected to follow this, the standards. Okay, thank you. So I'm um, Mrs. Ask. Anderson. And so can we assume that anyone who is in here has and is not wearing a mask, is is following the protocols that they have already. I mean, this is only four. I mean, this is only four days in the works, but that is the intention. That's yes. the intention mm -hmm. for the public. Yes. Otherwise, they. The pub. Well, the public has the other options of of zooming in. Do they of, show of, that as they come in, or do they just walk in without a mask, and then we just assume that? they've already sent their form in. There, How no. do they the protocol form? is if you had a verified form that exempted you, it was on the list for the individuals at the front desk or a number of people working on this. So if we had verified what you did, 
much the same way if you have an ADA accommodation. We had an individual that wanted a, a chair, not the regular chair. We had already worked out the accommodations for that. And so that individual was on the list. We knew what that person was going to be. You'll see there's a chair brought in specifically for that person because that person had talked to us about it. We had worked through that. There is a list that the individuals at the front door, because we're not allowing individuals into this building right now unless they have some type of accommodation that allows them not to have a mask on, they had to have that. So if you had that list, we would have brought you in here to do Thank that. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Uh, maybe we owe it to colleagues and others to just elaborate a little further on the six feet versus the three feet and Mr. Freeman, just how feasible it would be or not when we're talking about checking footage, just so we can respond to that. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, the checking footage, but um, so the it's challenging to conduct contact tracing and it's it takes time um, i do not conduct them personally but i'm familiar with uh, talking to Ms. walla whose team has to do this it's not an easy process even when things are very well structured and lined out um, um, my understanding is it would be challenging to be able to track down every individual even if we have their contact information that they were a speaker to know who was sitting next to who uh, during the course of a multi-hour school board meeting. And to reiterate, reiterate, we we did have six feet spacing in here most of last year once we came back in person Yeah, as, for as the you, same reasons. As you recall, when we started the process, we were at six feet of distancing, and it was a very similar setup that you saw in here, except it wasn't, uh, you didn't have the blue tape that indicated where not to sit. We had stickies that indicated where to sit. So I understand the visual might be a little bit different when you see all the spaces where you're not supposed to sit in order to be able to maintain six feet of distancing. Okay. Mrs. Manning. So I would just like to point out that right now, basically, only a handful of the public can come to our meetings. City Council is fully open. They don't have any mask requirements. They don't have any social distancing. And We've been doing this for a long time, and the public needs to be present. If, if this is something that the board's going to adopt, I would like to ask the board to consider an alternative meeting place for us. Um, City Council met at the convention center for a while. Um, the public needs access to our meetings, and um, we are not governed by the same rules as the school administration building as being a governing body. Of, at, at a public meeting. So we can decide our own rules. Um, and if, if staff isn't, isn't comfortable being in here w with everyone, I mean, let's have staff be, um, you know, virtual to protect them. And, and, you know, if it's a fear thing, then they can be somewhere else. But um, we need to be open to the public, and we are not. And so I would like to ask, I do not support this. Um, you know, other school boards are, are not doing this. Look at other school board meetings. Um, we are not welcoming to the public at all. Um, and, and that needs to change. So I really, I do not support this, but I'm sure it's gonna get passed. I would just really like for you to consider an alternative meeting location so the public can access our meetings. So two thoughts come to mind. I mean, they do, the public does have access through television and, and Zoom. So to just make an outright comment, but I'm sure we can ask staff to come back to us with, with to, to at least have a discussion about other possibilities um, for the future. But for now, you know, we need something in place now. But, yeah. you know, we're limited to, to TV capability. And, and so that does limit well, our city options. city council was able, able to do it. I'm sure we can figure something out. Well, they have their room with their VBTV. At the convention I mean, center? Can somebody else speak to that? That I don't think every room there is equipped with that, and we meet the same time they do. I understood the last time that that was reviewed. Uh, Doc, can any of the staff? But that's also something we can certainly um, at least get more information on. Yeah, okay. we'd, we'd need to look into that. Mm -hmm. I thought that the um, that the city council meetings at, at the convention center were um, incredibly expensive and cost prohibitive for us. Yes. And so it was tens of thousands of dollars. Yes. 
And the room, quite frankly, was very small. I had to present something there, and it, it is tiny. It is smaller than this room, so there was no, I mean, we were sitting in chairs, um, very, single chairs spaced um, way out. It's very small, but it was tens of thousands of dollars for that. But maybe we could ask the staff, and we can figure out whether it would be via email or in mid manners next time to at least gather. And again, some of this may be repetitive, but it, memories are short. And a year ago seems like 10 years ago. And I know this was all, it may have been checked into previously, but if we could have more updated information, again, that would be appreciated. Mrs. Riggs? I was just going to say oh, the same oh, thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know we were on the queue here. Miss. Mrs. Anderson, Mrs. Riggs, and then Mrs. Hughes again. Okay. I, I, I was going to say, you know, we are more open than we have ever been. The fact that we are still using Zoom. Um, we also have the VBTV. Um, we are more open, and, you know, if people want to watch what we're doing, they can sit at home and watch it on TV, or they can, you know, request a Zoom link. We are more open than we've ever been. And, and as far as, you know, we've had people even complaining about not being able to get to the agenda. You know, if you go back a couple of years ago when we used to post our agenda in the newspaper, you couldn't click on that so and, and get anything. So we are so much more open now than we have ever been. I just can't, can't say that enough. So, yes, I know it would be nice to have people come here and sit in the audience and be present. But, you know, we are allowing people to come in and speak personally to us, as well as speak through Zoom. So, I just want to well, say we, that. So. Okay, Mrs. Hughes and then Mrs. Riggs. Well, I think the idea that we're allowing people to come in is the wrong way to look at it. This is, this is the people's building. This is a public building. These are public meetings conducting public business. Um, as far as what applies to K-12, what we were mentioning before is that <clears throat> we voted and it failed the resolution to make mask optional on a Tuesday. The health commissioner put out an order, it was either on Wednesday or it was a day or two after, okay, two days after. And so, and it said that, that order said it applied to K-12 buildings. Um, it was extrapolated that it would apply to this building, but that's not what the order said, and that's what I was talking about, is there's not an order that says so. This was a decision of this board, but that decision, that order came two days after we voted. So when people came to vote that night prior to the order, the people who had masks on already knew they were going to vote no to it being optional. And, and the reason that happened, and it was added to this building, is because if you voted to make mask mandatory for children and you didn't in here, you were going to face a firestorm and you know it. People would have been all over the place calling you hypocrites. That's the reason we're wearing masks in this building. And the second, well, that's one reason. The other reason is it minimizes the public being in here and it's just wrong. The public should be allowed to be in here. We're not allowing them. They, they own this and so they should be here. Mrs. Riggs. First of all, I want to, um, I remember when we talked about it last year, we talked about getting into a bigger space where more people could come. We talked about it being cost prohibited. We also talked about um, the Zoom quality and being able to um, uh, video it. I know that the um, city council can, but it had something to do with our uh, ability to Zoom. And I, I know that we did our um, retreat at um, the new uh, remodeled uh, annex because it worked for space and it worked for the, the zooming quality and it also was not cost prohibitive. So that was one of the things. I don't think we need to be adding more to our budget when we're, we're trying to talk about, you know, what we have to uh, squeeze together now to get the funds we need to educate our kids. The second thing is I never thought of keeping people out of here, that it had nothing to do with me voting for a mask. I voted to have masks on to protect our kids and to make sure we did not have to go virtual again and we kept them in the classroom when school started. 
we are, I mean, we, there's, there's figures out there that are showing that we are in the high, high prior, high, um, um, area of COVID. And I don't want us to be virtual again. That's the one thing that everybody is agreeable with. Everybody, the parents on both sides, um, all of us, we want our kids to be in a face-to-face -face situation. So that is why I voted for that. And we have many school board um, administrators that are in and out of this building and will be in this building at 3.30 and 4 o'clock when we start the meetings. And we have people come in and out, and they have to go into our schools. That is why I voted. It had nothing to do with keeping people out. I want to hear from everyone. I think us be, uh, holding this availability of the Zooming um, is, has been very helpful for our public to be able to say and do. I mean, they've signed up for it. I would love to see them here. But if they can, if we only have the space because we have to distance, then they have the Zoom ability. I think we've been very fair with it. But it had nothing to do with keeping the public out when I voted. So I just wanted to make that very clear. Okay, Same Mrs. with me. Mrs. Franklin and then Mrs. Holtz. Um, I did have a quick cool question. Uh, Ms. Riggs, you had mentioned the building that where we had the retreat, the annex. Um, is that even a possibility to, if we need something larger, I guess is my one question. And then Mr. Freeman, I did um, wanna ask you really quickly um, about the mitigation strategies. Um, it, it, did we ever determine if there is going to be um, a goal post that or a goal that we're trying to hit in order to relax the, you know, or, you know, take a layer off of the mitigation? Is there a, a, a milestone, a, something that we're trying to achieve? Yeah, I, I remember that question from last week as well. And the short answer is that it's such a complex interrelationship for all those factors. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate to say, hey, if we get to this number, we're going to do this because it depends upon what's the vaccination rate. What is the level of community transmission? What are we seeing in our schools? Are we actually seeing it being spread in our schools? And what's going on there? So for us, and we went through this last year, where um, with all the good advice that we had, we tried to uh, set up certain metrics we would follow and make decisions based on those. And when we learned more over time, we learned, okay, well, that there's a better way to do it. And we had to make an adjustment. So for this one, noting, the goal is to tell you here are the things that we'll monitor and we'll update you when uh, as things progress. But there is no defined criteria of is, if this, then this, and then the end result will be to take away this mitigation. I know. I just I thought last year with um, all that we had learned, and then also um, just the fact that we did at least have you know we were looking for that ten percent or you know whatever. We were, metric we were using last year. It, it was just helpful for the community to have something to be keeping their eye on, you know, in terms of, okay, well, now we're here and we can all cheer and say, yay, we're, you know, we're here and now we'll be able to achieve that. So I guess I was just looking to see if we've thought about what that metric might look like for this year. Um, so we and have, I, and, I'm, I'm, and we completely understand the mindset of if you can have that goal, but right now, again, the complex in a relationship, it would be inappropriate to set that goal because something could turn that and make that problematic uh, later on down the line. I don't but know our commitment to you is to transparently share with you what we're learning over time so that it's not a, a, a question uh, because there's a sense of, well, there, that's not a transparent answer to how we're going to go about this. Well, the transparency is we're going to continue to work with our professionals at the Virginia Beach Department of Health, and we will update you as we learn more information and, and it becomes appropriate to make a recommendation about removing some of the mitigations we have in place. And if I could add, Mrs. Franklin, there is, at least in my mind, a distinction between the being virtual versus in person is an obvious impact on families. So I think they, de you know, they deserved and we provided a very clear rubric for that. Here we're talking, I mean, they all are in person and it's, it's a different level of discussion, still important, but on the mitigations and the masks and 
for what that's worth. And I think she asked about the availability of the, the annex. We still have employees that are in and out of the annex that are in and out of the schools as well. So, so it would be the same situation. If I may suggest, because we have asked administration to come back to us, I think we can expect that the annex would be one of the things they'll report back on so that we can keep moving forward. Okay, thank you. And Mrs. Holtz? Thank you. I'd like to add to what Ms. Riggs was saying. Um, at our meeting when I voted, my main highlight was open the schools five days a week. That was it. We've been begging for that for a year and a half, and we need to make it happen. Everything else that was put into place was to help us to do that and to help us to continue. So like some other schools that I'm reading about, we won't have to close a month after they open. Masks was one of those strategies. Uh, uh, access to the public buildings like parents and even the public coming in here was one of those strategies. It's moving along. Um, to, say, and it was, to say that this building was not included in, in our discussion to me, we didn't have to mention it. It's, it's understood. We all understood that. This building is the heart of Virginia Beach City Public Schools. We're here. We make laws here. I mean, regulations here. Our administration is here. Everything branches out from this building to say that oh, there's an argument, oh, this building isn't included because we didn't mention it. It is just ludicrous to me. I mean, who would think that? First of all, this is temporary. Temporary. I would love all the public to be sitting here, but it's, it'll be over. But we have to do what we have to do to keep schools open five days a week. And everybody should be complying. I don't think we, I don't think we need any kind of special resolution or a vote to do that. To me, it, was understood in the vote that we took last week. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. But here we are with this moment, and we have Mrs. Weems online, and then, and then hopefully we can proceed with this vote. Mrs. Weems. Um, Ms. Ryan, I didn't have my hand up to speak. Oh, okay. All right. All right, then. Um, looks like we're ready. Motion. Uh, so all in favor, please show a raised hand. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. We have eight eyes. All, all, all opposed. I'm sorry, a raised hand. Miss Owens, how do you vote? No, Miss Weems. Oh. Weems, how do you vote? No. So Thank all, you. All in favor, all opposed, please raise your hand. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have three nays, so the motion did pass with eight eyes and three nays. Okay, and we do look forward to the staff report on possible alternatives. So thank you all. So the final action item is the motion on school board mask accommodations, which I will read now. I move that the school board members who seek a medical or other accommodation to the mask and or other health mitigation protocols in place for school board meetings or committee meetings will utilize the accommodation request forms developed for the school board member and will cooperate in efforts to develop reasonable accommodations. And again, this is requesting an extension of the procedures that, that, that was in place last year. So uh, to open it up, a motion to approve. Uh, Mrs. Melnick and a second, Mrs. Holtz. All right, discussion. Ms. Mrs. Manning. So I have a couple of questions. Um, so I would like to know under what authority you have um, that one elected official has over another because the, um, the, the laws actually state otherwise. So can you, can you state another law um, that, um, that one elected official can tell another elected official 
um, what to do. Well, we're talking about the school board as a collectively establishing Right, but a school board collectively cannot tell another elected official what to do. Mrs. Linetti? And Ms. I, I have an email but, from Ms. Linetti back in May stating that I, as an elected official, did not have to submit paperwork to an employee or that I had to submit paperwork, period, for a medical exemption. And we can ask if there were different circumstances then with Mrs. Linetti. Without going into Mrs. Manning's personal stuff, the Executive Order 79 had an amendment in December that stated that at that point we were not allowed to ask for any reason why an individual required an accommodation for not wearing a mask. So after that time period, we stopped asking if anybody, we didn't ask you to turn in a paperwork, we didn't ask for um, a mask exemption explanation at that point. So when it was asked to me at that time period, we were no longer asking for that information. So that's why that information was given at the time. I believe that the school board can set its own rules. It can adopt procedures for that. And then it would be a matter of whether that board member was cooperating with the procedure set that the board had adopted. So, Ms. Lynetta, you've told me over and over again over the last several years that the board has no authority over other elected officials. How is this different? I don't think that's the right characterization of what I've said. What I think is the board has developed a rule. If you, you came here on Wednesday nights when the meeting was set on Tuesdays, you couldn't say, well, as a school board member, I'm coming on Wednesday for the meeting because you've adopted a rule that has said that your meetings are on Tuesday nights. So I think the school board is simply... I got a motion for it asking that you provide the information uh, on there. And I think they're attempting to accommodate school board members in the best manner they can to provide the, the um, privacy. When we developed last August, we dealt with the procedures for this to assure the confidentiality for school board members. We directed that director of health services would review these forms to assure that the appropriate accommodations were in place and consistent with the protocols. So I think those procedures were developed to help the board there. If you're suggesting you do not have to, to follow the rules that your board has set, then we'd have to, you just have to take an appropriate action that you Yeah, said. I mean, we are elected officials and we have no authority to tell one another what to do, either as a collective body um, or not. I mean, the, the whole meeting thing that's different, we're setting meeting dates. We're not um, telling someone what to do with their own person. Um, so I, I think this is a violation of the law um, if you adopt this, and I will challenge it. I think, I think it's important that, at least that I say this for myself, that being an elected official does not exempt me from following rules or for doing right by other people or for setting an example um, for our students, we have, we have 65,000 students and we're a large school division where people watch us on Tuesday nights. They talk about this. I hear from teachers, I hear from children and, and quite frankly, it, it put, it would put me in a really bad place to be sitting on this dais during a discipline hearing where we're going to discipline the student for breaking rules when we can't do that ourselves. And it's the argument I would make as a parent coming forward um, that, uh, you know, so-and-so doesn't do it. Um, so-and-so stood up and said this, so-and-so doesn't have to follow rules because they're an elected official and I think my child needs another chance because they didn't follow the rules or don't want to follow the rules or whatever. We're, we're all leaders and people look to us and I think it's important that we show that. And if it's wearing a mask for six hours, for 10 hours, I think that's what we do. And um, I, don't, I don't like this. I don't like being in a mask. I, I don't like COVID. I'm tired of COVID, but there's a difference between some of the behavior that's, that's exhibited and, and grace. And, and I keep saying this every week and I, I, I just keep just begging for people to just have grace. Um, we had speakers talk tonight about 
the behavior outside. Um, it, this, what is going on? Like the, the level of anger, the level of, of um, well, that's fine. I'll go back to topic. I'm just asking for grace. And it's important to, um, it's important to have that. And it's important to be a leader because the students are watching us. Sorry for rambling. Any other questions or comment before we vote? Mrs. Manning. Yeah, so I personally believe that masking our children for eight to 10 hours a day is harmful. Um, there are children that have medical exemptions and true medical reasons why they can't wear a mask. And they shouldn't be shamed, as this board has done to other board members. Um, so so I, I agree that we need to set examples. And if, if there's someone that needs a medical accommodation, they should never be shamed. They should never be humiliated, as has, has been done in this board before. Um, and um, why, I, I just, I, another question that I have here, it says that um, utilize accommodation request forms developed for school board members and will cooperate. Who gets those forms? Who, who sees those forms? When we developed the forms last year, the Governor's Committee had us develop forms. It's similar to the form that the Human Resources Department did at the bottom. It says, it, at that time it was Mary Shaw, we've updated it to be Heidi Sawala, so it would go for a medical accommodation. If you're seeking another accommodation, such as a religious accommodation, it wouldn't necessarily go to, um, to Heidi Sawala. It might come to the administration where you'd have to figure it out, or the school board. But so far, we developed a medical form. We can adjust one for another type of accommodation needed. So Would I don't you? think that it's appropriate for um, school employees to see the medical history of a board member. I can only say that uh, the chair, the, the school board attorney, nobody else in this room ever saw any other form. It was strictly the health service coordinator. Yeah, and we are not employees of the division, so I don't think it's appropriate that employees of the division see our uh, personal medical history. I'm not sure there's a request for personal medical history. There is a request for a doctor to explain what accommodations are needed. And again, the compromise, this was the issue we had last year because the concern was who should look at this. The decision was made that since we have a director of health who is generally a nurse, that that person would be qualified to have a discussion with the medical provider who signed it if that was necessary or to determine what was appropriate because they're used to the confidentiality rules. After that, I, you know, that was a compromise. The Governance Committee recommended that the school board accepted how to protect the confidentiality. But again, with any ADA request, you have to provide some information so we can have a dialogue as to what the appropriate accommodation is for your needs. Okay. Final call before a vote. All, right. All in favor, please show a raised hand. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Yeah. Thank you. And for the record, uh, Ms. Weems is not online. Okay. All opposed, please show a raised hand. There were seven ayes, there were three nays, and one non-vote with Ms. Weems, so the motion did pass. All right, information. We are beginning with program evaluation schedule, and we do have a handout for those who want to dig for theirs. And welcome, Dr. Janecki. Thank you. Just give me one moment to get to your presentation. Sure. Good evening, Chair Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the school board, and Dr. Spence. I'm Dr. Heidi Janecki, Director of Research and Evaluation. This evening, I will share the proposed schedule of program evaluations that will be conducted during 2021-2022 based on school board policy 6-26. Before presenting the evaluation schedule for the upcoming year, I'll provide an overview of the evaluation reports that will be provided in upcoming months based on last year's schedule. 
The reports that will be provided to the school board this year based on the 2020-2021 program evaluation schedule are shown on the slide. The two evaluation update reports for the school counseling program and Schoology were distributed to the school board in June. The remaining reports will be provided to the school board throughout the fall and winter, beginning with the implementation evaluation of the environmental studies program at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Brock Environmental Center. The final comprehensive evaluation of the Entrepreneurship and Business Academy and the year one evaluation of PBIS will be provided in November. The final evaluation of the ESL program will be provided in December and the SRT evaluation will be provided in January. As stipulated by school board policy, the proposed 2021-2022 program evaluation schedule, which will be shown on the next slide, was developed based on evaluation requirements for programs. Based on the policy, new programs or initiatives that operate with local resources are evaluated for a minimum of two years and then during the year of full implementation if a program takes more than two years to implement. In addition, programs that have been previously evaluated may remain on the schedule as a result of an evaluation plan for the program that was previously approved by the school board. In addition, the program evaluation committee reviews existing programs for possible addition to the evaluation schedule as space allows. The committee includes representatives from various departments and schools, the Virginia Beach Education Association, and the community. Each year, the proposed program evaluation schedule is presented to the superintendent senior staff and the planning and performance monitoring committee to obtain feedback regarding the recommendations. The proposed evaluation schedule for the upcoming 2021-2022 school year will require school board approval. The proposed program evaluation schedule for 2021-2022 is shown on the slide. The first two programs listed are previously planned evaluations. The year two environmental studies program evaluation will assess the program's operation and outcomes during the year of full implementation in grades 11 and 12. The year two evaluation of PBIS will continue to focus on tier one implementation and outcomes across all schools. Three additions to the evaluation schedule include Achieve 3000, the Gifted Resource Cluster Program, and Alternative Education at Renaissance Academy. Achieve 3000 is a supplemental online literacy program for students in grades three through 12. Each of these three programs were selected for inclusion on the schedule based on program evaluation committee members' perceptions that they had the potential to have a large and positive impact on VBCPS reaching its goals, the cost of the programs, and because information about the program's effectiveness within the division was not readily available. It was determined that Achieve 3000 and the Gifted Resource Cluster Program would both be scheduled for comprehensive evaluations this year, examining implementation and outcomes. The Alternative Education Program will be scheduled for an evaluation readiness report. The evaluation readiness process allows the evaluators, in collaboration with the program managers and staff, to refine division-wide goals and objectives for the program, to determine the design of the evaluation and specific data that will be used to measure goal attainment, and to develop an evaluation plan. And this concludes the presentation of the program evaluation schedule for the upcoming school year. I'm available for any questions at this time. Colleagues? Um, you said that um, evaluation of new and existing programs, you said that this will require school board approval? Yes, usually it will come back for um, usually on the consent agenda um, at the next meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. And this is Hughes. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first evaluation of PBIS, is that correct? That is correct. It was um, slated for its year one evaluation during um, 1920, and because of the school closure there, we did not have all of the data that we needed, and we postponed that one year. What was the first year that we implemented PBIS? 
there have been um, versions of PBIS through different names and through different avenues over the years. Um, I believe it might have been 1516 uh, through a grant um, program through um, uh, an MTSSB uh, grant, uh, multi-tiered systems of support. And that was different than how we are implementing PBIS now through um, the coaching model. And so when that, when our schools moved into our model, that is when um, it was added to the schedule. Okay. okay, thank you. And we did a planning, an evaluation planning year with them as well. Okay, Mrs. Anderson. One, wasn't it implemented like in a few schools and then yes. the next year a few more schools and we gradually introduced it. That's why it started in 2015, but 2016 was a few more schools, and 2017 a few more schools. Is that right, Dr. Spence? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> schools came in at different times, and um, so we now have all schools who are in one of the stages of implementation. But we've got several schools that have been doing it for a number of years, several schools that have only been doing it for a year or two at this stage. Right. Right, but it still seems we would have been evaluating it before, you know, we grew it. I mean, that's part of, just like we were talking about with the... Um, you know, pilot for new software. Instead, we just kept implementing it more and more and more. And it was on the schedule to be evaluated five years in, but because of the shutdowns, it's being evaluated six years in. Right. It right. seems like it should have been sooner. Anybody else before we ex excuse Dr. Janaki? Janaki. All right, we thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we have a list of policy review committee recommendations. Again, oh, there you are, Mrs. Linetti. <laughs> you disappeared for a moment. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, School Board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Cami Linetti, School Board Legal Counsel. And on behalf of the Policy Review Committee, I will be bringing you quite a lot of policies this evening. First in our policy is 4-1, which is under the employee section. Uh, it's involving definitions. We updated this plan on the recommendation of human resources because some of the things we've changed, you saw several minutes ago, we changed the benefits and policies that were relevant to VRS uh, plans and benefits. We've consolidated them all in one policy. So we decided to take it out of the reference in here, like you'll see under full time under A1. We're just referencing the policy instead of all the regulations. You'll see the same thing pulled down. We did a little bit more explanation on part-time employees, which also comes under A1. Again, you'll see some changes under temporary employees under F. We had a further explanation as to the benefits and rights for them, and again, citing the policy 437, which you approved several months ago, and making it clear that temporary employees do not have access to the agreements rights. Again, probationary employees, mostly cleaning up sites, and again, referencing some of the policies and regulations that we've since uh, modified for them. So those are the regulation, the, the policy amendments on 4-1. Are there any questions as to the recommendations? Relatively simple. Moving on to yeah. 418. This is dismissal or placement on probation. Most of this is basically Scribner changes or updating some of the law on there. So in 418, you see some Scribner changes in section A and B, and then cleaning up some of the editor's notes. There are no significant recommendations. We did update the reference to the regulations that, that are in there. Are there any questions on 418? Moving on to 475, again, also in the personnel section, this is conditions of employment on there. We are clarifying um, Issues to make sure we're compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So under se Section A, it will read, all applicants and employees must succeed the necessary skills and essential functions and abilities to perform the functions of the job sought after or hired for. That's to make it consistent with the ADA regulations. There are really just some Scrivener changes that follow throughout the rest of this particular policy. And then clarifying, I'm trying to see if I this is Section G. 
we updated the reference on to those crimes that would be disqualifying you from having employment. This is actually set out by code. As you know, the General Assembly has done significant work in this area as to what kind of crimes will prevent an individual from having a job on there. So these the suggested amendments here actually reflect current law that's come in the last two years. So under the paragraph that begins, the superintendent designee, we're talking about conviction of any violent felony as set forth in a barrier crime. Again, that section, the new, the amendment to the new Virginia Code section 19.239.2. Also, we talked about later on this an additional sentence that the school division may employ any individual has been convicted of any felony or crime or moral turpitude that is not set forth in the definition of barrier crime in code, code of Virginia 19.239.2. 2.02 .02 as amended and does not involve the sexual molestation, physical or sexual abuse, rape of a child, provided that in the case of a felony conviction, the governor has restored the individual civil rights. Again, those are amendments that the General Assembly has put through in the law to assist in allowing individuals with prior crimes to be employed. You'll see a clarification under I, which has to do with probationary periods, and I think we explained this earlier. For instructional individuals, the time period for your probation is actually set up by statute. So again, in cal uh, this, sorry, this is I-1. In calculating probationary year of service, the first year is defined as 160 more or actual days worked. The remaining probationary years of service shall be defined as 180 days or more actual work during the school year. That is actually set up by code. That was not in our, our policy before. And then just some more clarifications involved the rest of and updating of legal references that have to do with changes in the law. A little complicated, but those are mostly statutory changes that are came into effect in the last two years. Are there any questions on that particular policy? Mrs. Manning. Yeah, I just have one clarification, Cammie. Um, so regarding so in the part where it says the school division may employ an individual who has been convicted of any felony, etc. Um, provided that in the case of a felony conviction, the governor has restored the individual's civil rights. So if a person has been convicted of sexual molestation, sexual abuse, rape of a child, and the governor restored their rights, then they can still work in our division? That, that's what the statute reads, yes. 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 I'm sorry. Right, right, except if the governor has restored the individual's rights, correct? Correct. So she's a, she's saying that I'm right. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't read it that way. I mean, I think it's it says if they have, uh, we can employ any individual individual who's been convicted of any felony or crime of moral turpitude that's not set forth in the definition of barrier crimes, as amended and does not involve the sexual molestation, physical or sexual abuse, or rape of a child. Right. So that's the specific set aside. It cannot involve any of those things, no matter what. It can be another felony, and which can uh, we can hire them in the case of another felony conviction, if the governor has restored their individual rights. But we cannot do that if it involves the sexual molestation, physical or sexual abuse, or rape of a child, um, or um, any other felony crime that's set forth in the definition of a barrier crime in the Code of Virginia, which is really what the sexual molestation physical. Yeah, I'm sorry. That is about, that All is right. about we, this can in we our just, policy meeting can I, originally can I when we went through this. Is, is, I questioned this myself okay, for the same reason. Could we get some clarifying language to that then if we're all confused about it? Can, can it be reworded? I believe that is language out of the statute, but if you'd like me to pull this back off and verify it for you for... Um, I mean, I think that's a pretty it's, important. It'll, I can verify it between now and the next meeting and let you clarify, but I believe this language is straight out of the statute. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think if it's if very could clear just, now, I mean, that, I, now that we've read I, it again. I, I trust your viewpoint on it. I just want it to be explained a little bit better for the public and people who are reading it um, so that there is not that confusion. Would you like me to bring it back to the PRC or would you like me to send it out to the school board members with adjusted language? I'm fine with adjusted language if everyone else is. Just send Trinity out the language for everybody to okay. review. Policy yeah, chair agree. says okay. Right. Yes. Thank you. All right, so I will take that back and I will clarify the language for you with an explanation and then we'll bring it back. I'll send it out to you and if you're all right with that, it will move with the corrected language to the action agenda for the next meeting. Okay. 
I mean, the fact that now we know it can't, the questions come up twice at the committee level and the, right, the, the collective school board level. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to policy 488. This has holidays. Again, some updated language coming out of the Jones Line. We also, this has not been properly formatted before, so you see we've added formatted. So section A is designated holidays. We're adding election day and the November election day as a holiday. Under B, holidays on weekends and makeup days, we're gonna fix the outlining on it. We're already at section two. When the observed holiday falls on a day in which schools are still in session, the superintendent or designee shall have the authority to designate an alternate day to observe the holiday, award employees additional annual personal reasons leave in lieu of holiday. That's the additional language. And again, we've just formatted the rest of the, the policy to be consistent with our other policies. Are there any questions? It looks like our next regulation is a, this one is a regulation. And again, you do have obligations to assert regulations and regulations that involve student discipline are required to be reviewed by the school board. This is regulation 5-21 or 22.1. This has to do student suspensions. We clarified some of the language in B. Under these particular suspensions, under B deals with out of school suspensions of 10 days or less. Remember, we've explained this before. You have a property interest in attending school if it's more than 10 days. So this is um, a lesser form of suspension. The clarification comes in section two. The principals, and this should be a positive for you, at the principal's discretion, those students who have five or more disciplinary referrals without improvement in behavior after interventions and supports in place by the school may be referred to the Office of Student Leadership for follow-up contact with adult students or parents or legal guardians of minor students. As explained to us by Mr. McGee, part of the process when you're working with a student and you're trying the interventions at school, if you get to the point where you're multiple, multiple interventions and you're not getting any improvement, now you're going to go down to the Office of Student Leadership. They're going to work on a contract and try to explain to the family and the student why they need more cooperation and enter a contract. They want that clarified process and it allows us to work with the Office of Student Leadership and not just at the school level. Most of the rest of the changes you'll see here are basically scrivener's changes to make some of the wording consistent with language that we've had before. Again, my, definite, defining difference between minor students and adult legal guardians. That's most of the changes that you will see through the rest of the regulation. And I think under long-term suspension 2D, a little bit of explanation down in the end of the first, uh, the end of the first full paragraph. The, the adult student, the student begins. With, sorry, the paragraph that begins. The adult student or parent, legal guardian, or minor student may appeal a decision to the hearing officer of the discipline committee of the school board by notifying the director of the office of student leadership in writing. If you go down um, the end of the paragraph, the last sentence of that paragraph will now read: The discipline committee will consider the appeal within 30 days of the appeal, but such date may be extended by mutual consent or when it is not practical to hold a hearing within the 30-day period. You've noticed that it, with the, with the um, not that we've had a lot of disciplinary hearings, but there were times last year where we couldn't get the, the individuals in. So as long as there was consent, sometimes we went into a situation where a parent is not available or a student is going through a, a criminal matter or in the juvenile detention center and we can't get them. So this clarifies that we're going to try for 30 days, but if we agree to it, we can go past the 30-day period. The rest of the language in here just co is consistent with that and clarify it. To some little bit of clarification on the expulsion, also a little clarification in the middle of that particular paragraph, but you can expend past the 30 days by mutual consent for the hearings. Again, allows us a little bit more time with the pandemic situation and in those cases where the parent or the adult student agrees to a continuation, we're going to allow for a little bit of time past the 30 days. Again, the rest of the uh, regulation is a fairly long regulation, but it is just involving clarification mostly in the adult student parent legal guardian language that we use consistently in our policies. Are there any further questions? Moving on to policy 5-25. This involves student placement again. Uh, a little bit of clarification on the language uh, on the second paragraph that has to do with twins and siblings, mostly just clarification on that language and Scrivener's changes. Any questions? If there are no questions on 525. This just has to do with student placement and the clarifications. Moving on to 526. This is course load. Very minor recommendations for changes. They're mostly Scrivener changes. 
uh, on there, you'll see mostly after the word superintendent adding the, the word or designee and taking out the language referencing to he and she, but no other recommendations for changes to 526. Moving on to policy 527, if there's no questions, this is promotion, retention, and acceleration. Love the clarification in the first sentence. We clarified under kindergarten that students shall be retained in kindergarten only after conference with the parent legal guardian and approval of the principal designee. The principal or designee's decision will be final. We've added that section. Again, under section B, we're talking about what are the rules for promotion, clarifying that one or more of the following factors set forth, and there's 12 factors set forth, will be considered, and noting at the, a new addition that the decision to promote a student is final with the principal or designee. Going back on to section, the new edition of section F, which will read final decision on promotion or retention. The principal designee will have final authority to decide whether a student will be retained or promoted to the next grade. Students who have met the academic requirements to be promoted will not be retained for social, emotional, or disciplinary reasons. This is frequently an issue that we have, and our policy has not been clear in the past about that, so we're putting that wording in there. Are there any questions about this particular policy? Moving on, to, oh, clarify. Moving on to policy 528, reporting student progress, mostly scrubbing the changes that you'll see throughout here involving clarifying the difference between adult students and parents and legal guardians of them, verifying the language. I don't see any other significant changes other than clarifying some of the legal references. So these are just a review with Scrivener's changes. Are there any questions on policy 528? Policy 529 is awards for achievement, class rank, honor designations. First paragraph, just a clarification in the final sentence that awards donated by agencies which are recognized nationally, approved by the superintendent or designee or the school board may be awarded to students. We are clarifying language. We, it's been our practice for a while and we did not have the policy full, fully um, cleaned up. So we removed section D where it read, Valedictorian and salutatorians, that was a practice not to have that. We pulled that out. We pulled out class rank, E, redesignated what was F as honor designations. No significant changes, and that's some minor scrivener changes on that. And then one clarification was under honor designations, under section two, the following honor designations, we have added a section E, and that will now say, and will be awarded will be added to the student's final transcript and the information about that on our designations. Are there any questions about this particular policy? This is Franklin, then Mrs. Manning. And I'm sorry, maybe I, I'm just going to ask for a little levity here because I was not sitting on the board at the time when we decided to, uh, I guess, eliminate the Val Self, um uh, designations and I'm just um, if you could give me just a little bit of history and I apologize I probably should have asked this before mm -hmm. for the meeting I can try to help with that <clears throat> so the the initial conversation around valedictorian salutatorian actually came to us from students started with students uh, at Princess Anne High School who came forward expressing concerns that if they were not in the IB program at Princess Anne High School they would never be eligible to be valedictorian or salutatorian at Princess Anne High School because um, the coursework that was required for IB always gave students a higher GPA than students who were not in the IB program. We then heard similar comments from students at Ocean Lakes High School, and then we actually heard uh, sort of opposite comments from students at Salem High School because uh, students in the visual and performing arts did not have access to weighted coursework that would allow them to, in the academy, actually um, be eligible to become valedictorian, salutatorian. So then there was a long conversation with the school board and with the community and in our schools and with our principals and um, a lot, a lot of conversation and our high school principals ultimately came back with a supportive recommendation that we would remove valedictorian and salutatorian. There was also a lot of conversation in there about the fact that you were only recognizing two students. If you were at our graduations this, um, this, um, uh, Last June, you would have seen if most of our high schools asked their students with a 4.0 or higher to stand up, and it was like 20% of the mm -hmm. class in some cases. And so students who had worked very hard who were not able to get that rank, so there was discussion about what was happening in other places around the country, and the, the, the real interesting part of that conversation became looking at the Latin honor system that's employed 
at the university level and uh, implementing a Latin honor system that would allow you to recognize with distinction students who had achieved different benchmarks. So basically the idea is set the bar and let anybody who hits that bar um, be recognized with Latin honors distinction. So um, if you see there on the, um, the section two under D, a student with a 3.0 is considered an honor graduate a 3.5 to a 3.75 is a cum laude distinction a 3.76 to 3.99 is a magna cum laude and anybody over a 4.0 is a summa cum laude so a, a different way for students to receive um to receive distinction so that was the kind of brief history of that okay i i, I being at the graduations i do have to say that i i've really enjoyed listening to the valedictorians, salutatorians give their speeches and, um, you know, provide just uh, a student experience, um, you know, and some leadership there. But, you know. Um, well, again. I think uh, one of the parts of the conversation that the board had at that time uh, was that there will be other opportunities for different students to be able to speak and it won't mm -hmm. just be limited to valedictorian, salutatorian. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of examples shared of <laughs> principals, myself included, who had student speakers who were elected by the student body or who were elected by their teachers, for example, mm -hmm. when I was a high school principal. So different ways to approach that, but there, there will still be student speakers. Okay, thank you. And Mrs. Franklin, I can add, and I'm sure not, I'm not the only one here who would offer, but I'd be happy to speak further with you. But a little more context, this dates back four years ago so the incoming senior class this policy was put in effect just before they entered freshman year and so a lot of discussion revolved around just the evolution in the country and we were at the point four years ago where well over 50 percent of all public and private high schools in the country are unranked and and even among the most elite colleges they have been dealing with unranked students for decades now including my alma mater and many others and there's I even have some of the forms for when when my children applied, and there's some a, there's some actual lines about um, you know not, I forget the, which you know is at the top two percent the top five percent so there's still ways that this that the school can delineate for the for the college but I mean this applies to the academies as well they all had to adjust again dating back to the earliest schools and it was actually a number of the private schools that initiated this originally, especially the private schools who tend to attract all high achieving students who are college bound. And none of the parents wanted their child to be ranked 75th out of a class mm -hmm. of 100, you know, because they were all high performing. And, and, it, it, it's, and, and then it's also just about within each of our schools now, there are so many different programs under the roof of each of these schools and not all students within each building have access to all the, cor to the same coursework. So then it became, you know, and there's, there's a viewpoint that I happen to agree with. It's like comparing apples and oranges, even within each setting. But I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's a range of thoughts on it, but those were some of the, ra the rationales for doing what we did at the time. Again, this is just for information tonight. And yes, Mrs. Anderson. So, and, and the fact that we added um, E, which says, and will be added to the student's final transcript. So. In other words, um, their their distinction of whether they are honor student or whether they are cum laude or magna cum laude or summa cum laude will be added to their transcript. And I felt that was important to, to add so that people, you know, as their transcript was sent out, people would know that, oh yeah, this this is not just this is not just an honor student. And and I, it's very important, I think, for students who've achieved especially uh, higher than a 4.0 for that pe for people to know that that you know they've achieved the summa cum laude and that distinction goes with them. So, <clears throat> Mrs. Manning. Um, yeah. So there were other ways we could have dealt with it just to give the other perspective of of a vast majority of the public um, who wanted to keep valedictorian and salutatorian. We could have had two at each one of our academy schools, and we opted not to do that. Um, one understanding that I had, and, and I don't I don't have the other associated policy with this, um, this completely blocks out class rank. And um, as, as a parent who just went through college applications, um, the colleges my son applied to all did ask for class rank. It did not ask for, um, it did not ask for a percentage. It said how many out of how many, and we were required to answer that. And last year I was able to get that. This next year for my other son, I won't be able to get that. 
Um, based upon this, I cannot. Well, okay, so that was my question. This is this is completely obliterating class rank in this policy. Um, if we need to get that for a college application, can we? I, I can only say that, like I said, well over 50% of the high schools in the country, their children, they've been providing the information the college is needed. And it's, it's, there's a system in place because this is not in a unique situation. So well, let's spell it out in the policy here because right now we're, we're completely obliterating item E, class rank. So um, is, there, is there an avenue for um, students to get class rank right now? If there's a requirement for them to have class rank that can be provided, yes, that yes. was part of the conversation. It was. Okay, um, I, I think we should include that in the policy if that's the case. I don't think it should be asked for. I think it should be requires. I, I, I think the policy committee, if you're going to have this conversation, probably needs to take it back up because there's a difference between asks for and requires. Because most of them do not require it. They, they still ask for it, but they don't require it. Well, and there's also, it's, it's not just, um, and I think we had this conversation, it's not just colleges, um, the academic aspects. Um, the athletics department asks for it and requires it. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're signing up for your, your, your athlete to play um, college sports, the initial questionnaire you get, you have to complete class rank, and it won't let you move forward if you don't. So, Right. So I think that the requirement can be embedded in there, but you probably should kick it back to the PRC to have that conversation since this is a policy that's been longstanding. Yeah, I would, I would suggest that as well. All right, so we'll be taking then 529 back to PRC. I've noted what we need. We'll have to reorder it and take a look at what the required language is. I would like to involve um, Dr. Green's office to verify what it is they need to do. And two more, correct? All right, almost done. All right, 531 is scholastic records. And again, as you remember, we need to monitor our policies every five years. The last time you looked at this one was, I believe, 2014. So there are not going to be significant changes recommended. It's a fairly long policy. Just clarifying, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, is a federal law that deals with student records. Virginia law, and the federal law refers to as education records. For whatever reason, the Virginia law dealing with records calls it scholastic records. So that's why there's a slight difference here. So we use the term scholastic records here. The only changes here are just simply scrivener changes that reflect updated positions and some clarifying language. There really is no significant changes that are being recommended for this policy. We were simply looking at it to verify it was compliant with current law. So there are no other significant changes other than the scrivener's changes that are recommended. Are there any questions on 531? Okay, the really exciting one is 677. There was a change in the law, an adoption law, the Code of Virginia 22.1215.2, parent notification, literacy and response to intervention screening and services, and certain assessment results. This went into effect last year, so we needed to adopt a policy that's consistent. So this, the recommended adopted policy will read, literacy response to intervention screening and services, the superintendent designee will develop procedures for providing timely and written notification to adult students or parents, legal guardians of minor students who A, undergo literacy and response to intervention screening and services, and B, do not meet the benchmark on any assessment used to determine at-risk learners in preschool through grade 12. Such notification shall include all such assessment scores and subscores and intervention plan the results from such assessment subscore scores or subscores. And again, that is required as of the new adoption law by the General Assembly and the code section cited there. So we're recommending that you adopt this policy to be consistent with requirements of law. Are there any questions on these policies? So I need to put down that pile. All right, moving back to policy 5-7, would you like me to go back over some of the PowerPoint information or where would you like me to start with this? I, I mean, I have to throw it out to the 
at least for the benefit of the public who wasn't watching the workshop, do we want to at least flash some of the first screens and she can just... What I can do is go back over the legal requirements. I may not spend as much time on the court language for you since I, a lot of that was for you to understand where we were. All right, again, for the school community that's watching, the purpose of this is not necessarily to advocate for where I think you should be. It's what I want the school board to understand what the state of the law is so you have some idea of what you are required to do or not required to do. Again, as I mentioned before, policy 5-7 is your student non-discrimination and harassment policy. It's set forth basically what you're seeing up on the screen under B1, which talks about the categories of what we call protected classes. We pulled those originally from the Virginia Human Rights Act. Up until 2020, the Virginia Human Rights Act did not include the protected categories of sexual orientation and gender identity. It went up before the General Assembly every year for approximately 23 years, and every year it got turned down. In 2020, it was eventually adopted, and you were required to incorporate it into your non-discrimination policies. However, when the Supreme Court did the Oberfeld versus Felder case, which had to do with the gay marriage cases, that particular case then stated that you could not discriminate against individuals based on the sexual orientation and gender identity. At that point, after discussing with the board, we decided in 2016 to go ahead and add the categories of sexual orientation and gender identity into your non-discrimination policy. So it appeared both here uh, in 5-7 and also in your, your Section 4 having to do with personnel. So you have made a commitment since 2016 to include protections for sexual orientation and gender identity. Again, when the, this particular act was amended in, in 2020, it required that you have these in it. You already had them in your policies, but you've made that commitment already. What happened in 2020 was that the Code of Virginia was amended by the General Assembly, 22.1, 23.3. And yes, I did catch that mistake. That was the updated agenda. Some of these citations were incorrect, some were correct. A lot of information, but what I wanted you to see in here is that the General Assembly directed the Department of Education to develop the model guidelines and that set forth the categories that you were seeing up there on the screen. So these are categories that we had to figure out how we were going to incorporate. First category is compliance with applicable non discrimination laws. I believe you've already got that information in your non discrimination laws. Two, you have to do maintenance of safe, supportive learning environment free from discrimination and harassment of all students. Three, prevention of and response to bullying and harassment. Four, maintenance of student records. Five, identification of students. Six, is protection of student privacy and confidentiality of sensitive information. Seven, was enforcement of sex-based dress codes. Eight, was student participation in sex-specific school activities and events and use of school facilities. Activity and events do not include it actually says competitive athletics that is specifically exempted from the statute. What's most important for you is Section B, which again, this, the General Assembly said each school board shall adopt policies that are consistent with, but may, may be more comprehensive than the model policy developed by the Department of Education. So that was the direction from the General Assembly. The Virginia Department of Education then developed its model guideline for the treatment of transgender students. This came out last year in December. It was pretty comprehensive. And when it was put out, it was put out in the regulatory form, which allowed the public to make comments. As I mentioned before, I believe there were well over 6,000 or more comments when it shut down the system. Normally, in a regulatory process, once all these comments come back in, the agency that is putting out the proposed regulation takes those comments and looks at them. Some of the other policies we've seen, we've seen this go back and forth for 13 or 14 years before it's resolved. In this case, the Virginia Department of Education did not look at any, any comments, did not make any changes, and they actually said as of April 2nd, 2020, those guidelines were finalized in the regulations. So that left us with no room to move with them or get the Virginia Department of Education to challenge some of these issues. We were well aware the council school attorneys and other individuals that did an education law that there were some serious concerns about the legality of some of the information we had in here. What you saw throughout the guidelines was, well, when you're not sure what to do, talk to your school attorney. That was a serious concern for us, but we had to work through this. There were several groups that decided to try to challenge the implementation, how the regulations were being adopted. They were consolidated into a case that went into the Lynchburg Circuit Court. 
that the court then made a decision in July of 2021. Long story short, they basically said, you don't have the ability to go forward. You have not been injured or harmed. We're not going to take the suit any further. So therefore, we were all waiting to see if there's any chance that the court was going to either issue an injunction or somehow stay the requirement that we had to implement these policies. And most school divisions, that's why we're late doing this. We wanted to see what was going to happen with that particular case. So once we found out in July that it was not, there was no pending injunction or stay of these proceedings, we needed to go forward with that. So that's how we ended up coming to the policy review committee. There was not a policy review committee meeting in July, so we could not bring it forward until August. That's why the information came out to you in August. Again, the same things we talked about that we were looking at that we need to look at was the non-discrimination and a bullying policies, the privacy information for student, student records, which involved names and pronouns, Dress codes had to be sex and gender neutral. Access to activities and facilities had to be addressed in professional development and training. You saw the dress code policy. We did bring that forward because that was actually another statute that required that we had the dress code be neutral. That's already in place. And again, I went through a lot of the Gavin Grimm case for you. I'm not going to go back through all the comments to look at. That case is online. It had a long procedural history. The most recent decision I'm citing to is a 2019 decision. What happened in the Gavin Grimm case was the Gloucester School Board said, we are going to make a determination that we have boys' bathrooms and girls' bathrooms, and based on your biological gender, that is going to determine what bathroom you can use. That then resulted in a long series of um, litigation. The individual in that particular case was identified male, so his gender identity was male, wanted to use the male bathrooms and the, and the Gloucester County School board initially allowed that student for about seven weeks to do that. There were no incidences, and there were then complaints from adults in the community, and that resulted in the school board coming up with a new process. They actually, during that time period, the Gloucester court then decided to put in the bathrooms full petition. So instead of having them open at the bottom, open at the top, they put a full petition in there. They thought that was going to resolve the problem. It did not resolve the issue. Again, this case has gone back and forth a few times up through the courts, but eventually in this particular case, by the time it came back up again before the Fourth Circuit and the Court of Appeals, the student had added a second charge to it, was that the student wanted the student's records to be amended to reflect the student's gender identity at this time, and that the, at that time the Gloucester Court was not willing to do that. This went up to the Fourth Circuit. The Fourth Circuit basically gave a pretty blistering opinion on this particular case. And that's why I want you to pay attention to this particular decision when we discuss it. The, the, the Fourth Circuit, which you are covered by the Fourth Circuit because you are in Virginia and Virginia falls under the Fourth Circuit, made certain things very clear. The Fourth Circuit made it very clear that there is no evidence that transgender students are peeping toms. They also said there is no evidence that cisgender students will pretend to be transgender students for the purposes of getting into bathrooms. There are many, many pages where they're going through the reports on that. They noted that sex segregated bathrooms are allowed, so you can have a boy's bathroom and a girl's bathroom, but you can't discriminate based on the gender identity going into that. So you have a boy's bathroom, you have a girl's bathroom, but the Fourth Circuit's made it very clear if that student identifies as a girl, that student gets to use the bathroom for girls. Some of the clarification came out of this was a case in 2020, the Bostick versus Clayton County case that came out of the United States Supreme Court. This was not a student case. It's involved an employee in a county situation. What that case stands for is that the Supreme Court it made very clear that if you discriminate against a transgender student, sorry, transgender employee or transgender person based on their sexual orientation or gender identity, that is considered to be discriminating against the person under sex. So that protects the person under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act for schools that would also apply as Title IX under the Education Amendments Act. Again, I'm not going to go through all these different quotes I had for you. You can take a look at them. We went through that earlier. But it is a blistering decision on there. So it, what I point to you is if you think, wow, maybe the court hasn't considered some of the issues we heard tonight, read back through this decision. They have looked at every one of the complaints you heard tonight and decided that they do not, the Fourth Circuit does not complete, believe those to be adequate reasons to discriminate against students. One of the issues they were very particular about, and I'm not sure which page I've got this on, this page on, where it says, you see the bottom of the paragraph, it says biological gender. 
They made it very clear that there was nothing to support the Gloucester County's decision to create a category called biological gender. For Gloucester County, that was whatever was on your birth certificate. And the court made it very clear that that was not appropriate. You could not define biological gender that way. You could not define gender that way. And that you could not use that on there. So that is, if you're going to make up a term or use a term, we need to be extremely careful because the Fourth Circuit's made it very clear that they are not going to accept made up terms. It needs to be based on research. And I'm not going to go back through all these quotes, but I put some of them in there. You've heard what they call the predator myth. You've heard a lot of that tonight. The court was, in multiple cases, uh, multiple sections of the opinion, made it very clear that there is no evidence to support that the school board after school board has brought this up both in the Fourth Circuit and in the United States, and there is no evidence to support this. And the court found that to be very offensive. So that would be a, something we, a hurdle we would have to get over if you're going to challenge something like that. I also put in part of the concurring decision from Judge Wynn because I think it was clarifying much more about what the civil rights violations were. And again, Judge Wynn is very clear, going back to much of the information we're hearing now is very similar to what you saw in the 1950s was reasons to segregate black individuals from white individuals in the community, and the judge made that very, very clear in his decision, in his concurring decision. Again, noted, also, Judge Wynn pointing out that the predator, transgender predator myth is something that is not supported by evidence. Um, again, citing the constitutional violations. I will also note that there was a significant dissent by just Niemeyer. Judge Niemeyer was pointing out that you can segregate based on sex, that that is appropriate at times. So the judge thought that was significant. Judge Niemeyer also in his dissent pointed out that he felt that the majority decision was clearly attempting to enforce a policy and not applying the law. So that is what you dissent in that case. Again, I bring this up to your attention because the Fourth Circuit is the law that controls here. If we're in a situation we either have to bring a lawsuit or defend a lawsuit, this is what we're going to have to overcome if we're going to deal with bathrooms. That is currently the law in the Fourth Circuit. So going back to policy 5-7, again, as I mentioned, this is your non-discrimination policy. As I pointed out, you've had sexual orientation, gender identity. That is something you committed to many years ago that's already in your policy. So what we did with Regulation 5-7.1 was there were certain categories that we didn't address before because there's things that we simply have not had in the policy. A little concern about the confidentiality of information. We've always had confidentiality. You know as well as I do that student education records must, maintain, must be maintained confidential. But we needed for the to be consistent with the policy, we needed to say that we were going to protect information about transgender students. We've never had a policy on names and pronouns, and that's the model guidance suggested that we had that in there. So we had to draft some guidance on names and pronouns. This is not something we haven't dealt with before. We normally work with the student and the student's family as how best to deal with this. I think there's a misconception that the student's going to be able to do whatever they want, and we're not going to consult the parent. If you're an adult student, you're over 18, you have the right to make decisions for yourself, we will have to abide by what the student said. But if you're under 18, we are going to be obligated to work with your parents and we will look at the situation. We are going to require, we will have to use the legal name on our document that's on your, your, the documentation we have with you. But if your parent agrees that we can call you Sally instead of Billy, then we'll work that out and we'll call you Sally. That's not necessary for our paperwork. If you legally want your name changed, you do have to bring the court documents in, and that's what the regulations reflect. Participation in activities. Again, I will cite for you the statute is very clear. Competitive sports do not, are not addressed under this policy. So all this would be on the sports and activities were some of your extracurricular activities. I think there was a misconception on the boys' choir. What they were actually saying was rather than saying boys' and girls' choir, you could say sopranos and altos have a choir. You can say bass, bass, tenors have their own choir. You can define it like that. They're suggesting if, it, if, you, if it's necessary for the activity to define by male and female, you do that. But if it's not necessary, look for other ways to categorize that. And again, that is a requirement by the statute that we had to put that in. I go back to the restroom and locker rooms. Again, I point out to the Grimm decision that has been decided in the Fourth Circuit. Um, I, right now, there is no other law that says we can discriminate against an individual based on bathrooms. So looking at that, we put that in Regulation 
544, policy 544 is your sexual harassment um, statute or Title IX statute that we had to amend last year. Again, last year, the U.S. Department of Excuse me, we need to catch up with our oh, slide. Sorry, I'm talking through this. Oops, back up. Thank you. That particular statute, we decided to put the restroom and locker rooms over here in this particular statute because that's very specifically having to do with sex, and we thought that would fall under the Title IX procedures. As I mentioned earlier, the United States Department of Education required us to put very comprehensive Title IX policies and regulations in. As I mentioned again for the public, we are currently being monitored by the U.S. Department of Education. I had a call last, last week asking about the status of our Title IX procedures in there. We're, they're monitoring us, not for a specific violation, but they asked to, to verify that, and we have to get that information into them. So that is a concern for me. I'm mentioning a lot on the federal law piece because I think that's important. There's a lot of focus right now on Virginia Department of Education can't make you do something, the General Assembly can't make you do something. That is one issue that you are going to have to deal with. What are your obligations to the General Assembly? What are your obligations to the Virginia Department of Education? Regardless of whether you adopt the model policies or not, you are still subject to the federal law. As I mentioned before, the U.S. Department of Education put out guidance on uh, several weeks ago, and last week they actually put out a YouTube message to transgender students, and it was in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Justice, and they made it very clear to transgender students that if the transgender student feels that their rights have been violated, that they cannot use bathrooms, they cannot do sports, they're being treated differently, that they are to contact the U.S. Department of Education and the Office of Civil Rights for the Department of Justice will then come in and prosecute the cases. So while you're worried about whether you have to apply with the Virginia Department of Education's requirements and the General Assembly, you still have to deal with the federal aspect of it. And that is, to me, a little bit more concerning than the state aspects of it. So when I'm looking at Regulation 544.2, they went ahead and put the language in there. The use of restrooms and locker rooms, you have to allow a student to use gender restrooms and locker room that the student identifies with. However, all students can ask for requests for accommodations for a single-use restroom. Currently, this is how we handle situations with transgender students or individuals that have problems. You come to the administrator of the school and we talk through what you need to do and what bathroom you can use on there. So the same situation will be used for a student that says, I'm not comfortable going into a bathroom because there might be a student that's transgender. Then you talk to your administrator, what bathroom can you use? How can we accommodate you? That is how we've handled all the transgender students so far. So if you are not comfortable with that situation, talk with your administrator. The menstrual supplies, again, I point out, this is not actually part of the model guidelines. This was a separate statute that was put through. Some of you remember, because we had individuals came to us a couple years ago talking about the need to put these supplies in our schools, and they initially did their free. They then went to the General Assembly and had that put in as a law, so we now have to provide the menstrual supplies for them. We had not had that in a, in a policy before, so we went ahead and put that in a policy. It made sense because I've never had a policy on restrooms before, so we've gone ahead and put that here. The note is that is we now do have to put them in both men's and uh, girls' and boys' bathrooms, so depending on whatever your gender is, if you need them, they're in those bathrooms at the middle and high school. I'm not really going to address what boys might do with these menstrual supplies in there. I don't know that that's a big concern for us, but they are. that is a state statute that requires us to do that. At the elementary school, we do not necessarily put them in the bathrooms. You need to come to a nurse or an administrator, and they will provide those for you. And again, the rules on non-discrimination, anti-harassment, the restrooms and bathrooms, they're also stated here. I will remind people that it is, it is still a violation of policy and law to sexually harass, assault anyone in a bathroom or any other location. So the fact that we allow you in that does not allow you to sexually harass anyone. Moving on to 656, this has to do with field trips, class, curriculum, and extracurricular activities. Again, they required us to specifically address trips and overnight trips. Um, this was a, co a complicated one for us to look at. We had to spend some time thinking about this one. Basically, we had to make sure that starting with the trip sponsor, if you're going to do a trip that involves overnight or going somewhere where you need to have changing facilities, you as a trip sponsor need to put a lot of time into thinking ahead of time, let the student and the families know what's going to happen, what the arrangements are, 
and then you talk through the process. We do this, this happens occasionally. I've been involved in some of these cases before, so we talk through the students and the families and figure out the best situation for that. We're not going to force a student into a room with someone the student doesn't want to be with. We will talk with the students, we will work it out. One of the requirements is that we cannot then force anybody's transgender to be in a room by themselves. We can offer that option, but we cannot force them to be in a room. So that is something where we spelled out more regulations that the trip sponsors need to think more about it. While looking at this particular policy, we noted there are other things to make students feel included in them. We need to consider things, the health, disability issues that have to follow it, so those were added to this particular regulation. Again, the trick to this, I really think, is going to be the trip sponsors thinking through it, planning out, and then working with the students and the families to find the appropriate accommodations for the students. Again, I'm going to get back to it real quick, as I mentioned before, in 544. Again, this is 544, although it is a local pol uh, your policy in there, it's based very much on the federal regulation, the USDOE regulations coming in under Title IX. You are still subject to this, and again, this is not something that's optional for you. The U.S. Department of Education has made it very clear. The U.S. Department of Justice has made it clear. The President's Office has made it very clear that they are going to take this seriously. And again, the federal law says sex includes sexual orientation and gender identity. We are still subject to the federal law, and I honestly think that is probably your biggest area of concern. Again, 544.1, this is just our regulations that talk about where you can't sexually harass someone, you can't sexual violence, inappropriate sexual conduct. None of that is tolerated. So the fact that we allow you into bathroom still means you cannot sexually harass anybody. As I mentioned before, student dress code 541 had to be neutral. You already adopted that June 8th. That is consistent with the Virginia Department of Education's model guidelines. Again, stressing for the U.S. Department of Education has put out an executive order. Again, very strict language on what is required as far as sexual orientation and gender identity. So the federal government is going to come in here and make sure that you comply with that. And again, I cited the message, the recent message, as recently as last week, they put out language involving this. Again, so we're back to what has to be addressed. You have to have the non-discrimination anti-bullying policies. We've had them in place. Um, not really clear why the, the General Assembly thought you had to reiterate it again, but they did, so that's what we've done. We've made sure we've cleaned up our policies. You will see um, the Council of School Attorneys for the Virginia School Board Associations had long discussions on these particular issues. I knew the initial guidance for many of the school divisions was to simply cite to the model guidelines and not put the language in there. On July 30th of 2021, James Lane, the state superintendent, made it very clear what their position was on the Virginia Department of Education, that citing to the statute itself or the model guidelines was not adequate. You actually had to adopt policies on that and that you would have to assume liability. And just to declare, U.S. Department of Education has put out analysis of civil rights, a lot of um, language that goes out and flyers that have been sent out to most students in the area that have to do with transgender rights. So both the federal government and the Virginia Department of Education are putting this information out there. So when looking at it, our best recommendation for you was to not do what originally many of the school divisions did was to cite, simply cite the statute. We attempted to find a mid-ground, which was to develop, add those things that had not been addressed in a regulation. We have not adopted word for word what's in the model guidelines. You've heard concerns about the child abuse um, Reporting, I, I was concerned about that myself, but we are not initially going to report someone for child abuse. We did not adopt that particular statute. You are still mandated reporters, so when the situation warrants it, we do have to make that call. But we're not automatically going to assume because a student wants a different name or gender identity that that means it's Child Protective Services regula uh, regulation. The Child Protective Services regulations are triggered. We did not put that in there. Again, we are not automatically going to say because a student said they wanted to do something that we were going to override the parent's rights. Clearly, if the student has a parent or legal guardian and the student's a minor, we are going to work with that family the best we can. This is a procedure we've done for decade after decade. We know how to do this procedure. I simply can't tell you exactly what it's going to be because every student is different. So you allow your school counselors, your administrators, 
to work with your students. We thought that was the best way. I don't think the regulations in any way would deal with overriding a parent's legal rights. We're very conscious of that. And I can assure you every situation I'm aware of where the administrator is not sure, they contact my office and we make sure that they are consistent with the legal rights. So at this time, the recommendation for you is to put the policy out there, 5-7, and allow the regulations to be developed as appropriate. We've suggested what the regulations are going to be. The reason we did regulations is simply because many of these things are not typically things that we see in policy. They're very detailed issues, so we went ahead and put them in regulations on there. That is about my best advice for you right now as to what the status of the law is. Again, I would not want to get into conversation with you on particular litigation without going to closed session if we need to go to closed session. I would want to involve administrators, but I can answer general questions about the status of the law at this time. All right, we'll start with Mrs. Anderson. Thank you, Mrs. Lonetti. So two things I'd like to say. First of all, I think we can't overemphasize enough. We heard parent after parent after parent worried about us taking over their rights, you know, deciding for their children. And, 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 and so this... In, in the regulation, it basically states that the parents, if the child, if the student is under 18, it's the parents who request in writing. And, you know, the only thing I could state is that, is that to, to fix that, because I think people were worried that, you know, how teenagers become sophisticated and they, they cheat and they, they want to, they, they learn to write their parents' signature. So I think maybe we could say that the parents would need to bring that with, with them to the to have, you know, a conference with with the administration or counselors. Um, Mrs. Anderson, we deal with falsified parent notes <laughs> all the time. I think I, I think they're pretty able to deal with that. So but you know, I think people were, were concerned that that these some teenagers, you know, maybe be able to falsify their parents' signature and to be able to do that. But, but basically it states that the parents have to request, put it in writing and they have to request um, these, uh, if a student wanted to, wanted to be called a different name or wanted to use a restroom differently, whatever. Um, so they, they were concerned about that. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I lost my train of thought. Oh. If regulation, if this regulation is changed substantially, would it come back for the board to look at? Because I know it's stated that if a regular, that a, the board actually can veto a regulation, the board can do that if they just, if they so choose. If you request, um, there are only certain types of regulations that are required for the board to do student discipline. You saw some of those earlier that has to be dealt with by the board. Otherwise, the normal process is when a superintendent, your superintendent passes a regulation, they, he informs you what it is. At that point, you would then have the opportunity to bring it back to the board and bring it up. Um, but normally, you don't approve most regulations. I, I realize that, but I was just wondering if, if, if there was substantial changes, what, would we be able to have a say in this? Dr. Spence, do you want to answer that? Well, I think the board already has a say in it in terms of the conversation we're having right now. And um, if the board decides it wants to approve regulation on this issue, I suppose, Gammy, you, there's you. nothing that would prevent you from doing it. Correct. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Mrs. Briggs, then Mrs. Hughes. Says yes. So, Ms. Linetti spent quite a lot of time on the Grimm case, but there are also a few other cases. Um, that Lynchburg Circuit Court case, where the judge said, threw it out because there was no injury, that actually was that they had no standing. I mean, if I did something to you, she can't sue for it. So that's, that's why that was thrown in. It's not that there, it was that the people who brought it had no injury. Also, in that same case, what they said was there's no enforcement mechanism in this. So if you do it, you do it. If you don't, you don't. Um, also, the Tanner Cross 
um, case was not brought up, and this is where the teacher was disciplined for not using the requested pronouns, and that was turned around. And the Manahoy case where the Supreme Court said that parental powers were kind of the number one thing with, um, with kids. I don't see anything in writing that says parents have the ultimate say in these issues, and there should be for anyone that's a minor. Um, so, so many things here. Um, it's also problematic that we did have people come in and decide that anyone that disagrees, apparently it's hate speech or you're, or you're homophobic or transphobic. That's actually not true. Um, I have several gay female friends. I have no problem sharing a restroom with them. I would not in a million years share a restroom with my husband. Um, I do not believe that because someone is gay or transgender, they're more likely to be a predator. I, I don't believe that either. I'm just not comfortable. Um, and I'm curious, what about the rights of children who may be uncomfortable sharing a restroom? with someone who is of a different biological sex. I, I don't know another way to put it. I know that says don't call it that, but I, I think we kind of have a shared definition of that. But what about those people's rights? Do we have an answer for them? I believe the Grimm case answers that for the Fourth Circuit. So they just don't have any? The Grimm case said that the protected class is transgender. It doesn't say that well, I guess what they call cisgender has any more rights. Well, I don't think anyone should have more rights. I mean, I, I personally don't believe in protected classes. I don't think anybody should be bullied. And based on the emphasis being placed on this, I'm wondering why is it we're doing such a poor job of this that we need a bullying policy on top of our bullying policy. I don't think any child should be bullied. I should answer that. I will tell you that most of us thought, most of the attorneys that practice in the area thought the same thing. What is wrong with the policies we have in place? By the time this came out, we all had to adopt the Title IX procedures, which is your 544, which clearly covered this category. We were, it was not clear to us why the General Assembly told us we had to do it again on there. So, you know, that's why we amended this particular policy is because we felt that fell into your policy. But you've already had bullying policy. You've had Title IX procedures in. Much of this was already incorporated. And again, that was a lot of the comments that you saw into the regulations. We weren't clear why the General Assembly was requiring us to do this. But some of those things are very specifically in the statute. And I'm assuming that's why VDOE did it. Mrs. Manning, then Ms. Owens, and Mrs. Holtz. Okay, so back to the regulation topic, because that's something that we heard from people on both sides of, of views on, on this. Um, this regulation can be changed at any time. What's been presented to us isn't necessarily what is going to be the final product. And um, I, I, I don't think that putting it into regulation is the right thing to do. Um, I think this is a very important important big topic if a regulation if it's a regulation it can be changed without the public even knowing correct like it, it wouldn't be brought to a, a meeting no regulations do have to go on the it'll be website. on the website but the public's not going to be notified if there are changes that are made um our, our school board bylaws 1-31 says the power to enact policy cannot be delegated to an employee or agent such as the superintendent um, and while I think you're getting around this by saying, well, this is a policy and we're going to implement regulation, I, I think that it goes against the spirit of the bylaw um, that the school board is relegating its policy making um, job to the superintendent. And, you know, it may not be always be Dr. Spence. So a, another superintendent could have their own regulations and um, the public would not know. So, um, but I wanted to address the, um, the pronoun thing because it was stated that a parent would have to sign off on that. That's not what, it, the, that's not what the regulations state. The regulation specifically says, in accordance with this subsection, meaning the gender pronouns, um, 
let's see, uh, students will be allowed to use a name and gender pronoun that reflects their gender identity without substantiating evidence. And there's no parental requirement or approval mentioned. Number two, at the written request of the student or parent of a minor student, use the name and pronoun that corresponds to the student's um, or parent's request. So the parent does not have, have to be informed, have to have approval. Um, and then this was referenced by one of our speakers tonight in the situation when parents of a minor student do not agree with a minor student's request to adopt the name, the student and parent will work with school administrators. The parent will, will work with school administrators to determine how to address the student's needs. So we as a governing body here, or the superintendent, whoever is doing this, is telling a parent in, in these documents that they will work with the school administration to address their child's situation. This goes against the Constitution. It goes against parental rights. Um, I have a huge, huge problem with that section. Um, and um, an another concern that I have is we say that the pronouns that will be recognized are he, she, and they. Well, we heard from one speaker that there are a lot of other pronouns that people want to use. Um, using the term they for an individual person is grammatically incorrect, so how's an English teacher going to deal with that? Um, this is Manny. I can address, I did speak to student support services and they said the three major groups that they were working with all agree that they is an appropriate pronoun because my concern is I can list probably about 50 different pronouns and, and they suggested that's where that recommendation came is that the most, the three major groups that they have worked with and advising believe that they would be an appropriate pronoun. So we picked a pronoun just because I didn't want to be in a situation we had 50 or 60 different pronouns we had to deal with. Yeah, and I understand that. but. Um, but on that topic, um, and, and Ms. Hughes referenced the Tanner Cross case, um, if an employee or a student does not believe based upon their religious convictions that there are more than two genders and they refuse to use the pronoun they, could the student or employee be charged with discrimination and harassment? There are a bunch of cases right now going around in the country. Uh, there was one case, I guess I believe it was out of Indiana. Well, I just, I, based but, upon what we are writing here, these regulations, well, how it's written right, right if now. If you take a look at it, um, if the school, and this is three, school personnel students who are not informed of the requested name and gender pronoun by the school administration will not be found to have discriminated against them. So if we didn't tell them and you use it. Next one is inadvertent or mistaken use of a student's preferred name or gender pronoun will not be constitute discrimination or harassment if the school administration determines there's no ill will or intention to discriminate. And that's normally under our discrimination policies or procedures for that. And we use efforts made to inform the person not using of the preferred name and pronoun and that compliance with regulation related policies is required. Um, so we try to build something in there that if you inadvertently use it, if you were not doing it deliberately, much like a, an elementary school kid, there was a case out there where an elementary school kid referred to a teacher by a pronoun the teacher chose not to. Um, at that case, it was in that particular case, it was termed a violation, but we would not necessarily determine that a violation. If the student wasn't doing it to be discriminatory, we wouldn't discipline the student. But if a person had a religious conviction that they felt that there were only two genders and they refused to use the pronoun they, um, could they be charged under these regulations? Could they be charged with discrimination and harassment? It would fall under the Title IX procedures, and it, we'd have to go through the Title IX analysis for it, because that's how it, the federal law requires us to use Title IX. So it could or could not be. Again, I think we would attempt to work with the student. Is there or the person? Is there another way you can address the student? Right. But they could be. Of course, because Title IX okay. requires that. All right. So they could be charged with discrimination or harassment if they have a religious conviction. Um, and then, you know, one general question that I have is, do we have open urinals in the boys' bathrooms now? I don't go into boys' bathrooms, so. I do know if you look in the Grimm case, they actually talk about this issue, that it would be unlikely that a transgender student would use a, tr a male transgender student going into, a biologically male 
instead of using a female bathroom, they're only going to be closed stalls. A biologically female student using male bathrooms is probably not going to be able to stand up and use a urinal, so would probably be using the stalls. There's a long explanation of this. In but the they could still come in and say, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand, do we have open urinals? I'm assuming we do. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll let someone else go. Ms. Owens and Mrs. Holtz. Thank you. Ms. Owens, um, go ahead. Actually, uh, Ms. Manning kind of addressed some of the questions that I wanted to have addressed, but I will um, kind of re-clarify. Um, the model policies, um, the way that I read them, do not say um, that a parent request is required. I did read it to say the student or parent. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that the policy that we are passing is as comprehensive as the model policy as is required. Um, and so I wanted to clarify that we are not going to put an additional barrier that is not set forth in the uh, model policies as written. This is always the way I will address that is this has been a concern for me. If you came to me and I had a parent who was a legal guardian of a minor child and refused this, I understand what the regulations say on there, but I also run into what the legal rights of the parent are. So we would really have to work through that individual situation. We have had this before where sometimes we can reach a compromise, the family will agree how to handle it on there, but in the end, we're probably going to have to look at the legal rights. I think what the Virginia Department of Education has routinely said is if you're not sure, talk to your school attorney. So again, that was one of the areas we, a lot of the school attorneys had an issue with was some of the requirements don't necessarily match up with how we would legally analyze something. So, and I, I do understand that if you're saying if a parent comes to the school or approaches the school and says, I don't want something and the student is saying I do want something, then that's something that the school will want to try and work through with the parent and student. But if a student comes to the school and says, I would like to be uh, called by this name or by this pronoun, uh, are we setting up an additional barrier that we're telling the student that they now need to get something in writing by a parent that their word is not enough of a request to be called by something? I'm not sure how best to analyze that. I will say the model guidance suggested if a student came to you and said that. I don't know, we don't have situations where, right now, where we have families filling out, refer to my child as he or she. I know of no situation where we send something home to say, family, what bathroom do you want your child to use? So if the student came to us and said, I wanted to use I'm going to use the girl's bathroom. In this case, they don't even have to ask us that. We wouldn't object to them doing that. So at some point, and I don't know of any obligation for us to call the parents and do you know your students using the female bathroom if there are no incidences of it. So it would have to be the parent came to us on there. We frequently use nicknames. You've heard that on there. Legal requirements, your legal documents must be, you must register under the name that you, is on your birth certificate or whatever your legal document or adoption papers are. A lot of times, many students have nicknames that are different on there. And we have a category under our, our online student system that allows us to put nicknames in there. It's not really necessary for a lot of things because you're using the student identifier for a lot of required documents on there. So again, if, you wanted, if I wanted to be called Cami instead of Camilla, we would adopt me Cami. Um, again, I don't know, we don't currently have an obligation that we have a parent say, this is what you have to call my child. That's right. not, it's not in our policies right now, our regulations. Okay. So hopefully, um, by the time we vote on that, that'll be, um, really clear that because if you would like to be called Cami, we're not going to make you get a written note by your, um, parent that we're not going to make any other students do something like that if they have a nickname or another name that they would like to go by. Um, the other question that I have is about um, the part of the policy um, where it says that if a teacher or somebody is 
not using the correct pronoun that um, if it's considered to be not deliberate, then um, no actions will be taken. Uh, can you talk a little bit about who the deciding factor is about whether something is deliberate or whether they have been advised and continue not to do so? Is that individual principles? Or are we talking about one specific person in HR who will have consistent oversight over those issues? Likely, if it is involving a transgender student because the sexual orientation and gender identity fall under the classification of sex, which is fall under protected under Title IX, it is, you're going to have to go through the Title IX procedures. Now, I, I showed some of that to you last fall when we adopted it. There is a Title IX coordinator, and there, there are designated people at the school that do the investigation. There are specific procedures that we go through. So you would go through and determine whether it was a Title IX violation, and then you would follow those procedures. If it doesn't meet the Title IX requirements, you would look at your our normal anti harassment discrimination, the five seven policies and the code of student conduct. And then if it was an employee that was discriminating against a student and we believed it was deliberate, then the principal or administrator would then follow the normal procedures into investigating it. That's no different than we always do. Okay, so it would be the, the Title Nine uh, designated person, not just the uh, and individual administrator, uh, individual principals at different schools. You will go through the Title IX analysis first. Some things do not meet Title IX, which then falls back to your normal code of student conduct and your normal anti-discrimination policies, and the procedures are all the same as they've always been. Okay. And then the, the very last thing, um, there's been a lot of discussion about policy versus regulation. Um, I would be more than happy for this to um, just be passed through as policy. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed to it coming through as regulation, but um, is there a reason specifically why we would not do it as a policy? I'll be with you. When I looked at this, I said there are going to be a lot of problems. A lot of this is going to have to be fleshed out. And I fully anticipated that there were going to be different parts that are going to come into clarification with time. Policies tend to be more overriding, so we figured if we do the policies there and we spread them out. Instead of doing some school districts, I believe like Chesterfield, just just outright adopted the model guidance, which to us does not look like a policy. We chose not to do that. We put it into the different policies and regulations where we thought it was appropriate. I felt by putting it in regulations, it would give us more time for the superintendent and his staff to work with them as those issues developed. Eventually, you know, you might look at equity council might get involved in some of the student areas and I fully expect that you're going to see more guidance in the next couple of years as how to handle some of these issues. And it just made more sense for us to spread it out over various policies and regulations. You could put it in a policy if you wanted to. It just seemed more complicated that way to us to do. Okay. Um, and I, I hear you referring it to um, referring to it as the model guidance. I haven't seen it like written anywhere as the model guidance. I've only seen it written as the model policy. Um, is there somewhere else where it's being called the model guidance? I'd have to go back and look for it while we're using that language. I mean, I know we're not going to vote today. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Holtz. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, of all of the of all of the slides and the documents that have been presented tonight, there were certain ones that really stuck out at me. And one of them uh, particularly was um, schools have had transgender students for many years. And they have had some level of protection. But this uh, recommendation just gives them another level that they have been denied for so many years. And we have found that um, the biggest opponents we're not the students, but the adults. We heard that tonight. We had one man came, come up and say, can I be a girl for today? That is really trivializing the pain of some of these students. And one of the people that spoke most eloquently here tonight was a young girl from the governor's school. I am so proud of her, and I will be writing her tomorrow and thanking her. Also, uh, there's no data 
that says that we're going to have transgender people that are peeping toms. They want to see what you got. Uh, there's no evidence that says somebody's going to pretend they're transgender, just transgender, just to sneak in there. There's none of that. It's hypothetical. It's a myth. But people have been saying this for a long time, and the people that don't support this are also promoting this kind of a myth that just isn't true. Um, also, um, there are stalls. I've been in many, many schools. There's stalls in every bathroom. Uh, these transgender kids do not want to be noticed. They're not out there parading. All they want to do is pee like everybody. They go into a stall. I mean, why are we making a big fuss out of that? And as far as urinals, I don't think a transgender male is going to be using a urinal. Amen to that. So I definitely support this because all of the, the confrontations and the arguments that we've heard tonight, uh, to me, say these parents don't truly understand what it means to be a transgender. So um, I will be voting for this. The hour is late, but um, Mrs. Lanetti, if you could just share briefly with, say, in the past decade, as these have been treated on a case-by-case -case basis, generally would it involve the parents in coming into the school to, to have a joint discussion? I mean, the way a, a parent and teacher get together with staff to discuss my kid is struggling in algebra, is, is that... I assume the ones that, that I'm involved in do because it has come to an administrator's attention and we're not sure what to handle. I'm assuming that there are other ones that they've worked it out at the school level. Um, but, but I'm just saying these aren't dealt with through written notes. This is a subject that's elevated enough that typically, and I know you use the word consultation, which seemed to trigger you know, some concern. And I was just assuming, like I said, it's always family and school working together on whatever the issue. And is this, is, isn't that what we're talking about here? That the Our family goal, would always be correct. consulted and come in and talk sure about that, it? That student has the opportunity to receive the educational services. Sometimes a student wants something and the family doesn't. And sometimes we can work out a compromise so the family understands that. But, and that, but so. I'm just asking, would that typically be everybody together in person? The ones that I've been involved in, yes, we've had the parent legal guardian have sat down with an administrator. So whether we use the word consultation or whatever, it's just bringing in the family to discuss this very important situation involving their child with the child and the staff, like I said, the way we would with any other important issue. And I just wanted clarity on that, that that's essentially what we've been doing and what we would continue to do. That is my understanding. The cases we've been involved in and when I've talked to the administrators doing this, they work very hard to make sure the student feels comfortable and we're working within the legal rights of the family. So now, obviously, this is a little different because now we're talking about introducing, as somebody said, an added layer of protection. But I just wanted to get that point straight. So thank you. Mrs. Franklin and then Mrs. Riggs. So I have actually spoken to so many people um, on both sides of this opinion. And the one thing that I would like to just say for the record is that, um, you know, someone had said to me, you are so lucky to serve on the Virginia Beach Public School Board. Uh, and, you know, we do serve the public and that means all kids. Um, and I certainly think that um, we have to also, whether we agree with the lifestyle or the choices or whatever, we do have to be considerate of the transgender population as well. And, um, you know, and I, I certainly think that, you know, in my personal opinion, I don't, I'm not worried about pronouns or, or, or those type of things. I think that that is just, you know, those are semantics. Um, and I also don't believe that it is, uh, you know, it is more likely that they will probably be a more uh, in, in danger than a cisgender student um, being in danger in this situation. The only thing that I don't like about this policy 
is that it does, you know, I've heard um, tonight, and I, I want you to clarify, Dr. Spence, if, if that would be okay. I, do, I want you to clarify, um, because I absolutely, I, I want to make sure that they have protection. I really do. Um, but when I hear other parents or students saying that, you know, that the, the cisgender student is going to then have to go to an alternative area if, um, if they're not comfortable, then how is that different than alienating, you know, one side of the population versus the other? I, I feel like then, then the, you create a situation where, you know, because um, I think someone had said that they would have to go to the nurse's office then or, or go to an alternate area. Um, and then that just creates an issue for the cisgender where they might not be close to the nurse's office. And, and so I, I just want to be very careful that we don't alienate one group over another. Um, and that is where my concern lines. It's, it, I've really, in terms of the protecting uh, the transgender students, I, I have no problem with that. I really don't. Um, it, it's just how do we create a situation where we're not alienating one group over the other um, and making them feel like they're, that their opinions or feelings comfort level um, is not as important. So I guess that would be my, are we prepared, first of all, to have however many, I don't know how, you know, we, we, I guess we can't really guesstimate until this ac actually happens, but are we prepared to have all of these students start utilizing the staff restrooms and to do all that? Um, are we, you know, I'm, d I'm just curious about implementation, I guess, is how do we, how do we create this um, policy and implement the policy in a way that we, um, are not overwhelmed by the requests and then also um, il not alienating one group over another. So, I mean, relative to the sort of being overwhelmed by the requests, I mean, I think as has been stated over and over again, that's just been something that's, um, we have transgender students. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Can I clarify? Not the requests by the transgender student. Because because if we put the policy in place, then they won't have to request anything. Um, I, I'm referring to the policy from the cisgender students, where they might not feel comfortable because there might be a larger population of those. Ms. Franklin, I, I can't predict that. I, I mean, we'll we'll deal with those requests as they arise. Uh, and I think to the level of comfort, I mean, I think it's sort of a, an equally applied policy, which says anybody who has a discomfort and would prefer privacy in a restroom has the opportunity to request that from administration. So that would apply to any and all students. And so um, if somebody's not comfortable, then they have that opportunity. But the, the functional reality, again, is, you know, we have transgender students in our, in our schools, and we have for a long time. Right, and and again, just through the case studies, though, that believe me, I, I stayed up till midnight last night reading through the Graham case study and through the transgender policy. So, but I guess what I'm referring to is that you know it frequently was noted that the transgender students do have issues, you know, um, urinary tract infections or or different you know physical issues because they might not be close to a restroom that they feel comfortable with, and then they'll you know then they'll not use the restroom and have issues with that and so my concern is then let's flip it and then if we have a cisgender student that is not comfortable how do we create that situation from not arising on the flip side of that I guess you see what I mean Ms. So, Franklin, I can address it we don't keep transgender students out of the bathroom they identify with right now we, we they're, they're allowed to use the bathroom they identify with if they don't want to use it they want another situation we work with them they're currently allowed to use them because we've had the protections in there. So this is currently, I think that's what Dr. Spence is trying to say, this is currently happening and we don't have a flood of cisgender students coming and saying, oh my gosh, I can't be in there. We do currently allow students to use the bathroom that they prefer to use. Um, I don't know how much more this will come out at this point on there, but again, this is a reality for us that we've dealt with for decades and we don't have a lot, I'm not aware of a lot of complaints where students say, oh my gosh, I can't be in the bathroom. Okay, well, I think that that is, that has probably to be noted because um, I, you know, this seems like a new policy that something that we, you know, need to be implementing. And, um, you know, if this is something we already have experience with and we already have 
um, statistics and we also, you know, then then that probably should be noted so that the public. Well, is, clear. We don't I don't know that we keep statistics. On well, no, no, I'm sorry, but we have but we have a history, I should say. Once you amended the policy, I mean, I know we were doing it individually before, but when you amended the policy in 2016 for sexual orientation and gender identity, you committed at that time that you weren't going to treat them differently. So I'm not aware of a situation where we said you cannot go into a bathroom because your genitalia looks a certain way. Um, I don't know if this will create more out of that. Clearly, the Grimm case has been going back and forth for a number of years. So I'm not sure you're going to see a flip, but you might. I just We don't know how to answer that. Uh, Miss, are, are, are you done, Miss Franken? Okay, we have Mrs. Riggs. Okay, I think everybody has expressed their feelings about it. I think we need to look at the clock. We've decided that making decisions at these late hours are really not the time to do it. So I want to make a motion, and I'll, I'll read the motion. It appears that Mrs. Manning and Mrs. Hughes and I'm glad you brought it up, are calling our uh, bylaw procedure, um, and therefore we can't vote on it tonight. Okay, so this, we're not going to vote on it. So I move that the school board place policy 5-7 on the action section of the agenda on the next regularly scheduled school board meeting for our vote. Are we okay with that? No, I just well, I just wanted to make sure we sit it. You know, we made a motion for it, and you second it. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and end this. We've we've said everything. We cannot say any more tonight. That's going to change anything. Well, and I well, and I wanted to ask because there's more for t colleagues to contemplate. Which staff? And I think we know, but if we can confirm which staff are available for follow-up questions from colleagues following tonight. So, I mean, can we? I know Dr. Robertson has been working with the regulations. I know Mr. Jameson has experience with the students that have come to us. Some of those individuals can talk to you about the procedures. I'm sure the docile staff has a considerable amount of experience with this area, too. But, but who will feed? I mean, I typically like board members wouldn't call Mr. Jamison directly. We should work through what you and you Dr. Roberts. And uh, if you've got questions, we'll get answers to your questions. Okay. Oh, wait, Mrs. Manning? Was it a question about this? Was, or? Yeah, I just had a quick yeah. um, suggestion, but go ahead. I okay. Think this will um, so just a. Uh, I'd really like for the public, since since this has has all changed and what's happening, I'd really like the public to be informed that we'll be voting into or at our next meeting. So if we could have could media and communications put something out to the media of, you know, because people are going to be expecting that they wake up tomorrow that that they're going to see a vote and they're not going to. So if we could. I already got a notification from three three different stations that, that we're not voting on that it. we're not voting tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> must be <laughs> must be a slump. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Melnick. Now, since we sat down eight hours ago, we have teachers that are waiting. School starts in 16 days. Our well, next wait a minute. We, we oh, have I'm a sorry. We have a motion on the floor. floor. With a second. We have a second. Just vote on it. Second it by um, Mrs. I second. Manning. I mean, the agenda plan. And I called on you. I did call on you. Well, I asked you first, and you gave it to her. But please speak. Please. Oh, I gave up my speech to I don't understand why we're putting this off. We had over 50 people here tonight to give their opinion. And we've had a very long demonstration in PowerPoint. Nothing new is going to happen in a week. It's only going to we're going to have another angry crowd in the parking lot again, and nothing That's is going true. to change, and nothing will happen for our transgender students. I'm really sorry about this. There's, there's nothing that's going to happen within two weeks that's going to make any difference in the presentations that we've gotten. 
I think we've heard from the public. Thank it was you. the by the bylaw matter? Can I, yes. because I brought up the motion. Let me explain that definitely there is a, a concern with our bylaw. So we can, we cannot legally with the bylaw with the concern in the Roberts Rules of Order, we cannot vote on it tonight without being out of order. So that is why I made the motion. Um, I think it would be. We, yes, we did hear from everybody, and we heard from each other. We discussed it. But to vote now, after it has been brought up and explained that it's, it's a by, it's a, we're going against the bylaw, and we're, we're, you know, we're not going by procedure, which we have decided to do, and we try to do, and everything we make oh a decision God. on. That's why I said that. That is why I made the motion. I'll be quick. Oh, okay. So, Mrs. Manning? Yeah, I just... I want to quell this. There's an angry mob outside. I don't know where that came from. I spoke to my pastor who was outside when I was on break. I spoke to him, and um, he said there were a lot of people out there. I said, were people angry? Were people being mean? He said, not that I saw, and he was out there for a while. So I, I, I think that there's only one narrative being played here. That is not true. And that were you out there? No, please, that, that is. Please. So let's let's not let's, let's not be saying that the whole crowd of people out there, they there were, were pastors, there were church people out there from just here to be heard and be present. They didn't know they couldn't come into the building. And so let's just, just stop that narrative. So going back to Mrs. Riggs, this will be on as an action item on September, I believe it, is it the 14th? Yes. Okay. It was bad. So I, I'm ready. We have to take the vote. I would like to. You need to vote on it. Is that right? All in favor, raise hand, please. You already spoke. Do you, uh, I, I'm sorry. Didn't know. Before this, please. Yeah, it's, I mean, I just wanted to say to answer the question. That's how we do policies. It's policy review committee, and then information, and then we vote the next. I mean, that that happens with every policy. Some policies, the changes seem rather benign. Some are emotional, but I mean, that's, that's just the way we do it. And we already were going to put it on the agenda for next time mm -hmm. because that's the normal flow of it. Right. This is not unusual. But since there was a request for a vote, we'll do the vote so we can adjourn. Raise hand, please, for action item next meeting. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and we do have a pending question once the clerk has uh, tallied the votes. So we have nine ayes. And all opposed. And we have one day and one non-vote because um, Ms. Weems is not online. Thank you. All right. Okay, so now Dr. Mrs. Spence, Melman. eight hours ago we sat down we start school in 16 days, but our next meeting is 21 days from today. And we have had teachers patiently waiting for hours to find out if somebody could give at least a, a little bit of information about what we do if we are exposed at work and what will happen with leave and how will that be taken care of. Can somebody at least give a general Yes, Update. here's what I can tell you. Okay. We, we're working on finalizing a recommendation that is a budget issue in addition to uh, human resources leave issue. I think we'll have that settled up by early next week and we'll communicate that out to staff as soon as we do and to the board. Thank you. Thank you. They waited patiently for that. Thank you. I understand. Okay, this meeting is adjourned. Uh, Madam Chair, we oh. still have non agenda oh. speakers. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's no closed session. They, they deferred it. All right.